seek ye first the kingdom. It, when, when you set your heart and mind, how do I bless God's kingdom with this money? That's your focus. The amount of money, I always say, I say it this way, the crumbs, that, I live really good on the crumbs that live, fall off the table. And I don't even worry about it. I just go on blessing God as much as I can. That's, you know, it says, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. It's almost like, it's like this money thing that everybody's trying to get so hard. It's just like, here, here's a hundred grand, whatever. You know, it's like God just has, he just, when we get our focus right, so much of what you were saying, when we get our focus right, then we can prosper. And there's now, <laughs> Okay, I better hurry up on this. There's three important points that I want to get into on prosperity. It's all in our book, and the book will help you if you want to prosper God's way. Mm -hmm. If you want to do this the biblical way. And there's three things, and the first one is you've got to be a giver. You've got to give God something to work with. Be a tither. We have give way over 10% into God's kingdom. There's, there's been times when it's crazy. Um, you know, I've given away a, a, a lot of, a lot of more money than most people will ever make. And I'm not trying to raise myself up, but this is the first part. You got to be giving to, to where you could say it like God notices. Wow. Those people really, really are concerned about God's kingdom. And we've given money to Andrew, given money to other ministries. Even when we are in our own TV show, when we're talking about prosperity, we tell people, if you don't want to give it here, Find a good yeah. ministry and give it there. Get the giving principle working for you that's in right. this whole thing. Really and the second thing uh, that's important is you have to change your speech life. You can't go, oh, I'm so poor. I'm always broke. I never make, you know, people used to say to me, hey, Al, how are you doing? And I, I used to say, uh, well, I'm overworked and underpaid. I remember that. And it was true. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'll never forget this because I was tithing and tithing and believing like you were saying. This goes this is a long time ago. And I, I turned on to my street and I was heading to my house and the Lord just spoke to me and he said, you know, <laughs> he said, I can't prosper you. Mm. And I was like, what do you mean you can't? You're God. You can do anything. He said, I can't go past your words. Mm -hmm. And your words are constantly poverty. You're complaining. You got a poor mentality. Uh, you know, I'm going to get into attitude. And he said, I can't go past your words. You have to change your speech life. You, ha you, you know, you, I'm not saying you lie and say you have money that you don't have, but you, you have to go from, I'm just a poor little old preacher. I'm just a poor little old whatever you do. And I'll never have any money because how can God prosper me financially on this salary? He doesn't need your salary. He doesn't need what you do. He can send finances to you that will blow your mind because he's done it to me. I could tell you story after story is crazy of, of the way we've been blessed. And uh, this is the way we live. So God said, I can't go past your words. You want to read that in, in my book? Ooh, well, okay. Page 48 um, of my book. This is, this is Al book. speaking. If you've been speaking ne negatively about your finances, and if you want to make a change, the first thing you need to do is call a crop failure. Oh, wow. And that was something the Lord showed me. He said, you know, you've been talking this way and talking this way. You've got to stop the way you're talking. And then he said to me, call in a crop failure for all those words of poverty. And so I just said, okay, Lord, I'm... I'm I'm putting all this before you. I speak all those negative words to my prosperity. I cancel them now and call them dead. It's a crop failure. And that's important to get that cleared out. So when you start speaking right, and it's not just prosperity. It's anything in your life where you want to go. That's right. Speak the right. Is there any more? That oh, I no, mean? you just you, you actually said it all. <laughs> oh, I did. Okay. You said, I began speaking prosperity out, out loud. I, I am prosperous. I'm wealthy. I, I remember that. I'm walking around the house uh, saying yeah. that. And, <laughs> the then, Lord said, and then you began thanking God. You stopped complaining and you thanked God. And then I like this. He said, once I did all this, heaven was loosed and prosperity began to pour onto me like a tsunami. It really, you see, I was giving and I believed in giving. I believed God wanted me and I was giving, giving. It wasn't working, as you were right. saying. And I was giving, and I didn't know why it wasn't working. And when I changed my speech life, oh, my God, it was like it was 
it was like it couldn't hold any longer and it just came on me and we just began to prosper like crazy yep. we just prospered and prospered yep. and um you know <laughs> i laughed because someone said to me are you one of those name it and claim it preachers mm -hmm. and what i wanted to say was but i was nice mm -hmm. i wanted to say Very yeah i named it i claimed it i blabbed it i grabbed it i got it where's your excuse <laughs> you know Got but I was nice. I was nice. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, you know, th this whole thing about is more to it than just name it and claim it. I know somebody and he said, you know, I did that prosperity thing. And he says, that, that, that didn't work. So I said, well, how long have you been doing it for? Hmm. Two weeks. Yeah, 20 minutes. I said, I've been doing this for, for, at that time, 15 years of believing for prosperity and yeah. walking with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the third thing the Lord told me you have to do is you have to change your attitude. And your attitude is your way of thinking. It's a wrong attitude. You lust after money. You want the pride of look at me, look what I have. That's all wrong. It's all, you can have those things. I have all kinds, I have big things, believe me. But it's not even an issue to me. I have this house that's millions and millions of dollars. And I said to somebody, I said, you know, I think I'm just going to sell it and give the money away. <laughs> and he freaked out because in his mind, it was like, whoa, you finally got, got it. And it's like, it's not the issue. Change your attitude toward money. Money is there to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Find a good ministry. And support them, bless them. You know, uh, I remember the attitude. Um, <laughs> I was in this one church years ago, and they preached against prosperity. Everything was, you got to be the poor, broke, miserable, sick, and unhappy going to church on Sunday, or you're just not really Christian. And I was like, oh my God, I don't believe this. And they would go on and on with this, and then they would say. We need money for a new building. We're going to build a new building, so we want everybody to give us money. And they'd go right to the rich people in the congregation <laughs> and try to get money. And I would watch this go on uh, all the time, you know. And it, it's, it's, it's an attitude that has to be changed. Um, yeah. Okay, what I want to say, first of all, within you, you have to change this attitude of, I'll never have that. How am I going to get there? I'm not, I'm not like those rich people. You know, change that. If, some, if someone came up to me and said, do you think you could be as rich as Trump? I'd go, yeah. <laughs> easy. It's easy for God. But most people, when I ask them that, I say, do you think you could be as rich as Donald Trump? They go, it'll never happen. It's not me. It can't happen. Mm. It can if you change your thinking. That's right. You know, we focus on healing. We focus on the Bible. We focus on relationship and our walk. And then money just and prosperity just goes out the window. It takes money to produce a TV show. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have our, our own TV show, and, and it costs a lot of money to get all this stuff out there. But we don't care about that. We care about getting the money into the, into the TV show to be a right. blessing yeah. to others. And then when you're a blessing to others... God blesses you. As Andrew Amen. would say, if you can get it through, you'll get it to you. Yeah. And that's the way we've lived. That's good. Uh, there is within the, ad I don't know how much time I have, but there is within the attitude thing of believing God. God will give you an instruction. He'll tell you something you need to do. Yeah. In other words, whatever it is, a job, buy this, sell that, you know, whatever. God will give you an instruction. And that instruction is for you, not for me. I don't have to do that. You know, I, I have people that get all mad at me, you know, like, you know, well, you're preaching prosperity. What kind of a thing is that? You know, and I just look at him and I say, who are you to tell me how much money I should make? <laughs> I don't understand what goes on. The attitude is wrong. Yeah. And everybody, God has a, you know, I had this lady I was ministering to and she said, I want to be, I want to have a doctorate degree and I want to be a millionaire. It's okay, great. And then three, four years later, she came and she says, I got my doctorate degree, but I don't have any money. <laughs> and I said, what did you do to get the doctorate degree? She said, well, I went to school for years. And what did you do to prosper? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They really think the money, there's a, my money bag's going to fall out of the sky and hit them in the head. I wished it would. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> but anyway, so, so prosperity is where we're really, really at. Most of this uh, is what we do. That's, That's awesome. Part of what we pre preach.
Amen. So when you guys do your Gospel Truth TV show, do you share a lot on this as well? Yes, we've done a whole every series. Subject. We've done a whole series, but we, we share on everything. Okay. Any, you know, uh, we, we're usually topical, and we choose topics like fear and worry okay. and stuff like that, and then it really hits home. Amen. You know, yeah. it's important. Prosperity is so important because, let me say it this way. The devil fears a Christian with money who's willing to use it for God's mm -hmm. kingdom more than anything else. Amen. That is the one he's the most afraid of and attacks the most. Yes. And we've had our share. But what I'm trying to do is set it up. The devil does not want the prosperity message. In fact, it's been for hundreds of years it was poverty was godly. Yeah. Well, and the thing about prosperity even, you know, it says you can judge a tree by its fruit. Mm -hmm. So so many times, we're not saying that rich people love God more, but it's just that dynamic of when you're walking in prosperity, you start to show a level of fruit, and the enemy doesn't want that. Nope. He's like, I don't want them shining in their prosperity or shining in your healing or shining in your relationship. So he tries to get it. This is great. Well, I want to jump into some questions because sure. um, thank you guys for asking questions. So we're going to get try to get to them as many as possible. So Brianna K on YouTube asks this. She says, can being obedient to God while focusing on rewards rather than obedience out of love hinder reaping the harvest? I, I actually think it's a hard issue. I think the more you get to know God and 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 His ways and and you, to, to me, focus is now we. All right, I you know it's great if God gives us more harvest. I mean, it keeps coming in. That's great. That's great. But if it didn't, I've gotten to the point where my heart is so changed that I just want to help other people get that gospel out too. So it, it, as God changes you, your heart changes in that area too. And you're not necessarily giving anymore to get, although that will happen. But when your heart changes, it, it When you it's focus good. on God in terms of your love walk with God, the prosperity is like a benefit. Mm -hmm. That's and good. we are rewarded for what we do here. Yeah. Who, who would go to college for four years and come out and say, I never got a degree. I didn't want it. <laughs> I, I'm not going to work in that field. That's We'd good. say, you're crazy. Yeah. But so anyway, rewards is part. And the Bible is full. Of, Jesus spoke about rewards all the time. So it's both. We love God and we know he rewards us. Yeah. That's, right. That's good. Excellent. Okay. So Lainey R asked this on YouTube. She says, where does standing up for yourself come in? So we're talking about turn the other cheek and give your cloak. She says, do we also fight for what's good, especially in our politically motivated society right now? Yes, I would stand for righteousness always. Mm -hmm. What's holy and righteous in the political arena. I don't see what Angie was talking about, how you know, you're giving your coat. I don't see that in the political. Re I see that right. as one on one, just loving the people that you come into contact with all day, every day. That's good. We don't approve of the wrong things, particularly now that's going on in the country. We don't we don't approve and we don't back any kind of thing that's wrong. But there's also a time where uh, if you have a problem with someone and you're offended by them and you want to just rip their neck you know, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. There's a time for confrontation too, but I, yeah. all, I only, I suggest that you only confront if you're a really mature Christian and you're doing it for their benefit, not for yours. Right. In other words, not to feel good or feel selfish about it. You're doing it to help that person. And I'll tell you what, that takes a real mature Christian to do that. That's good. But there's nothing wrong with confrontation. It's got to be done the right way, quick. Yeah. <laughs> So another one, uh, Kristen Lowe on YouTube asks this. She says, I've been cheated, ripped off, and taken advantage of so many times that I cannot even remember. How do I believe God to pay me back? You have to bring that before the Lord. Yes. You have to say, what I could tell you what I've done. I would write it all out. Mm -hmm. every rip off and I would bring it like that and I would lay hands on it and I would bring it before heaven and say, Lord, this is what I did. I did it your way. I did it the Bible way. This is everything here and I want my hundredfold return for you, from you and I'm believing for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'm not saying this happened with, with uh, this woman, but um, sometimes we get into situations where we don't ask God ahead of time and he knows there's a problem ahead and we just, it sounds like a great deal. It sounds like a great business uh, uh, relationship. Let's go for it. And then you jump into something that God didn't want you to jump into. I'm not saying that's what you did, yes. but sometimes we, we make our own problems. 
problems. Need discernment. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So we that's, have to just seek that's God. That's really good. That's really good. So um, also, uh, uh, Elaine says this, Elaine O on Facebook says, how is believing God for a harvest related to receiving a healing? Could someone you consider, you, and then the second question, could someone you consider your friend become your enemy? So number one, first question, how is believing God for a harvest related to receiving a healing? So does these principles of prosperity well, cross over into principles yes, of healing? Well, we, we, have, we give and have given and tithe for my healing. That's right. For, in other for, words, I would take a check and send a check in, and in the memo section, I would put for my healing of whatever I have at the time. And I, I, I've had people say, I never thought of this. I tithe for my healing. I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I believe God's going to heal me, and here's my tithe money going mm-hmm. in. And, I, and that's, we've done that for myself. Oh, and you, so many times. And we've done for it for our others. children, put their names mm-hmm. on, the, on the check, and... You know, and that's yeah. that's what I want. That's what my harvest is. That's what I want. And what was the second right. part of that? Um, uh, could someone you consider your friend become your enemy? So going back to kind of some of the first part of your message about turning our cheek or handing our cloak. And can someone that was once a friend all of a sudden become an enemy? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to happen. Yeah. And it might be jealousy reasons. It might be. It could be a number of reasons, yeah. you know, but um but even that you bring it before the Lord, you know, I mean, Paul had all those people persecuting him and everything, you know, and yeah. Lord, get him off my back. I, I don't get too much into that. Like with a friendship, I don't really make so much of a soul tie with anyone because I never know when they're going to turn on me because <laughs> it's happened. And so, yeah, I connect. I love them. I help them. I, but if they do something... I just give it all to the Lord and walk away. He's and my Lord them. and my Savior. We forgive and I them. just love them and forgive them and move on. And, you know, I've done it time and time again, and I've, I'd say it this way. I've had all these people coming against me, and I'm going like this, and I just, and off I go. I just keep going down. And they're still back there fighting to this day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so go ahead. That's really good. I love that. Uh, Bob asked this on Facebook. I'm just trying to get through as many questions. No, it's some really good ones. Good. So Bob on Facebook asks this. He says, are you speaking in the material or in the spiritual or both as far as? harvest certainly both oh absolutely uh, absolutely both but there's so much in this w- where people say oh your your harvest is spiritual it's spiritual you know the word rich in the bible means just what money. it says money and so i would answer that one both i really would i would answer that both we get a spiritual harvest you know when we give a tithe when i give a tithe sometimes when i need wisdom in the spiritual realm and I'll get that wisdom. So I'm giving it in the physical realm. I'm giving money, but I get wisdom in the spiritual realm to know what to do. That's good. That's absolutely true. That's good. All the time. Well, uh, another question is you talked about crop failure. So what does it mean to ask God for a crop failure? Mm-hmm. And what if the things that I have done have automatic consequences that are, are just naturally going to happen? How can I declare a crop failure on them? You can reduce how... There's a certain amount of this is going to happen, okay? But you can reduce the bad effect by saying, Lord, that was a mistake. I admit it was a mistake. I was wrong. I wasn't listening to you. Please forgive me for what I've done wrong. Lord, I call a crop failure to that. And I would stand up and speak over it like that, a crop yeah. failure. And I'd say, Lord, I need you to take this and remove it. Yeah. Just take it all away from, from my That's whole. Good. I don't want this harvest right. that I've start. I see now what I've done. And, you know, sometimes we have to learn it the hard way, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you might have to learn it the hard way. But then once you understand what you're doing, Lord, I'm asking you as much as possible, yeah. stop the natural consequences of my de- wrong decisions. Mm, that's good. So, uh, Char uh, uh, Wilcock on Facebook asks this, this is, I have a question, please. Is the prayer of faith the same as people who pray intercession for others? Well, okay. That's, I don't see that as prosperity, prosperity, prosperity? related question. Yeah. But, um, Maybe as people are praying for their harvest, praying a prayer of faith. Or praying in intercession for someone else and their harvest. So how does, is well, the same well, thing? Can you believe some, you for cer- someone else's you harvest? You can oh. certainly pray for someone else's harvest. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is their harvest is going to come based on 
what they're going to do with their life and the decisions ahead. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is pray that they, God helps them and shows them how to make right decisions. Yeah. That's how you right. would intercede, help them, Lord, to see what they need to do. God is such a gentleman, he will not mess with your own free will. He just won't do it. Yeah. So, you know, we have to really, you know, how many times have I said, Lord, will you just do this? Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> no, did you ask me to do it? Well, no, but you know, and it's like, yeah. I'm not doing it unless you ask me. And then as we had to be careful of the harvest we think someone else needs in their life. Exactly. Right. You know, Lord, right. they just need to get this from you. And so we're trying to pray it. And then we get frustrated because we're trying to pray for this harvest of what we want will for someone else's life. Yeah, I think, I think everyone's <laughs> responsible really for the most part for their yeah. You know, I've had that happen to me where we were praying for somebody and he wasn't mm -hmm. doing it right. And you know what the Lord said? I didn't believe he said it to you. Uh, <laughs> pray that I have mercy on them <laughs> because they, they, what they wanted, their harvest was not what God would want for them. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to get to a point in your life where you can say, now I know he is the Lord, where you understand he's just running this and man, I'm blessed. Amen. Good. That's really good. Well, thank you guys so much. We're out of time. And we got through so many of our questions tonight, so I'm really excited about that and, uh, and, and believe that even some of our other questions you guys answered even in the teaching and, and your other answers. But you guys are such a blessing. Thank you for sharing thank about you. Harvest. I know there's so many people that are standing for a Harvest. They're trying to say, whether financially they're going through things, you know, home with work, with everything like that, healing. So this is great. So, uh, guys, please look at um, Andrew, uh, excuse me, Andrew, Al and Angie's uh, website. And so it's, it's up here. And so um, on, on the screen here, so at victorylifeministries.org, so you can find out more about their ministry and just find out more about your books and um, uh, gospeltruth.tv. They're every day, morning and evening. And, and then also tomorrow night that you, they will be sharing their healing story, that harvest, mm. a harvest of healing that really happened within their body. So tomorrow night at the Healing is Here conference, it's going to be a live stream event. So uh, check us out on on Andrew Mike Ministries or Facebook or YouTube channel. So you'll find all that there. So thank you guys so oh, much for you. being here. Uh, we could have gone so much longer. I know they had even more notes, but again, sign up for our notes, awmi.net slash uh, Bible study. So you can get the notes and just look at those scriptures and just put these nuggets inside of you. So again, call our prayer line. And if you're saying, you know what, I really got blessed and I just, I need to invest into my harvest. Also, just as a note, this is a viewer supported broadcast and it would be an amazing opportunity for you to be a part of this harvest of how this ministry and the Bible studies are reaching so many people. We have daily Karis live Bible studies Monday through Friday. So you're joining us on Tuesday night, but also Wednesday morning, seven in the morning, Thursday evening at six, and then Monday and Friday at 10 in the morning. So you can be a part of the harvest of how we're reaching so many people. So if you want to be a part of that, again, call our prayer line for prayer for uh, support as far as material, but also to be able to give into this ministry at 719-635-1111. So thank you guys so much for joining us tomorrow morning. We have some tremendous things that we're going to be able to share with you. So join us tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. And we look forward to having you uh, at the Healing is Here conference. Join us from your home if you know somebody who really needs to hear the word on healing. If they're going through something physically, they need to join us. And they'll be super blessed by hearing you guys also yeah. tomorrow night. Uh, Julie Ann Hartman is ministering tonight. Andrew's going to be doing some things with her. So it's going to be tremendous. So God bless you. Thank you guys. And we will see you again tomorrow.
Welcome to AWM Now, your source for everything that's happening here at Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. Years ago, Karis graduate Teresa Hotelling shared her testimony of how she was healed of lupus and Sjogren syndrome, but her story does not end there. We caught up with Teresa to hear how her time at Karis, as well as her miraculous healing, propelled her to do full-time ministry with her husband around the world. We spent two years in the Middle East studying Arabic, uh, and then God called us back in 2018. The ministry started in 2019, and then the Middle East was kind of reborn on the inside of us. We started thinking about how we could take what we learned um, to the people in the Middle East, especially to the church in the Middle East, because they don't have materials. They don't have good, solid teaching over there. And we started thinking, well, how can we 
How can we get that to them? One way they do this is through Andrew's discipleship evangelism materials that have been translated into Arabic, giving people the message of God's love and grace in their mother tongue that will last long after Teresa and Patrick leave the country. If you take it in an English, say, um, say in a small village or something, the pastor is the only one that speaks English. Whereas if it is translated into their language, it's available to everybody. We just want to know what we can do to help them be equipped to teach their people, to teach their sheep, and to impact the other community around them. I, I can't think of anything better than taking what I have been given and giving it to other people because it has so changed my life that I, I can't not I can't not share it with other people. Thank you, friends and partners, for providing a place where people like Teresa can become equipped to fulfill the unique call of God on their life and to be a light in some of the world's darkest places. For more information on Fully Known Ministries, click on the link below. A little girl grows back a missing piece of her heart. A drug dealer becomes an evangelist. A family buried under $60,000 in debt creates a business worth millions. These breakthroughs did not happen to seasoned ministers or Bible scholars, but to people who simply believed God's promises in the midst of the impossible. For 20 years, Andrew has faithfully taught the Word of God on television. As a result, we have been overwhelmed with reports of the miraculous, cancers defeated, debts demolished, autism overcome, destinies fulfilled, marriages restored, addictions broken, and healings of every kind. Our video testimony collection contains over 60 powerful stories demonstrating how anyone can access God's promises for themselves. For this reason, Andrew has made all of these stories available to you free of charge. To gain instant access to this wealth of inspiration, Simply visit awmi.net, click on the Watch tab, and select Video Stories from the drop-down menu. We invite you to copy the link to each of our stories and share it as many times as you wish. Invest in yourself in a world desperate for life-changing good news. Having a vision, a goal of what God wants you to accomplish is absolutely necessary. Because, listen, people don't care what you know until they know you care. So I would like my business to make an impact in the kingdom of God by putting me around people that I wouldn't be around otherwise. Because I think that's just a great way to, to go into all the world. I want to allow other avenues of businesses or people who want to start businesses. I want to put them on, on the forefront. I want to put them on a platform and do some good old-fashioned kingdom damage. God is starting to move people in unity. He's calling people like you to stand up in the marketplace and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And that's what my mission is, uh, helping veterans, improving their lives, and making a difference. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in the earth, in your life, in your family, in your city, in your nation, in the earth, even as it is in heaven. And we have merged the law firm and the home church, and so we have clients that come in at their most vulnerable times, and we get to preach the gospel and see the Lord transform their lives. For me, what it looks like is leaving a legacy that contributes to the kingdom long after I'm gone. If we are able to change culture through business, that's going to be a way that you could advance the kingdom. The power when two people, five people, ten people can come together and we can say it's not just about my organization or my business, but it's how we can just agree that we're going to move the fight for faith.
My name is Rick Renner, and this is August 25th, and our gem today is called Refuse to Quit and Give Up. And our scripture is Galatians 6, verse 9, where the Apostle Paul says, Let us not be weary in well-doing. That word weary is a very interesting Greek word, and I want to read to you directly from Sparkling Gems number 2. It's the Greek word egkakos, a compound of n. The word n means n. And the word kakos, which describes something evil. But when you compound the two words together, it actually depicts a person who's tempted to throw in the towel and quit. This is a surrendering to evil. And in this verse, God commands you and me not to surrender to the temptation to give up. He promises that if we'll continue to do what is right, coming in our direction will be a due season when we will reap. When you're tired, you always think about quitting. When you're doing good and doing good and doing good and you're waiting for your reward, sometimes you become discouraged. Don't give in to the temptation to throw in the towel. Don't surrender. Don't yield your territory because due season is headed in your direction when you're going to reap. That's what I want you to think about today. You're watching Gospel Truth TV, teaching God's unconditional love and grace. Let's welcome our president and founder of Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College, Andrew Womack. Thank you, Clay. Praise God. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. It's been awesome. You know, sometimes when things don't work out exactly the way you had it planned and stuff, it uh, makes you recognize the Lord more. I've just enjoyed the presence of the Lord and the things that have been shared. It's been awesome. So I hope everybody's really enjoying it. All right. JB was scheduled to be up during this session, but he decided to share his session with Tony so that they could kind of do an interaction and some question and answers. Let me just mention that Tony will be leaving after the morning session, so this will be his last session. But hadn't he been a blessing to us? Man, I really, really respect him and honor him. So let's welcome JB and Tony Dungy as they come back. So as Andrew just said, um, knowing that Tony is heading home after this, the one thing I've admired about Tony, hey Matt, I'm going to need to get your help here. I admire about Tony is that he is family first in everything that he does. And over the many years I've been blessed to know him, Saturdays, if you will, are sacrosanct. He lets nothing get in the way of his time with family. And even though he's very committed to the ministry, family first, so he wanted to come in and Andrew acquiesced and had him speak last evening and today. And I thought it would be just a blessing to have you pull as much out of Tony as possible before he leaves today. I'll speak tomorrow morning. But Tony, why is it that we decided to do this interactive? We actually were together at the Billy Graham Training Center for a conference very similar to this last week. And you always think about what can I say that will really impact the men, what's going to be relevant to them, and you have this thought in your mind. But we did a question and answer session, and we got questions, Mm. and we said, gosh, I would have never thought of that. Here's the answer to that. I would have never thought men would be interested in that. So hearing from you guys what you would want to address and things that have happened in our lives that have have demonstrated that, we just thought was a a great way to go. So we're excited, and we got some wonderful questions from you. Mm. And we're very thankful that uh, Andrew trusts uh, the Jesus in us, our hearts, in doing this. And he didn't want me to go through a long song and dance. He says, if that's what the Lord is saying to you, go do it. We had a conversation with Matt and with Clay and uh, Lieutenant Ryan Haley, and they felt this would be just great in terms of the interaction as well. The only thing I'm complaining about up front, though, at the top, is, I mean, Tony, look at this, this font size of the questions <laughs> that they give. And, you know, it was, I, I did call him Pastor 
uh, Paul Milligan, but his wife said, no, he's not a pastor. He's a teacher, you know, and a singer. So I can't call him Pastor Paul. But Paul did. He made me feel pretty good. He said, JB, you know, you got a little age up under your belt right now. So it's expect that. Well, hey, I was counting on Deuteronomy 34, 7, which essentially says about what? About Moses. Moses was 120 years old and his eyesight was as strong as when he was a young buck. But that was Moses. Hey, was Moses. <laughs> yeah, boy. It's going to need his. And Andrew, with that little Bible that Andrew has, wherever he goes, Pastor Moore, you see him passing along? He's got this little Bible, and the font size is about the right. width of an ant. And he can see this because it's all on the tablet of his heart anyway. But let's get started here. So, hey, Coach, we'll share these because we did get some great questions from the live stream audience. And we thank you so very much for doing that as well, as well as those from the audience. And as uh, Clay mentioned, uh, we will also take some questions from you if they come up but there's a lot to to mine out of tony as well tony this first question really kind of speaks to what you ministered on at the billy graham training center if you'll read that out and go ahead and answer it is that number one yes sir. I'm <laughs> yes sir that's that small print there yes. where do you find like-minded people to be a wise counsel or keep you accountable and the reason i thought about that is because you do that every saturday but go ahead we do we uh I had an accountability group uh, when I coached. I hired them. <laughs> I hired seven assistant coaches that I knew. We had this Christian bond and fellowship and we could talk about things and they were a wonderful uh, group and we were together a long, long time. But all of a sudden now I got out, I was away from that. Well, where do you find that? Gosh, I used to just go in and talk to Clyde and talk to Tony Nathan and it was easy. Mm. So I had to really be uh, intentional about it. My wife and I started going to a couple's Bible study. We got really intimate and comfortable with a, a group of married people. And I started picking out these husbands that I thought felt the same way I did, that their, their role as husbands and fathers was important to them. And we just morphed into uh, four guys that we meet every Saturday mm -hmm. now. Uh, we talk about what's going on during the week, what's happening in our lives. And it's been great, but it's and, important. And coach, I remember the three elements that you mentioned about that accountability group as well too. You talked about examples, you talked about fellowship, and you talked about accountability. So are those priorities that you seek to accomplish in each of those sessions? Absolutely are. We want to, number one, be accountable. Mm. And is, is what we say we want to do, is that what we're all about? How is our week gone? Have I uh, honored my wife? Have I lost my temper with my kids? Have I used integrity at work? We ask each other those questions. And then, hey, what's on your mind? What can we pray about? What's your biggest need this week? What can I be in prayer for you about? And then they're an example. I mean, they're, they're the example to me. So it's, it's been pretty awesome. The second question comes from you guys as well and really speaks more to Tony. But again, even though it's an athletic example, as you've heard from his two messages, it's about biblically applying them in the game of life. Question two for you, Coach. How do you get your players to listen to you without yelling or cursing at them? Mm. <laughs> and you believe it or not, there are people in NFL circles that don't think that can happen, that think that these guys are so driven and they're so testosterone oriented that they're only going to respond to someone who keeps them under control with an iron fist. And that was never my style. And I remember the first meeting I had with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when I became the head coach in, in 1996. And I told them, laid out the ground rules, and we had one sign in our, our locker room and was there for 13 years. Expectations, execution, no excuses, no explanations. Hmm. And that was going to be our motto. We were going to have very, very high expectations, and I was going to expect them to act like champions on and off the field, in practice, in games, in the community. My expectations were going to be very high. It was up to them to execute that. I wasn't going to accept any excuses or any explanations if we didn't get the job done. But then I told them, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to coach you a certain way. I'm going to treat you like my dad treated me. Uh, I'm not going to berate you. I'm not going to throw you under the bus in the media. I'm not going to yell at you and scream at you and curse at you. I don't believe in that. But is there anybody out there? that needs that to play your best. <laughs> Do you need me to curse at you and scream at you and yell at you? 
And just like now, nobody raised their hand. So I said, okay, we got it. I don't have to do that. You understand that? When I tell you I'm really upset at you right now because you're not playing your best, you'll know I'm mad. <laughs> but the last part of this, because are the coaches from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes still here? Uh, those of you who raise your hand, okay. Because what he did tell those coaches from the FCA, the second part of what he told those players was, if in fact that's what they oh, needed. If there is anyone out there that needs somebody to yell, if you really, that's the way you've been trained and that's what you need and that's what motivates you, come into my office after the meeting and I'll trade you to somebody who will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody came, so we had a good understanding. Uh, so a lot of these questions, and this comes from the live stream audience, and, and, and these questions are really hard-hitting ones that deal with issues today, and we want you to ask that because, again, as men of God, we want to make certain that we are equipped, and clearly this ministry does a superb job of inculcating us with the Word of God and how to apply it in the game of life. This one, Tony, I don't know that we have any uh, influence over this, but the question is, what can we do about the Super Bowl halftime show making it more family friendly? Wow, look at you guys. Well, hold on and check this out. If I would ask Coach if he would also incorporate in his answer what your reaction was for one of the openings. I don't know whether it was Sunday Night Football or not, but go ahead, Coach. No, uh, I was disappointed in that. Uh, I, I'm... And I speak to the commissioner a lot. I still speak to a lot of people in the NFL. And we do, the NFL is trying to be all inclusive. It's trying to bring every audience in. We want young people, we want older people, we want women. We want everybody in. And so making these half times to be entertaining, uh, that's great. But we still have to remember we're, we're a family show. And I'm gonna emphasize that uh, whenever I get a chance to the commissioner and to the owners. Uh, I don't think it was appropriate, and we've got to get that across. JB's referring to a situation, it was about, uh, it would have been 2005 or 2006, the Dallas Cowboys were playing the Philadelphia Eagles on a Monday night game, and the opening to the show, they always had different openings. Well, this opening, they had Terrell Owens as a Philadelphia player, and they had him in the locker room with a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. And the fact, I'm not going to go out to the game. I'm not even going to play the game tonight. I'm going to stay with you. And it was supposed to be funny and everything. And I was watching with my son at the time, and he was about 14. And I said, this is not, how do I explain this to him that this, this isn't the right way to go? So in my press conference the next day, I didn't even wait for any questions. I just brought it up. I said, you know, I was really disappointed watching Monday Night Football and the way we tried to market sex to our game. It shouldn't happen. It, it put our players in a bad light. And I was disappointed in Terrell Owens for doing that. But I'm also disappointed in ABC. I said, we were on Monday Night Football two weeks ago. They never asked any of our players to do that. They, you know, it just, I, I was upset. Well, the producer of ABC Monday Night Football was a guy named Fred Gadelli, and he called me and he was very upset. How can you criticize us for this? It was just a joke and everybody knew it wasn't real. And I told him, I said, I'm sitting here with a young boy who's watching this and it just was not appropriate. We agreed to disagree and we kind of had a frosty relationship after that. Fast forward years later, Monday Night Football package shifts over to Sunday night Fred Gadelli is now producing Sunday Night Football, and I get hired as an analyst for Sunday Night. And I thought to myself, this is not going to go well. <laughs> but lo and behold, Fred Gadelli, over the course of time, read some stuff. He became more aware of Christ in his life, and he called me. He said, you know what? I don't think the same way anymore. Uh, we've got to have another conversation about that. And now it's, been, it's just been awesome. But I think we have to speak up, we have, and you guys have to write in, and you have to tell the NFL, hey, this is not what I'm looking for when I'm, I'm watching the games. And so when, when we have 
a thousand people that write in and say, oh, that was great, and we saw this entertainment, and the songs were awesome. We need 20,000 people saying, no, it wasn't great. And we can't be the silent majority. We've, we've got to express ourselves. You know, Coach, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I know many people are probably asking as uh, faith followers, Jesus Christ followers, to be clear, um, they expect us to carry that mantle and what you were just saying based on the theme here you never run alone we could certainly use that kind of support whenever you see something because it is listened to and oh, numbers absolutely. do count so please take what <clears throat> coach just suggested uh, to heart as a matter of fact and, and coach and i've been together for so long now I, I know we were asked and i don't know whether we were in a public forum or whether it was our bible study call but i'm just amplifying on this message if you will that number one in our lives has to really be number one in our lives, no matter the environment. And we were having a conversation with somebody and I said, well, I know that my boss, meaning my job, did not hire me to proselytize, to go out and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. I said, but what I do do is my platform scripture, if you will, is Colossians 3.23, do all that you do heartily, I say excellently, to the Lord and not unto man. My thinking being then that if I'm satisfying the Lord, my bosses can't help but be pleased. Tony was saying, no, in fact, you are hired to speak the good news, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. That is what, and I'm like, coach, no, but that's not what's in my job description. But as he helped me to understand, later as I meditated on the word and thought about the word and reconciled the word, what position did I come to that was in agreement with yours about what we do? No, and JB told me, you know, the difference between avocation and vocation. Avocation is things that you do. That's what we do when we're at work. Our vocation is mm. really serving the Lord. And that came through to me uh, from a guy by the name of Tony Evans. Tony mm. Evans gave us a chapel service one year and it was awesome. He talked about uh, how we should be identified. And he talked about being a Christian athlete and a Christian coach and a Christian whatever. And he said, Christian always has to come first. Mm. You're going to change vocations many times. And I have. I've gone, gone from a Christian athlete to a Christian coach to a Christian broadcaster, Christian father, Christian community <clears throat> service person. But that Christian always has to first. be first. So whatever I'm doing, NBC, you hired me. You have to know and understand you got Christian first. And it's always going to be Christian. If you're not cool with that, don't hire me. <laughs> so one of the questions that came from a live stream, and this flows nicely to what you're saying, what is your life verse, the scripture that best describes you? For me, it is really um, Matthew 16:26. Uh, as I told you last night, my mom hammered that to us over and over and over again. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? And unfortunately, in the National Football League, in 31 years, I saw that happen a lot. I saw men gain everything you could ask for in this world. Money, notoriety, Super Bowl rings, Lombardi trophies, everything People would want to change positions with them. But I knew the inside and I could see the real person and you see hurting down people because they didn't have the relationship with the Lord. So for me, that is what I've always tried to spread and share. And I was fortunately in a great platform for a long time where I could share that with young men. Hey, you can come in here, I can teach you how to be a great football player. But if that's all it is and you forfeit your soul, Gosh, that's going to be a tragedy. And even on the point that you talk about being so resolutely focused on only football, you again lived the opposite of that with some of the things you did in the world of football. Because most of us see coaches as having to be those who, like our good friend Joe Gibbs, who recognized that that wasn't the way to go, he would sleep at the office throughout the week. I mean, they were never home to be with family. I remember um, of his two sons, uh, one was having a birthday and he called from the office to wish him his um, happy 12th birthday. And he said, Dad, um, I'm 15, you know? <laughs> so, but that goes yeah. to show how you can do that. But it you helps. have that 
work family life balance when you were a coach. I love the story about Family Saturday and let you continue on as it relates to Peyton Manning. Yes, I, I had a great, you talk about examples and we talked about it last night. You need examples to follow. Chuck Noll was my example and he was a tremendous coach and we won four Super Bowls in six years but family came first to him. Uh, he took his wife on every road trip because he wanted us to see that mm -hmm. that relationship was number one in his life. His nephew was our video guy. His son was around the office all the time. And it was so important to him that our Saturday practice, uh, you were instructed to bring your kids in. And he wanted them to know that the office wasn't just a place where dad went. Everybody could feel comfortable there. So on Saturdays, we'd have practice when the offense was out there. I can remember, you know, John Stallworth's son would be on my lap. And then when it was defense, our period, my son would be on his lap. And you just talked to him. And the kids were around on Saturday, and they loved it. So when I became a head coach, I said, I'm going to put that in. That's exactly how we're going to do it. We're going to have a little barbecue. We're going to have time. And, and the kids are going to get to go out on the field with their, their dads. We did that in Tampa, and it was great. And our, our players loved it. So when I go to Indianapolis in 2002, I kind of, hey, lay it out. This is what we're going to do family Saturdays. I only had one problem in Indianapolis. <laughs> My quarterback, <laughs> his routine, Peyton, was he kept a yellow legal pad of every play that doesn't, didn't run exactly perfectly on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So on Saturday, he was used to coming in with a list of about 25 plays that we need to 25 run. 25 <laughs> plays? It had to be perfect. If oh, any little good. thing was wrong, he'd run, run it again one last time on Saturday. So uh, it was just a difference of how we were going to look at things. He would get a little frustrated because he'd want to throw a specific ball to Marvin Harrison, and Marvin would have his son with him, and uh, well, he can't get the timing down. And this, so once a... Once a month, he'd come in and say, Coach, I understand what you're trying to do with that. Maybe we could have the kids here, but just leave them in the locker room. If they stayed in the locker room, we'd both get to do what we want to do. And I'd say, well, Peyton, you know, Family Saturday has won a bunch of Super Bowls. I, I, I think we'll be okay with it. So grudgingly, he kind of gave in. He'd still talk to me about it. Well, fast forward then, six years. I'm working at NBC. He's now gone to... The Denver Broncos, he's come out here, yes. Mm -hmm. And they want me to go out and interview him for, we've got him on the game Sunday night. So I'm gonna come out here, I get, to, and don't, I don't even get in the door of the building. And Brandon Stokely comes running up to me and says, coach, you will never in your life believe what Peyton did. I'm like, what, what is he doing? Well, in the meantime, now he's had twins. <laughs> And Brandon said, he went to Coach Fox, and he said, we have to put in Family Saturday. <laughs> These kids need to know where their dads work. This can't be just football 24-7. And my biggest, I think my biggest thrill was seeing the Broncos win in that his last press conference. And his son, Marshall, I think was four years old, and he was at the podium with him, hanging on to his pant leg. And it was just so special to see that come full circle and see Peyton really begin to understand what this was all about, family. And I know I'm driving home and obvious here, but I hope that really speaks to all of us, no matter what the demands are of our job, that family truly is first as well. And it can be made to work. And as you said, it won a lot of Super Bowls with Coach Chuck Knoll and the Pittsburgh Steelers as well. Hey, uh, what are the topics I want to talk about? Because again, with Andrew's theme here, Never Run Alone, your books that you've written has, uh, three or four of them has the uncommon title, which is in sync with that. You delivered a message last night on a Hall of Fame life. Talk about teamwork, which is so important amongst us in general. Many people will pay lip service to that expression, but don't really carry it through, not so in Indy. Yes, I, I learned about teamwork again from, from Coach Noel. Uh, I came into a, an organization that had won two Super Bowls already, and I came in there, and one of the first things Coach Noel said, everybody in this building, everybody on the team is important. Everybody's job is important. Nobody's indispensable. If we lose one of our star players, we'll have to figure out a way to do it otherwise, but everybody's job is important. 
my first year on the team, the biggest job I had was carrying the film projector to the meetings on the road so we'd have video uh, to watch. That was my contribution because I was just learning the game and how to play, and I didn't get in that much. But I felt like, boy, I better get this projector there to the meetings on time, get everything set up because this is important. And he had every one of us feel that way, that no matter how little we played, how much we played, we could contribute. And that led to a great team. That led to teamwork. Later on, when I, I got hired by the Indianapolis Colts, Jim Ursay, our owner, he, he had that same spirit. Everybody in this building is important, and he treated everybody that way, whether you were the janitor, the receptionist, the head coach, the general manager, he treated you with respect, and he wanted you to know that he valued your input. So when we went to the Super Bowl uh, in 2006, he chartered two planes, one plane for the team, one plane for everybody else in the organization. Mm. He took everybody in the organization and their wife, no matter how small your job was, he took them all to the Super Bowl because we were a team. And that is teamwork, absolutely. And you know, I think about that with respect to ministries that we go to as well, and certainly we've seen that here at Karis Bible College, that everybody here, and, and Andrew is, is really atypical in terms of it's not all about me, it's about the people around me. Even as we were sitting in the green room talking with uh, Clay and Matt and Pastor Lamont on some serious issues of the day, or with the um, Beyond the Game team, a part of his television ministry with Stephen uh, uh, Bransford and, and Leslie McClure, everybody has got something of value that they add to us. So we see teamwork reflected in a very important way here at a ministry like this. Oh, we do. And I, I love what you, your favorite saying is every joint supplies. Mm. And uh, that's what you have when you have a good team. You have everybody working together, everybody feeling like their job is important, everybody working to be the absolute best, working as unto the Lord, mm. uh, whether it's a role I like or, or, or don't like. Uh, and so often in life, we, we, we kind of say, I want a bigger role, you know, or, or I should be in this position, and I'm not, so I'm frustrated. We see that in TV all the time. TV is so much, we get criticized for being egotistical in mm. football. TV is worse, oh, I promise. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. How much is the camera on me? How long is my segment? I didn't get no uh, time yes, on this segment yes. here, you know? Yeah. I, I only got a yeah. minute 50, and JB got a minute 55. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got to talk to the producer about this. And it's like that way on and on and on. But when you've got a real cohesive unit and you work together and you don't care uh, about your situation, you care how well the team does, mm. that's when you win. But Tony, and again, in the game of life, we were just back there talking. Well, Patsy says, I can't call him Pastor Paul Milligan because he was pastor for a quick minute. It's Pastor Greg Moore and it's teacher and singer Paul Milligan. You know? But anyway, remember, Paul was in there talking about the relationship that he and Pastor Moore had. And there was no contentiousness, no pride in terms of one taking over the church. And even when they started talking about salary, Pastor Moore did not want to discuss it at all, it reminds me, and, and Paul said the same thing in his business, he's never gone in to negotiate a salary. I would have thought that would be difficult. That's a reflection of how God's ways are different than man's ways. But that call that you got from Robert, from a Jim Ursay after you got fired from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I think it's worth repeating again, that you did not go, to, he went down the list of telling you what you didn't have to do because he wanted you. Yeah, and it, it was great. And you talk about salary and negotiating that. Again, I go back to Coach Noel. When I first went to work for him as a coach, he gave me two pieces of advice. He said, number one, understand that your job is to help your players play better. Mm -hmm. That's the only job you have as a coach. And when he said that to me, I thought, wow, that really explains him. That's why he's so good. He doesn't feel like he has to be the boss. He's not the guy making the rules. He's mm -hmm. not the one proving that he's in charge. He's just helping us play better. And if he does that, we're going to make him look good. And so when, when he said that, the light bulb went off, and I kept that for the next 28 years, help my players be the best they can be, and I'm doing my job. And then a little while later, as he could see, I was going to move up the ladder and, and, and saw that I had some potential. He just pulled me in his office one day said, let me give you another piece of advice. He said, you're going to get a chance. People are going to ask you to come work for them. 
Never make your decisions where you're going to go based on money, salary, or job title. So when you make a decision based on who you're going to work for, who you're going to work with, and what you'll be able to learn. Mm. And that was such great advice. And I took that and I kept that with me. And I never worried about how much money I'd make. I'd leave that up to the Lord. I never took a job because I'm going to be the coordinator of this or the assistant head coach of that. Uh, I always wanted to work with good people and for good people. And what could I learn? And it was such great advice. I, I saw so many people leave us and have players leave us because I can get $5,000 more from this team or $2,500 more over here and then call back and say, you know what, I'm miserable because we don't have the atmosphere that we had there. So great advice. God, God will take care of you if you put him first. Absolutely. Hey, another question from the uh, live stream audience. And again, let me just say that while Tony and I like to think that we are growing still daily in the word, uh, we're not theologians. Uh, we don't parse a doctrine in between the various denominations. Uh, we, um, we do the best and we've got some great teachers who uh, assist us in this regard. But we do have some pretty hard hitting questions here uh, that I wanted to get to as well because we need to deal with those. It says, why is it that now this is more doctrinal? We'll turn you on to, to Andrew, to Paul, to Greg, to Pastor Lamont, uh, Barry, uh, Bennett here. But it says, why is it that some promises of God in this person's mind are so much easier to believe than others. There's a lot in the way that's asked. For example, illnesses, plagues, and natural disasters don't frighten me because I believe what Psalm 91 says. However, when it comes to finances, it's harder to trust. What do you do until you get the revelation that he will provide? only because I just got finished saturating myself in Andrew's teachings on financial stewardship. Let me put it in street terms. The money ain't yours. <laughs> Andrew didn't word it that way. He said, we are stewards of God's money. So it sounds like you got a pride problem or trust problem, but why is it so tough to deal with trust in the area of finances. You know, I, I think we're all wired a little differently mm. because some people would say just the opposite of that. Mm. Oh, I can trust God in finances. I don't worry about that. But, boy, let, let, let my son get sick. Mm. And, gosh, I, I fall apart. But what we've got to learn is how to trust God in everything. And I heard a, a pastor say that the Lord's always going to test us. And it's just like a good teacher, like my mom was a good teacher. If you don't pass the test, I'm not going to just let you go on and graduate. You're going to have to retake that test again until you pass. And so if finances is a stumbling block for you, and I just can't trust the Lord with my finances, mm -hmm. he's going to keep putting you in positions to test you until you do. Uh, and what we've got to do is just really say, I'm going to believe the whole Bible. I wish I had Andrew's little Bible up here so I could hold it up. <laughs> no, but the print's that yeah. big, Tony, but go but ahead. The whole Bible right. is true, and all these promises mm. are true, and you're going to have to trust me in everything. And eventually we get the message. But it is hard because, and Satan is smart. Satan's like a football coach. He's not going to attack us in ways that we're strong. So he's not going to attack me with finances because he knows that that's not the way to get me. But um, he's going to look for those weak areas, so we've got to make them strengths. Again, I go back to Coach Noel. He'd always say, you've got to work on your weaknesses. If all you'd like to do is tackle people, but you don't like to block, it's going to be tough for you to block. You've got to work on that because that's a weak spot of yours. So I've got to work so Satan will try to hit me another way or, or, or figure out that that's not the way to attack me. Work on that, and it still comes through the Holy Spirit. God, I've got to trust you. You said it, so I've got to believe it. And again, I go back to the start of it. The money isn't ours. It's his. The parable of the talents certainly underscores that as well. And if he can't trust us with that, why do, why do we think he's going to trust us with more? And Tony, I guess I'm feeling a, a little emotional because this pops up. You just got finished saying we need to trust him and everything. And I know this is a very sensitive topic, but let me at least start it to say, I'm not just asking you this. I know it because when my mom went home to be with the Lord, I was still new in my Christian walk. My sister, much deeper. 
I didn't understand why she kept telling me, you've got a nice surface knowledge of the word of God. You need to dig deeper into the word of God. And she told me that. And you've done that even when on our Bible study call, as Tony mentioned, we've got about, you know, uh, 60 people that participate weekly. We've got a, a universe of just like a church, about 100 who are members around the country, but a hard 50 to 60 who show up um, every week. And uh, I know when my sister was telling me to dig deeper into the Bible, little was I aware that it was preparing me. And I can't talk too much about it because your boy is known as the weeping minister in his church. Uh, even though I'm strong and I trust the Lord and I know it's all good. When my mom went home to be with the Lord, that was tough. Um, but I had a pastor who helped me to walk through that grieving process and to understand, well, what do I really believe about the word? Nobody had it tougher. And I think Andrew, he had even mentioned that he saw you um, stand outside to talk to the television cameras uh, after the passing of your son. And he said that that man has to be a Christian. Why did you stand so strong in the passing of your son that you could stand before the television cameras and give a gospel message? And also the question that somebody asked you about what you know about heaven. Just take the story from there. Yeah, we lost our son uh, in 2005. He was 18 years old, and it was, it was tough. It was difficult. Uh, but I guess going back to the training of my parents, if I say I'm a Christian, I love the Lord, and God's going to take care of me, and we win a game, and I can go out and say, hallelujah, God's good. But I get fired, mm. and I can't say God's good. Or I lose a son, and I can't say God's good. Am I really believing in him? Do I really have faith in him? I say I trust you in every situation. And as long as the situations are good, mm -hmm. I'm with you. But let something bad happen. That's what Satan said about Job. Let, take something from him. We'll see how he is. And so we've got we've to understand that. Things are going to happen in this world that aren't going to be pleasant, that are going to be painful. But God still has us, just like we talked this morning. We're never alone if we'll tune in to that arm of, of God and, and prayer. So I was very determined to show people that, you know, this is painful, it hurts, it's something that mm. no parent can ever, ever expect. You're not ready for it. But if I'm a Christian, I can come through it on the other side. God's going to work it for good. So that was my thought process, and the Lord has worked it for good. But the one thing that really, really helped me, and, and God says if, we, if we'll trust him, he'll give us the strength that we need, and he'll, he'll show us. Uh, one of my high school buddies, after the service, came up to me. We're walking out of the church, and he said, I, I just want to ask you one question. With what you know about heaven, if God gave you the power to bring your son back here right now, would you do it? And I thought about that, and I said, man, with what I know about heaven, I don't think I would because... I wouldn't bring him back to this world when he's experiencing such joy right now. That would be selfish on my part. So I don't think I would. And that changed my whole outlook about it. It was still painful. I still miss him. I miss those conversations. But I wouldn't, I, I don't look back. And I've been able to share that with people, share that with a lot of parents who've lost children. And it's been a blessing. And the Apostle Paul says, God comforts us so we can comfort others. I was comforted in that moment, and that gave me a chance to comfort other people, and God's worked it together for good. And you know what, Tony? I know that uh, when my mom was in the hospital on her bed of affliction the last several weeks of her life, and the doctors couldn't pull the plug because there was still brain wave activity, but they were telling us how her system was breaking down, and all I could just fathom was the kind of pain that my mother had to be dealing with. And um, I remember going to whisper in her ear to say, if you're ready to go home to be with the Lord, we're fine. You taught us well. Amen. And, and God Amen. was strong with us through that. So praise Amen. God. So, yeah. Um, so let me find something light here so your boy won't just boo-hoo all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> oh. With Pastor Lamont, Matt, and, and Clay, as we were talking about, the, the, this is a tough one too, Tony. Uh, you feature, if you will, and live out of your identity 
in Jesus Christ as opposed to that of a coach, a player, a broadcaster, a black man, or anything else. Is that an accurate representation of you? And how is it that some of those other elements don't factor into how you model your life as a Christian? Yeah, no, they, they do factor in. I think we're a product mm. of all of our experience in life. And growing up where I did, growing up with the parents I did, going to school where I did, playing on the team that I played for, all of that impacts who I am. Mm. But nothing can impact me as much as Christ. That's what I have to show. And that, it took me a while to learn that uh, because we'll get put in those positions. Well, what's the more important allegiance to my friends, to whoever, to my job? No, my impo most important allegiance is to Christ. Your colleague Jim Nance gave me a great opportunity to say that on national TV. We won the Super Bowl, and they're going to present the trophy to us. And Jim Nance says, hey, this is a historic event, first African-American coach to win a Super Bowl. It's got to make you proud. I said, Jim, I am very proud of that. I'm proud of my African-American heritage. I know there are a lot of coaches who could have done this, mm -hmm. but they didn't get the chance, and I feel like I'm representing them. So I am proud of that. But more important than that, to me, this victory was for Christ. I'm proud that Lovey Smith and I could stand up as Christian coaches and demonstrate that you can win the Lord's way. So that, that has to trump everything. Our mm -hmm. Christian heritage has to trump every other thing in our life. And you know, and the, the beautiful thing about that, Tony, uh, for the two weeks building up to the Super Bowl, you know, the press comes from around the country and they are trying to find a story. I mean, just legions of folks descend on the Super Bowl city and they want to know everything. Tony, what shoe size do you wear? You know, what kind of sneakers do you wear? You know, did you buy or did you wear spandex? I mean, they're asking the most stupid questions possible. So right. much so you remember Doug Williams, who was the first black quarterback to play in the Super Bowl. He had one guy ask him, how long have you been a black quarterback? <laughs> I praised God when Lovey Smith and Tony Dungy were the opposing coaches because all they were going to get was Christian food for those two weeks and they got it. And then when you won the Super Bowl, Every business publication out there, too, what uh, Paul Milligan was asking you about Nehemiah and studying leadership principles in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Forbes, everything was about winning the Christian way. So that was, I'm sure, a repercussion or a benefit that you never even thought yeah, would happen. Absolutely was. Yeah. Mm. So, Tony, what do you feel has been your biggest disappointment? A few more questions and we'll wrap it up. Your biggest disappointment. <sighs> Gosh. I don't have many, but I will say this. My biggest athletic disappointment in my career, I was a young head coach with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and uh, had an offensive coordinator by the name of Mike Shula. And Mike was great. He did exactly what we wanted. Uh, he, he was a good, good coach and a good man. 1999, we went all the way to the NFC Championship game. We played the uh, St. Louis Rams at the time. We lost the game 11-6, to six, and we're that close to the Super Bowl. And our ownership came to me and said, I want you to fire Mike Shula. If we'd have scored one touchdown, mm. we'd have been in the Super Bowl. And I knew it wasn't the right thing to do. I knew Mike had done the very best he could. We had a lot of things going on. We are playing with a rookie quarterback. We had lost two of our offensive linemen who were great players that both had been hurt leading up to that game. We had a lot of things going on on offense. We knew we were going to have to win a close defensive battle. And I said, this is not, we can't blame this loss on Mike Shula. But I thought about the whole thing and being under authority. And I said, these are my bosses and they're telling me this is what they want. And um, I, I was still young as a coach at that time. I kind of explained that then, and Mike, to his credit, came to me and said, don't let everybody lose their job. Don't let us all get fired. I'll step down and resign. And so I let Mike resign. And the next day, I knew that was the wrong thing to do. And I've, I've, of all the things that have happened, losing games, losing Super Bowls, that's the one thing that sticks out in my mind because I didn't stick up for someone who worked for me who I knew was doing a great job. And that's the one disappointment, one regret I have. Hard question here, and let me set this up for Matt and uh, Clay as well, too. Um, my uh, watch is actually five minutes ahead of time, 
And you know why? Two people, you and Andrew. <laughs> Andrew on his series, Excellence, a spirit, uh, The Excellent Spirit, or The Spirit of Excellence, teaching on Daniel. And then he goes through some examples where he hates people who are late for anything. I don't know if you know anything about me. <laughs> Tony has it, as you've already heard. It, there are no excuses, no explanations. And when it comes to meetings, Tony says if a guy is late coming into a meeting, he will say either what was going on in the meeting wasn't important to you or I can't count on you. So my watch is five minutes fast for everything. That's why we have a few more minutes. I'd like for Matt and Clay, if, there anybody, if there's anybody in here who has a couple of questions, we have time. We have about another eight minutes left, so we do want to get a couple of questions. But let me ask Tony this tough one here, um, because many people have this stereotype as well, and nobody better to answer it than coach. This comes from the live stream. It seems professional sports is a microcosm of society in America. That's correct. However, he says many thugs, but balanced with many Bible-believing Christians. So I guess he's talking about the population in the NFL. But it seems the power in the media, owners, and NFL officials squash any biblical worldview. Would you agree with this? And can it be changed? Wow. Um, first of all, I would say it's really probably not an accurate capitalization of mm -hmm. the NFL environment. Uh, I used to tell our team we have 53 players. Most of the time we have 51, 52 doing great things out there. Mm -hmm. But if we have one person who does something wrong, that's what's going to be highlighted. And I think that's, that's where we've been. Um, I do think we as a media can do a better job Absolutely. of highlighting the wonderful things. We did a piece on... Um, Thursday night, Thanksgiving night, we had the, the game, and normally they show the halftime entertainment or the singer or whatever. We did a piece on Warwick Dunn and what he's doing, awesome. and it was fantastic. Awesome. And we had so many people write in and say, man, I wish we'd have more, more of this. Of I never knew what this young man was doing. Uh, donated 174 homes to single moms. We, we didn't know that was going on. That's our job. We can do a much better job. Wow, well, you know what? And with some of the Beyond the Game pieces, maybe we can even... Amen. Duh! Okay. <laughs> Matt, what do you have? All right, so what is your name? What's your question? My name is Garrett, and I'm just intrigued by your relationship with Michael Vick post-fallout. And I'm just curious as how you mentored him to see such a tremendous turnaround in his life. Great question. Great question. Michael was a young man, and he told me. Uh, I went to visit him in Leavenworth Prison. He's in an orange jumpsuit sitting across from me in the cubicle the, with the plexiglass and said, man, Michael, how did this happen? And he said, coach, I'll tell you, I wasn't raised like this. My mom raised me right. I knew right from wrong. I went to church. I prayed. I prayed that I would make it to the NFL. I got drafted as the number one pick in the draft in 2001, and I thought my prayers were answered, and I forgot about the Lord. Mm. And God has my attention now he's in prison and just uh, it, it, it hit him and he said I, I have to change and I have to get back to that and I want to get back and I want to show young people not to follow the mistakes I made I want to show them that Michael Vick is a good person and follow the good things and not the mistakes and I was very very proud of him I said Mike you're going to be fine and we'll help you get back I don't know if you'll ever get back on the athletic field but we can help you get back and set that example for young people. And he's done it for the last 10 years, and it's been uh, something we're both of us are really, really proud of him. He has walked the road to redemption. Coach was the significant figure in his life in that regard because coaches are. I was blessed to go and visit him at Leavenworth after Coach Tun uh, Tony Dungy did because I was seeking an opportunity to interview him on 60 Minutes. When everybody else, a lot of people were offering him money because they knew he was uh, significantly in debt. And I told him that would be the worst thing that he could do, that no one would believe him if they saw and fleshed his answers through the lens of money. And I said, you tell the truth, God will take care of the rest. Because as Tony indicated, he wanted to get back on the right track, as he said, with the good Lord. He did that. 
And for two years, he had an arrangement with the Humane Society where he was to go into all of the uh, urban neighborhoods in the hoods to try to dissuade people from dog fighting. If there are people in rural America, the Humane Society would get folks from that environment, if you will, to go and try to dissuade people who were engaging in dog fighting, cock fighting, and the like. Two years he had that commitment. Michael's been out of the league now, what, 10 years maybe, whatever it is. He's still doing that because he's committed and resolutely focused and he is on and he has been on the road to redemption and he deserves that second chance. Yes. What's your name and what's your question? My name is Jalen Smith and my question is when you guys first started seeing all the blessings and the manifestations of the Lord, how much were you living his word out in your life? Mm -hmm. Like the bulk of the manifestations, not just here and there. I I will have to say for me, I saw a lot of blessings before Mm -hmm. I was actually living uh, that way. My mom and dad raised me right. I accepted Christ when I was little, but when I was, got to middle school, high school, I'm thinking about being an athlete, being a student, football, basketball, that's what I wanted to do. God still blessed me. He protected me, took me to the right places. When I got to Pittsburgh as a 21-year-old, that's when I started living for the Lord, making him Lord of my life, and the blessings just steamrolled from there. But he, he watched over me for about 10 years when I wasn't necessarily paying attention. And quite simply for me, uh, my mother, when she became saved, made it clear to the five of us kids, all that matters is what the word of God says. And I have bought that lock, stock, and barrel. We've got a couple more minutes left. Go ahead, uh, Clay. What's your name and what's your question? My name is Bill White. Um, my question would be, what's the most best way that you can let the NFL know that the fans disapproval of the stuff like the halftime shows and things of that nature. Hey, just write in and be mm-hmm. vocal. Andrew, and we had a discussion two years ago. Mm-hmm. The flag and the kneeling and people told the NFL point blank, if this doesn't stop, we're going to stop watching. And you know what? They responded to it. Mm-hmm. They, hey, we're going to have some meetings. We're going to talk this through. We're going to get things going. If the public hadn't made that big a deal about it, it never would have gotten solved. But when it started to affect viewership, potential viewership, when they heard from the public that this is turning people off, it became an issue. So if enough people call in and say, you know what, you have more halftime shows like this, we're going to stop watching, I promise you things will change. Matt? Okay, so what is your name? What is your question? Name is Daniel, and the question is, how would you address, or how do you believe it should be addressed, the athletes that are taking a knee to our flag and our national anthem? Well, Tony just addressed it, but let me just say in succinct fashion, because it's a longer conversation. That's how we were blessed by Andrew to do the program Beyond the Game. Andrew made it perfectly clear, if I'm characterizing this best, and please correct me, Tony or Andrew, that he believed that the athletes were being anti-patriotic, by doing such, and he absolutely disagreed with it. That issue was probably the biggest split in Christendom in black churches and white churches because a number of the athletes who were looking for a meaningful way to raise to the level of the consciousness of many folks the kind of systemic issues that still go on in communities of color and are not being addressed, they wanted to have a collective, diverse, inclusive group to sit down and talk owners who were in those 32 cities so that they could help to strengthen the fabric of those communities in meaningful ways, in meaningful ways, who own businesses, that drug dealer out there with a good math mind, as opposed to having him think that he's got to be the scourge of his community, give him an internship so that he could have a broadened vision to see he could be a CFO. Now, there are those who hurt the cause because they have no clue. There was no end uh, in sight in terms of what they were trying to accomplish. Many people hijacked the narrative. I firmly believe that Colin Kaepernick didn't help the matter because he didn't sit down to talk about what it was with too many other people hijacking the narrative. However, there are a number of good players, black and white, who have been involved in legislative uh, decisions throughout the country and have done a number of good things that just don't get the visibility. Funding money in underfunded uh, school districts, if you will. Changing some laws as opposed to having a 12 or 15 year old be tried as a, an adult for things like that that carry and carry with them the rest of their lives. So there are some good things. Those are the kind of things that people don't want to tune in to listen to in football. I get that. 
but they were looking to get their attention. So on our show that Andrew has blessed beyond the game, we've gotten some awesome stories of athletes across the demographic spectrum who are doing some good things, and we'd like to see them right now. Beyond the game is one venue for um, publicizing that. You follow what I'm saying? And we don't have to agree, but that's what they were looking to do. Yeah, and, and I would just say this. I said on our show on NBC when all this was taking place and people said this is very, very offensive to the military and offensive to our veterans and what the flag stands for. And I said, well, my dad was a veteran. Mm. My dad enlisted and fought in World War II. My dad mm. had to fight in mm. an all-black unit because he wasn't allowed to be in an integrated Air Force and my dad fought for the Tuskegee Airmen, and my dad would not have been offended because he told me that's why they fought, that we should have the freedom to be able to express things and come together and talk about it. So I don't think we can just say point blank, this is offensive, okay? But what can we do? And what my dad would have said was, what can we do to make this better? Mm. How can we come and get a dialogue to Get your point across and make it better. Maybe kneeling is not the best way. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is. But what we've got to do is foster dialogue so we make the situation better. And Tony's father came back from the war with a Ph.D., could not get a job in a school system because he was black, had to walk past the white school in his neighborhood to go teach at the black school. But to your point, as Christians, the way we go and attack the problem, your father Follow that mantra. What can you do to make it better? And he wanted to make certain he had the best qualified students graduating from that. And that's the way we should do it, again, inclusively as well. Hey, I didn't want to end on that note, but let me give Coach Dungy the closing words since this is his last appearance here as you close out with the audience. But if we could first, let's give Coach Dungy a hand. Thank you. Well, thank you, JB, and thank you. Thanks to everyone who's watching. Uh, this is always special for me to come. And uh, if I could say anything to you to close this session, it would be this. Never run alone. Okay? Make sure we're running with the right crowd, the right people that can encourage us, and make sure we're running with the Lord by staying under his armor and by staying in prayer and communication with him. Thank you so much. Welcome to AWM Now, your source for everything that's happening here at Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. Years ago, Karis graduate Teresa Hotelling shared her testimony of how she was healed of lupus and Sjogren syndrome, but her story does not end there. We caught up with Teresa to hear how her time at Karis, as well as her miraculous healing, propelled her to do full-time ministry with her husband around the world. We spent two years in the Middle East studying Arabic, uh, and then God called us back in 2018. The ministry started in 2019, and then the Middle East was kind of reborn on the inside of us. We started thinking about how we could take what we learned um, to the people in the Middle East, especially to the church in the Middle East, because they don't have materials. They don't have good, solid teaching over there. And we started thinking, well, how can we how can we get that to them? One way they do this is through Andrew's discipleship evangelism materials that have been translated into Arabic, giving people the message of God's love and grace in their mother tongue that will last long after Teresa and Patrick leave the country. If you take it in an English, say, um, say in a small village or something, the pastor is the only one that speaks English. Whereas if it is translated into their language, it's available to everybody. We just wanna know what we can do to help them be equipped to teach their people, to teach their sheep, and to impact the other community around them. I, I can't think of anything better than taking what I have been given and giving it to other people because it has so changed my life that I, I can't not, I can't not share it with other people. Thank you, friends and partners, for providing a place where people like Teresa can become equipped to fulfill the unique call of God on their life and to be a light in some of the world's darkest places. For more information on Fully Known Ministries, click on the link below. Want to dive deeper into the Word, but your busy schedule robs you of that opportunity? 
Now you can listen to the Gospel Truth wherever you go with the Gospel Truth radio app. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are broadcasting the gospel, not only our individual television programs, but we've got conferences on there, and it's great. No matter how your time is divided up each day, now you can plug into the gospel truth 24-7 at your convenience. It's a great way to stay connected in a world that demands so much of your time. Tap the app and start listening to Gospel Truth Radio. Go to the App Store and type in Gospel Truth Radio and download it to your smartphone. You know, if you would like to come to Karis Bible College, but you just can't bring it on yourself to leave where you are and move out here, I would like to let you know that we have extension schools all over the United States as well as many foreign countries. And uh, we have morning classes, night classes. We have Saturday classes where you meet just two Saturdays a month and do the rest by correspondence. There's many ways for you to take advantage. So go check out our website and see if there is a Karis Bible College close to you. As Karis continues to grow, new locations are constantly being added. Students are being equipped through the Word of God and grounded in the message of God's unconditional love and grace. With over 70 locations worldwide and brand new ones starting, there is a Karis waiting for you. Please go to karisbiblecollege.org slash mycampus to find a campus opening near you. Hi, this is Bob Yandio. I host Student of the Word each day here on GospelTruth.tv. Andrew Womack has got together some of the greatest teachers across the body of Christ to teach on the subject of grace and faith, the gifts of the Spirit, all the things you need to walk a successful Christian life. I think it deserves your prayer support and most of all your financial support. You can't find a network like this. What a great blessing this is. This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Meditate on these things. Give yourself wholly to them that your profiting may appear to all. I can profit every day in my Christian life and know tomorrow I'm going to profit. The next day I'm going to profit. I don't plan on sinning tomorrow. I don't plan on sinning the next. I plan on growing in righteousness. But if I do sin, if I do find myself going, Bob, you stupid thing, how could you have done that? Father, I confess my sins. I acknowledge the fact that I've done it and I go on my way. I can keep profiting each and every day. My double vision is simply this. By focusing on tomorrow with two eyes, I can, number one, with this eye, say, I'm going to walk in righteousness. Number two, if I do mess up, I'm going to get back into righteousness and keep on going. I'm covered in both directions. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Glad to have you here today. Uh, we began a series yesterday on the importance of the Word of God. It'll be lasting through this week. It might bleed over into next week. We'll just see. I'm just going to teach it till I get to the end of it and go, that's it. But uh, in this teaching, we're talking about the importance of the Word of God in our life. Understand this, that Jesus is the focus of faith to get saved. After we're saved, the Word of God is the focus of faith to grow. And that's what God wants. He not only wants us to get born again, He wants to become walking and talking like Him. So the object of salvation is Jesus Christ. The object of growing up and maturity is the Word of God. And so, and literally, a sinner does not have to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. He just believes that Jesus Christ is Lord. Once he gets born again, he can now move over to the Word of God because until he's born again, the Word of God is foolishness to him. Doesn't make any sense. It has to be spiritually discerned. So when you're witnessing to people, don't try to convince them the Bible is the Word of God. You can quote a scripture and it has power behind it. It has revelation behind it, but you don't have to convince them the Bible is the Word of God. And you have to convince them that all the Bible is the Word of God because you have Christians that still pull parts of it out and say, that's not for today, that's not for today, when it is for today. The whole Bible's for today. 
And the closing of the Bible actually tells us, don't add to it or take away from it. And boy, people are liking to take it away. This section doesn't belong there. We're not under this anymore. And that just is not true. So let's come back to where we were talking yesterday and look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. We were talking about the function of the word of God toward keeping us from sin, giving us power over sin. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, it says this, when they heard this, this is the multitudes who heard the word of God, they were pricked in their heart. The same word that convicts a sinner of his need of salvation is the same word that convicts the believer of his need of sanctification. So you can share a scripture with an, an unbeliever and he'll get convicted of his need of Jesus Christ. Once he's born again, then the same word of God now convicts him of his need to grow in sanctification. So here's what happens. The word of God only reveals Jesus, but also warns against sin, gives us power to live the Christian life, but also to discern, understand, and resist the temptation of sin. David said in the Old Testament, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. First Peter chapter one and verse 15 says, but as he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation or literally in every area of life. Notice God is holy. I become holy. So the Bible says, be holy as I am holy. Literally become holy is the Greek word as I am. And the word am is I am always have been, always will be. God doesn't have to grow in holiness. He's always holy, has always been holy, will always be holy, and he can't grow in holiness because if he can, he's got some areas of, of his own life that need to be changed, and that would be sin. In our life, no, we need to grow, and so we become holy just as God is holy, and this is the whole area of sanctification, growing in the things of God. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 19 says, After that I turned and I repented, and after that, I was instructed. I hit my thigh. This, in other words, is a form of self-discipline. I hit my thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even confounded. He said the conviction that came to me left me confounded. I couldn't believe I was in such bad shape. And the word of God will reveal that to you. It not only reveals the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it reveals the unrighteousness still remaining in you, not in your spirit, I'm talking about in your daily life, in your thinking, because the renewing of the mind is so important. The moment I get born again, my spirit is the image of God. I can't get any more righteous in my spirit tomorrow than I am today or a hundred years from today than I am today. I am perfect in righteousness in me. This is where I have the problem. Real revelation doesn't take place down here. It takes place up here. When you are looking at the word of God and suddenly say, oh, I see it. You didn't see it down here. You mean I now understand it. Oh my goodness, the revelation of the understanding of it came to me. And with all you're getting, get understanding, get revelation of the word of God. And so that's the whole key area here that it's referring to in this verse of scripture. But it shows you not only the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it shows you still the unrighteousness left in your daily life, in your thinking, and more and more in your daily life and in your thinking, you become more conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day I become more like him in my daily walk. I can't be any more like him in my spirit. That's where he lives. The Holy Spirit lives. I'm perfect in my spirit, but I got a long way to go in my thinking and in my daily living before the world. So again, this is what Jeremiah said. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 10 says this. This is speaking here. I took the little book from the angel's hand and ate it up. It was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. The word of God is so wonderful when we study it, but the more we understand it, all of a sudden it's like we swallow it and it becomes bitter. Why does the word of God become bitter on the inside? It shows us what's wrong with us. The word of God is the greatest thing for showing you true areas that are wrong with you. But listen, God doesn't show it to you that you can't fix it. And you fix it through the word of God. The word of God is exactly that way. Even in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8, the believers, that's the, the inhabitants of Israel, and before they went across the Red Sea, had to partake of the Passover lamb. But they also ate it with bitter herbs. Bitter herbs simply means even now that you've received the Lord, even now that you've eaten the Passover lamb, it comes with bitter herbs, meaning what? The word of God not only tells you and nourishes you 
and brings you strength, but also like bitter herbs shows you things that are wrong with you. After you've rejoiced in the word of God and said how wonderful this is, you think, well, wait a minute, it says this, Woo, man, I still have a ways to go. That's good for you. That's great for you. Simply shows you, and now that I've been born again, I have to grow up. It's like a child. Now that the child's been born, it's time for that child to grow up and become an adult. And that's going to be with many trials, falling on the floor, getting back up, uh, falling again, getting back up, uh, missing the mark, getting back up, doing something wrong, asking mom and dad to forgive you, go on. That's the way the Christian life is too. The Christian life is, I heard one minister say one time who flew an airplane saying before they, before they had, uh, you know, autopilot, he said it was Correction all the time, all the time. He said, the Christian life is adjust and repair, adjust and repair. It's like driving your car down the road. And as you drive it down the road, you adjust and repair. You're constantly doing this. You don't just sit in the car and hold it like this because if you hold it like this, eventually you'll start heading in the wrong direction. You eventually way down the road, you'll run off the road. You've got to constantly keep doing this. That's the Christian life. Adjust and repair, adjust and repair. Perfect on the inside, but I got a long way to go in my thinking and in my daily actions. So again, there's a, there's a morning before comfort. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, and a humbling before exalting. First Peter 5, 6. The word of God will bring mourning into your life, and then after that, it brings comfort. Mourning into your life because it's showing you things that are wrong, but comfort when it shows you how you can correct it through the power of the Holy Spirit and by, again, believing and standing on the word of God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4. First Peter 5, 6 tells us, that not only does the word of God bring humbling into our life, but it'll also bring exaltation. When you humble yourself and learn from the word of God, God will exalt you. Okay, this is the importance again of what the word of God has to say. The word of God leads us to confessing our sins. After you get born again, you still commit sins. Those are not sins for heaven. All of your sins that were forgiven is again to get you into heaven. After you're born again, when you commit a sin, it doesn't separate you from heaven. It separates you from fellowship with God and the control of the Holy Spirit in this lifetime. It's one thing to be born of the Spirit. It's another thing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And sin breaks his control from you and you're under the control of the flesh. But if you confess that sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of that sin. And suddenly now you're being controlled by the Holy Spirit again. The control of the flesh is over over and gone, and you're no longer controlled by it. Now you're controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who's in you controls your life, and people can see Jesus in you. Controlled by the Holy Spirit, you imitate Christ. Not controlled by the Holy Spirit, you imitate the unbeliever. You're not an unbeliever. You are not a sinner, but you're living like one, walking like one, because you're under the control of the of the flesh. Even though the flesh is controlling you, the Holy Spirit lives in you, but his arms are folded. He does not control you. He's waiting for you to simply confess that sin. The moment you do, he's back in control, and now the flesh is no longer in control. Again, this is the Word of God. The Word of God should lead you to confessing sins. The more the Word of God reveals there's things wrong in your life that still need to be dealt with, the more you begin to understand, i got to confess that. Confessing doesn't mean that you get all upset about it. doesn't mean you cry over it. doesn't mean that you feel guilty. doesn't mean that you beat yourself up. doesn't mean that you hang your head down. Oh, woe is me. I've just been so bad. No, it simply means you acknowledge it. The Greek word means to acknowledge it. If we confess our sins, acknowledge it, name it. No, we don't have to name it to the Lord. I mean, the prodigal didn't come home and name all the prostitutes he had slept with and all the places he'd gone and got drunk in. He didn't name all that stuff. He just said, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's all God's waiting for. When David, after a whole year's worth of sin, with Bathsheba, had a baby out of wedlock, murdered her husband, all those different things. The Bible says when he came to the Lord, he said to uh, to the prophet Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said, your sins are forgiven and you won't die. Let's take a look at John chapter three and verse 20. John chapter three and verse 20. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And this isn't talking about sinners only, it's talking about some Christians who do evil. But when you come to the light of the word of God, it sheds that light on you and you begin to see those things that are wrong in you and your deeds are reproved. That's why some people resist the word of God. They don't want the deeds of their life to be reproved from inside of them. Proverbs 28 And verse 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Boy, the moment that you say, Lord, I blew it. I just blew it. 
I've sinned against you. Your sins are forgiven. You can go on your way and you find the mercy of God. Confessing of sins brings you into God's grace, not against God's grace, but into God's grace. God's grace as a Christian confesses, confessing your sin cleanses you with the same blood that he cleansed you with when you got born again. You're still born again, but now you need to get rid of these hanging sins on your life because if you don't, they'll be held against you at the judgment seat of Christ. This is part of your rewards in heaven and you can lose rewards in heaven because you didn't confess your sins here on this earth. So the good thing is, is whenever you do something wrong, Father, I blew it. I'm, that's it. I blew it and go on your way. All he's asking you to do is acknowledge that I have sinned against the Lord. And again, this is important. We're having our, the, uh, what I'm offering is called the importance of the word, a CD series. If you don't have this CD series, you need to get it. And so the announcer is going to come on and tell you how you can have your personal copy of it, because it's again, so important. These will get into more things than I'm teaching you here because again these came from my sermons that I taught them so I want you to have a copy of it for yourself listen to it in the car listen to it in the house whatever and grow in the things of God and then share the information from this with other believers around you I will see you in the second half of this broadcast when we come back John 1 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God without the word of God our lives would be unstable and without direction there would be no hope for believers or, for that matter, the entire world. In this seven-part series, Pastor Bob Yandian emphasizes and explains the vital necessity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Sermon titles include A More Sure Word of Prophecy, The Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Reputation, The Wisdom of God's Word, The Merchandise of Wisdom, wisdom, riches, and honor, and Jesus, our wisdom. To order Importance of the Word, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. Psalm 32 verses 3 and 4 says this, When I kept silent, my bones became old through my roaring, literally my agonizing, all day long. For day and night your hand is heavy upon me. My moisture, this is talking about the strength of my bones, is turned into the drought of summer. The Word of God is what convicts us in a good way. It doesn't convict us that we're going to go to hell. No, that happened when you get born again. You're convicted of rejecting Jesus, so you accept him. But after you're born again, the Holy Spirit reveals individual sins in your life when you do something and convicts you of that. So what you do is confess it, because if you don't, you'll begin to find out again just really how weak you are. Without the help of the Holy Spirit in your life, you are no more powerful than a sinner. Although you're not a sinner, you have lost your power. You're much like Superman walking around like Clark Kent. You need to go in the phone booth of 1 John 1, 9, confess that sin, Take it to the Lord, admit it, and then come out as Superman, all right? And that's what the Lord wants. And so often we get walking in life in carnality. And as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're like mere men. Although we're not mere people, we are super people. We, uh, we walk like mere people. We forget the power we have. We forget the anointing of the Holy Spirit, who Jesus Christ has made us. And we need to walk in that each and every day. The Word of God not only teaches us about sin, but also the longer we're in the Word of God, we develop a hatred towards sin. I remember hearing somebody say one time, well, we're not supposed to hate anything. Yeah, you can hate sin. You can hate unrighteousness. That's perfectly fine on the inside. And so there's a proper hatred. You know, most sin is simply taking something from God and twisting it. You know, um, uh, God wants you to be, enjoy your wife and have sex with her. So you think, well, okay, I can have a prostitute over here. No, it's taking a truth and twisting it and pulling it over here. 
And this thing about, well, we're not supposed to hate, we're supposed to love. Yes, I know the Bible says we're supposed to love, but also there's a proper time to hate the works of the enemy, hate the works of iniquity. Let's take a look at some verses on that. Psalm 97 and verse 10. You who love the Lord hate evil. It simply means we cannot love God without hating what he hates. We love what he loves. He hate and we hate what he hates. The one of the reasons Jesus sent Jesus Jesus was sent into the world by God the Father was because God loved the world and sin. And so he sent somebody so that he could love them and get rid of the sin so he wouldn't hate that sin and he could pour out his love on people. So again, there's a hatred in God toward whatever Satan does. Psalm 119, verse 104. Through your precepts, this is the word of God, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. You begin to love the righteous way and you begin to hate the unrighteous way. You begin to love the, the correct way of, of a, how a world should be and how people should be. You have a love for people and you can't stand when politics and religion and the viewpoints of men go contrary to the word of God. It irritates you on the inside. And so that's again often why you hear Christians yelling out so much today about the injustices of the world and what the word of God has to say about it. Of course, our answer is, first of all, number one, get them saved. And number two, get them to come to the full knowledge of the truth. This is how we pray for government leaders. Timothy told us this. And Paul's admonition to Timothy speaks to us today. So we again pray for those in authority. And oftentimes we pray, Lord, just get them out of office. Oh, God, they're just unholy. They're unrighteous. They're, they're, everything they're doing is wrong. So we pray they'll get voted out. Well, don't pray that. Pray, first of all, that somebody will cross their path and tell them the message of Jesus Christ. Pray for workers to cross their path and tell them about Jesus. Number two, pray that once they do get saved, they'll come to the full knowledge of the truth. This is simply the Great Commission. We pray for them to get saved, and we pray for them to come to the full knowledge of the truth, to get born again and become Christians, and number two, to become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, that's Psalm 119. Verse 104, Psalm 119, we go down to verse 128. So I esteem all your precepts concerning things to be right, and I hate every false way. Again, he used that phrase, I hate every false way. The more we understand the word of God, the more we realize how many ways around us are false. They may sound good. They may be, again, have kind of a kind of a holy sound to them or a kind of a, a flavoring of the word of God, but we realize it's been pulled out of context. And the world preaches, well, if you'll love somebody, you can go to heaven. No, the only one you can love and go to heaven is Jesus Christ himself and accept him as Lord and Savior. The division between heaven and hell is not good people and bad people, moral people and immoral people. The difference between heaven and hell is one accepted Jesus Christ and goes to heaven. The other rejected Jesus Christ and went to hell and had nothing to do with their lifestyle. It had everything to do with the opening of the heart to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9, here God the Father commended Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ's work was over. And this is a quote from the Old Testament, also from the book of Psalms. But when Jesus Christ arose into heaven after being on the earth and stood there on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, Acts chapter 1 tells us what it was like on earth to stand and watch Jesus go away. And then Hebrews chapter one tells us what it was like to be in heaven and see Jesus Christ enter. And here's one of the things God the Father said to him. He first of all said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Then he said in verse nine, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. If Jesus Christ truly is our goal, if Jesus Christ really is our example and we want to think like him, to have the mind of Christ then first of all, we should love righteousness. And second of all, we should hate iniquity. It's all right to hate the works of the devil. I don't hate people. I hate the unholiness in them that came from Satan. I hate the demonic activity and the demonic thinking that they are in right now. I despise it. And so my whole thing is not to throw the person away. I want to throw the devil away and save the person. I want the person to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, then have their mind renewed by, again, the importance of the Word of God. The Word of God leads not only to the revealing of sin and hatred of sin, it also leads to the forsaking of sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having these promises, 
Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The more we begin to follow the word of God, we begin to clean ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and we recognize the filth. In other words, as we see ourselves walking toward a mud puddle, we walk around it. We don't walk through it. We're not a child. That's what children do. But as you get older, you realize, I don't want to mess my clothes up. I don't want to have to take a bath over the stuff later. If I have a chance, when I drive my car, if I see a puddle coming up, I don't like to ride with people that go head straight for the puddle. I think you just wash the car. Why would you do this? I would go around. If I look around, I'm looking in my rear view mirror and go around that thing if I see puddles. In fact, if, if it's, if there's more water on the side of the road, you know, that's next to the curb, I stay to the middle lane. I just, I don't want that. I want to get in the left lane because again, the roads are usually shaped where the water runs off to the side. I don't want to drive through all that. I just spent time cleaning my car. The point of it is if I want to leave a clean Christian life, I see not only the, the importance of confessing sin and cleansing myself from it, I see it coming down the road and don't want to drive through it. Don't want to walk through it. I don't want to walk through that puddle. Second Timothy chapter two and verse 19, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's what the word of God teaches you. It shows you iniquity and builds inside of you a hatred toward iniquity. Like God, the father said of the Lord Jesus Christ, he hated iniquity. We should hate iniquity also and want to walk free from it. John 15, three, now you are clean through the word of God, which I have spoken unto you. Wow, I'm clean. And by walking in righteousness before God, I can remain clean. And if I do get dirty, I can confess my sins. Jesus and his blood cleanses me and I'm clean again. And that's the beauty of it. In other words, I can walk free from sin, but if I do commit sin, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, that I confess my sin to, and he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. Next of all, the word of God guards us against future sins. Psalm 119 verse 11. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against uh, you. This again comes to seeing that mud puddle down the road ahead. I'm not going to drive through that. I'm not going to walk through that. I'm not going to get myself dirty. And the word of God in me helps to reveal unrighteousness down the road. Again, the best way to keep bad seed from coming up is to plant good seed. And the beauty of the good seed is it can overcome the bad seed. Keep sowing good seeds in my life. Keep sowing the word of God into my life. Keep sowing the promises of God into my life. Psalm 37 and verse 31. The law of God is in my heart. None of my steps will slide. So it's simply saying here, you can begin to confess. I'm going to walk in righteousness every day. If I see it coming, I'm going to walk free from it. I'm going to walk around that thing. I'm not going to walk through it. And that can be your vision every single day. Isaiah 42 and verse 23. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? The word of God prepares you for the time to come. The Holy Spirit in you takes that word, reveals it to you, shows it to you, empowers you to where you can have strength for the time to come. And finally, the word of God will cause you to practice righteousness, not just see it, not occasionally walk in righteousness, but practice it in your daily life. John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Keep means to guard and walk in them every single day. First Timothy chapter six and verse 15 says, meditate on these things, give yourself wholly to them that your profiting may appear to all. I can profit every day in my Christian life and know tomorrow I'm going to profit. The next day I'm going to profit. I don't plan on sinning tomorrow. I don't plan on sinning the next day. I plan on growing in righteousness. But if I do sin, if I do find myself going, Bob, you stupid thing, how could you have done that? Father, I confess my sins. I acknowledge the fact that I've done it and I go on my way. I can keep profiting each and every day. My double vision is simply this. By focusing on tomorrow with two eyes, I can, number one, with this eye, say, I'm going to walk in righteousness. Number two, if I do mess up, I'm going to get back into righteousness and keep on going. I'm covered in both directions. If you're not a partner with me in this ministry, join me, will you? I've got so many great partners. I've got a team around me that's wonderful that helps me accomplish all that we do. And all the things we do around here comes because of your prayers, your standing in agreement with us, but also your financial contributions. I'd like you to become a monthly partner with me. What can you afford? You say, well, I don't know if the Holy Spirit's going to show me what I'm supposed to give. He can, but if he doesn't, then you purpose in your heart what you're going to give. If the Holy Spirit speaks to you, be obedient to the Holy Spirit as to exactly what he says to do. But next of all, if you pray for a figure and he doesn't give you one, look at your income. Look at what you can do. Examine that 
and then make up your mind. And as you purpose in your heart, so give. Go to my website, bobyandian.com. And there you'll find a place on there where you can become a partner with me. And again, I'm looking forward to you joining me, walking with me through this and becoming a partner and, a, and part of my team to where we can accomplish great things together. And we'll never see the total of this until we get to heaven and see all the lives we affected for eternity. Finances given into the kingdom of God is eternal. I'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian. Attention small business owners and anyone looking to start a new business. We have a conference you won't want to miss. It's Billy and Becky Epperhart's Business Mastery Workshop. This year, it's an interactive live stream conference you can watch from home or your office. And your employees can watch it with you as well. All for a fraction of what it would cost to attend in person. In today's business climate, innovation is the key to not just surviving, but thriving. COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on thousands of small businesses. In this type of climate, you have to revision your business, your product, and how to serve your customers in a whole new light. That's right, you have to innovate. And Billy Epperhart and his team of experts will show you how to do it fast and do it successfully. One of our key teaching points this year is how to market your business faster and better when the market conditions are changing month to month. If we can help you tweak your marketing approach just a little bit, you may see your profits increase dramatically. Another major teaching from this year's Business Mastery Workshop is how to make a strategic assessment of where your business is today and discover what practical steps you can take now to become more profitable in a COVID-19 world. Billy will show you how to execute new ideas in the middle of the COVID pandemic. The live stream conference is Friday, August 28th through Sunday, August 30th, and it's filling up fast. Register today. Go to wealthbuilders.org and click on the Business Mastery Workshop banner. Karen Conrad serves as Vice President of Wealth Builders. She is a consultant, teacher, author, and maintains a successful real estate and home staging business that has been featured on the Lifetime Television Network. Welcome to Living with Karen Conrad. Thank you for joining me on Living with Karen Conrad. We're in a brand new series called Keys to Success. And if you missed yesterday's program, I encourage you to go on my website and download the information that I provided. And I'll review it for you today. Um, we are talking about 15 keys to success. So here are the things that we introduced. And today we're going to be focusing on the first one, which is be a finisher. So number one, be a finisher. Number two of the keys to success is enthusiasm. Number three is habit force. Number four is develop a positive mental attitude. Number five is make a commitment to excellence. Number six is learn to speak on your feet. Number seven is handle your emotions. Amen. <laughs> Number eight, learn to handle criticism. Number nine is the law of attraction and favor. Number 10 is persistence and perseverance. Number 11 is conquer worry and pressure. Number 12 is be decisive. Number 13 is have financial reserves. Number 14 is ask questions, be a lifelong learner. And number 15 is the power of choice. I'll tell you what. Um, as I ob observed people that I have respected and that I want to learn from, as I have walked through areas of my life where at times I've been successful and times I've been not so successful, these keys all have a foundation in the Word of God. And I truly believe this is why they are keys to success.
Yes, because the foundation of it is the Bible and the foundation is Jesus. And so let's start with the first one today, which I think is absolutely critical. And I'll probably say that about all of these because as I start talking about it, I get passionate about each and every one. But you know, this is such a great area to start because first of all, just in my observation with organizations, ministries, businesses, even people in their personal life, just look at marriages. Do you know, we have to be finishers. If we are not finishers, we will not achieve success. We can all come up with ideas. We can have big dreams, but if we are not able to put action to those things, we will never see the results that we are looking for. So let's start in Galatians 6, 9. It says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Do you know, I went to a large church in Minnesota for many years and the pastor used to say it like this. If you don't quit, you win. And I know that sounds very simple, but it is very profound. How can we be so confident in saying, if you don't quit, you win? Well, of course, it's based on Galatians 6, 9. But also, in my series, Only Believe, I cover this in depth. So I would encourage you to actually get that series. If you choose to only believe God's word, okay, meaning that when circumstances and things come at me, If I take those thoughts immediately and I line them up with the word of God, the word of God shows us that success has already been paid for. In other words, God has already paved the way for us to have success. So where we end up not being successful is when we quit, when we give up. So you say, Karen, but my gosh, you don't know how hard it is. I probably don't know how difficult things are for you, but I can tell you that I have had a life that has not been just smooth sailing. I have had challenges uh, that I probably won't ever share publicly because they are, they are so difficult. However, when I can get in the word and be encouraged and know, you know what, Lord, everything seems hopeless right now. I do not see a way out of this. And you start to look at the word of God and you realized that Jesus did everything for us. We just need to put that foot forward forward, one foot after another. We need to seek him and we need to stay with it. And he promises us success. Now, it doesn't mean that we won't have failures along the way, but those failures actually contribute to a life of success. Okay. Doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. Doesn't mean we don't have things we wish wouldn't have happened. Doesn't mean that things don't hurt. And I think sometimes, um, a lot of times we hear that we have to just, um, deflect things. Okay. And, and I'm not a big fan of that. I understand when things come at me and they hurt, I feel it. Okay. But I don't stay there. What I do is I bring it before God and I have him help me to bring perspective into that situation. And it doesn't mean that I'm cold. It doesn't mean that I'm not feeling. I am all those things. Okay. But it means that I can take those things that come at me, those things that were meant for my harm and have God show me how to make them for my good. And you can do that same thing. And that is so important for us to get the strength, the courage, and the tenacity to finish what it is we've been called to do. Sometimes it's just a task. Sometimes it's starting a craft project and finishing it. You know, when I was little, um, we would do craft projects. I love creating things. But so often I would start like a cross stitch project. Okay, I'd get all excited. I would get the book and I would see what it's supposed to look like when I'm done and I just want to put it in a frame, but I would get about halfway done and I would either lose interest or it got so difficult that I would end up just putting it in a drawer or in my closet half done. 
Um, another example, and they seem like maybe small things, but it's really indicative as to how we might live our life because as we get bigger projects, it's going to take more to finish. Um, but even um, I was going through a hope chest with my mom several years ago, and um, she had pulled up. My grandma had sewed. She sewed quilts, and I love quilts, okay? And she had started some uh, that she didn't quite finish when she passed away, and we pulled those out. And I looked at it, and it's like, this is so beautiful. But as I held it up, all it was was pieces of material that were sewn together. It didn't have the backing on, so it was not usable. And so it was really important to me that we finish that quilt. And so we went down to this little town that I grew up in. Uh, it's called Wells, Minnesota, and there was a quilt shop downtown. So we took those partially done quilts, those pieces, we brought it to the quilt shop, and we made a commitment that we were going to finish what Grandma had started. We were going to finish the quilts. Well, today, those are such treasures to me. I've got quilts that my grandma made because I chose to work with my mom and get those finished, okay? So you might say, Karen, it's just a quilt. I know. It's just a, cr a cross-stitch project. I know. But you know what? I had to learn to finish what I started or I would never have the success and the satisfaction of achieving a goal. So now let's bring that into a business situation. Um, I was just in Indiana, uh, actually just a couple days ago, and I was, um, we were looking at some houses with real estate. I do real estate coaching and obviously home staging and things like that. So we were going with uh, Dan Dyer on what we called Boots on the Ground. So there's a group that we coach that we help to um, help them with, with steps in real estate based on the information that we've all learned in our experience. And they were taking us from house to house and showing us what that, this house, they go in small towns, and uh, this is what the house looked like beforehand. And, of course, with the flips I work on, I do that a lot, too. Um, and then they would show us this house we finished, okay? So with that, there's, just, there's a principle with that. Why do we love to see before and afters? Why does that feed us? Why do I love to help flip houses? Because it is a satisfaction of bringing something that looks like it might be in ruins or it's decrepit or it's, it's not livable and doing what it takes, building the plan to make that home beautiful, then staging it and actually bringing it to the point of selling it on the market is extremely satisfying. But if I would invest, you know, $150,000 into a house that I said I wanted to renovate and I never finished it, what happens? My goodness, I just lost cost $150,000, right? <laughs> and I would never have the satisfaction of seeing something that was so tore up, maybe so ugly, so much in ruins, bringing it into beauty. We are built to bring things to the finish line, okay? Um, Jesus is our best example of this. So in uh, John 19.30, if you want to turn to that verse with me, um, this is what it says. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Amen. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. We could not have a better example of why it is so important to be a finisher. Do you know if anybody had the opportunity to give up? It was Jesus. But he hung on, he says, for the hope. That's what fueled him. The hope of you and I. The hope of what he would accomplish if he would finish what he set out to do on the earth. You know, being whipped, persecuted, spit on, he went through so much. He actually said he was tempted in every way. That means the challenges 
that you and I face on a daily basis or once in a while, Jesus went through everything that we have gone through. And you know what? He finished. What if he wasn't a finisher? What if he said this is too hard? What if he decided that he didn't want to be the son of God? <laughs> if he didn't want to fulfill his role as a king of kings and he just would have gone into regular life. We wouldn't have what we have today. He is the ultimate example of being a finisher. And because of that finished work, because he chose to see it all the way through, you and I are healed. You and I are whole. You and I are prosperous. You and I are going to heaven. Do you know what would have happened to us? I don't think we could have gone to heaven without Jesus. Praise God, he set an amazing example for us. And as I was just reading through this and meditating on being a finisher, and I've got many more scriptures to share on that, I just thought, you know what? If Jesus was not a finisher, we would not be here living the wonderful lives that we are able to live today. Amen? So he's setting a great example of being a finisher. Also in um, Luke fourteen twenty eight, it says this, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Okay, so there is a cost that we have to consider. When we go into a project, when we decide to build a business, when we say yes to going into ministry, when we decide to get married, when we decide to have children, to be successful in every area, or you could say any area of our life, requires us to be a finisher. I can't think of one area area in my life or your life that doesn't require us to have that same commitment Jesus had to be a finisher. We can get discouraged. We can have challenges. We can um, make bad decisions. Like my friend Jay that I was sharing with you, that, that he and his wife had every reason to dissolve their marriage, but they had hope and they decided that they were going to be a finisher because they knew God had called them to be together and God had downloaded a dream for their life that they said yes to. Do you know, we have tough days. We have things that are roadblocks. We have obstacles to overcome, but God gives us tools to be successful. So one of the things that I've learned um, a, a lot, and God, you know this listening to me, is that, that really I understand my purpose is to bring vision to reality in, in people's lives and certainly in my own life as well. But one of the things that, that we were just discussing the other day is that two years ago there was a dream to start uh, something called Truth and Liberty. We didn't know what the name was then, but, but Andrew and a group of leaders had talked about they needed to do something. Something was stirring in them that they needed to do together. A year passed, and at the next meeting, the same time of year, they looked at each other and they said, you know what? Last year... We said that we had to do something, but we did not do anything this last year to bring it to pass. And so they got some of us involved with it that are those people that can take that vision and bring it to reality. Do you know if it had been just left that they would just be talking about it and year after year saying we need to do something, truth and liberty would not be birthed. But because God has given people skills, talents, and people that have been called, like, like my calling is to bring vision to reality. It's not because Karen is so awesome. It's because he has equipped me to do that, and I understand it. And so I can lean on him to help me and our team to figure out how to get that done. Within a, in less than a year from that time that we made the commitment to be a finisher with this, We've got truth and liberty up and going. And I will tell you what, it is going to help change the culture, not only in this country, but globally. But again, if there was not a commitment, if there was not a plan, 
if we didn't do what the Bible said and count the cost of what it would take, we would not have the result of that today. Uh, just even looking at my home staging business, when God spoke to me to start a home staging business, I had never done home staging. I've never had any formal training on home staging. I've never been in real estate except that my husband and I did some flips together before he passed away. But I did not have the natural skills and talent. But I did have a commitment to make a plan and to be a finisher with that company. And so sometimes it's just a matter of you might not know it all. Don't let that stop you. If God is putting on your heart to do something, bring that dream back out to the forefront. Dig it out and make a commitment that you are not going to be swayed with things to quit. You are not going to get weary in well-doing and faint. You are going to stay with it and make a commitment to be a finisher. And um, I just really feel, and I, I would just tell you from my experience, when you make that commitment, and um, like one of my team members, Denise, says failure is not an option, when you go into something like that and commit to be a finisher, you will see success. Amen? Okay, here's another scripture that I would like us to go over, um, and this is John uh, 17, 4. So bear with me as I turn here, John 17, 4, and it says this, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And verse 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. This is Jesus talking to the Father. And he's declaring that I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you called me to do. And look at the result of that. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And he goes on to talk about how he has manifested God's name among the men that God had given to him. Jesus was a finisher, another amazing example. You know, when we look at the word, um, the finisher, or, or um, it is finished, Really, when you look at the Greek of that, that word is perfect, okay? So when we finish things, the word is perfect. And I'm going to read that definition for you. It's perfected. It's Strong's number 5048, and it means this, to complete, accomplish, carry through to the end, bring to a successful conclusion, reach a goal, fulfill, in an ethical and spiritual sense, the word signifies a bringing to maturity, a perfecting. That's what it means to finish. Do you see how important it is that we make a commitment to be a finisher? That we make a commitment to follow the example that God gave us to finish what God has assigned us to do. And again, it can start with little things. There is, um, there is a guy that is just, he's really become a very popular conservative speaker. He's a psychologist. And, uh, one of the things he says is he tells young people, make your bed. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, what do you mean, make your bed? Well, when you think about that, and he is a very high-end psycholo uh, psychologist, actually. He is seeing, and it lines up with the word, that we have got to be able to finish something that we start. So if all I can do right now is make my bed, make your bed. So you might be watching this and saying, Karen, I can't finish anything. I would love to run a big company. I would love to have five companies. I would love to be able to do some of the things that the people you're talking about are doing. But I can't make my bed. And I will tell you, start with something small. 
Start to finish something that you started. Do you know、um, it's really easy for us to make excuses in this society and in this culture? A matter of fact, the world is trying to teach us and our children to make excuses. To not be accountable, it's okay if you don't feel like doing that today. I want you to know that you still should have self-esteem, right? Well, some of the things that are happening with children and in our society are not good. For example, the suicide rate has gone up seventy percent. Why is that? Well, I don't claim to know all the answers, but I can tell you that there is something in us that feels really good when we finish what we started. I don't know if you've ever tried to run.、Um, I'm actually a pathetic runner. I exercise, but I am not a good runner. Okay, so I would try. I would try to run, and I would go out on the street. Matter of fact, I would do it around this house, and I still do once in a while. And I was like, you know what? I I know I can't run two miles. But I'm going to set a goal for myself. So I would look down the road, and it's like I am going to run to that mailbox. Okay, I had to start small. Maybe I can't run two miles, but what can I do? What can I finish? I can finish a goal of running to that mailbox, and you know there's something in that that builds character. If I can do that, it's like wow, maybe I can do two times that next time, right? We need to see success in some areas, and being a finisher encourages you that you can do more. But there's a difference, okay? The world is saying that no matter what you do. You should have self-esteem and see yourself as a success. Do you know what that does not line up with how I'm made? Okay, and so people are just like being told that they should feel great about what they do when they play, for example, video games all day. You just have to have self-esteem. No, they have to set something. We have to put something before us that we. Finish. It is a biblical principle, and I will tell you that it is the difference between successful organizations and mediocre, or even I would say unsuccessful organizations. So let's go to one、uh, additional scripture here. We may go to a couple more depending on our time, but let's go to Second Timothy four seven. Okay, Second Timothy four seven says this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Do you know this is a great way for us to finish the program? We're already almost out of time here. But obviously, this is Paul saying that you know what? I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Do you know he was so encouraged about his life? And when we look at it, it's like he was shipwrecked. He was in prison. He found joy in all those. But if you remember what he said, his purpose is his determined purpose is to know God. And then he went on to describe what that meant in his life and what it would produce. So here he is. He finished the race. He did what he was called to do, and at the end of his life, he could say, "You know what, God? I did it, and now I can't wait to see you." Do you know for your children, if you're a parent and you have children that work on projects, maybe they're doing a painting, maybe they've started something, maybe they're starting to build a model airplane. Um, you know, it might be anything. It could be a small thing. Maybe it's a sports season that they're in, and it's just difficult, and they want to quit. I will tell you, one of the greatest gifts that we can give our children is to in,、um, instill in them how very important it is for them to finish what they started. And even though it's difficult, even though sometimes we complain along the way, I know that you know I'll do that with God. I'll complain to God about something, and I have to be refreshed. And it's like you've got to finish this. 
There's something in us that when we finish what we started, there is a blessing and it is a key to success in every area of our life. Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. So we've gone over the first of 15. This one was Be a Finisher. And this is in the series of... Um, of God's success, of, of being successful God's way. So I want to also ask you, if these programs bless you, consider, uh, if God is putting it on your heart, consider giving to the ministry uh, or becoming a partner with me. Do you know, I... Um, I actually have a few businesses and, and things and, and that that's funding me doing this program. And I'm so happy to do that. God has provided so much. But if this is something that you feel you want to sow into, if you feel that this program is something that blesses you and would bless others, I want to extend to you the opportunity to be a part of what we're doing. And you can go to KarenConrad.net and you can click on Give. Also, I'm going to have uh, the notes from these programs available on my website. So again, go to KarenConrad.net and you can subscribe uh, or go to the store and download the notes to this program. So thank you again. God bless you and join me tomorrow as we continue in the series. I hope you've enjoyed this new series called Keys to Success. If you would like to get the CD and DVD of this product, go to my website, KarenConrad.net. Go to the store and you can purchase this product and I'll get it mailed out to you uh, very quickly. Also with that, I'll include um, the resources that I've used, the list of the 15 keys to success and the scriptures that support it. Also, if you enjoy these programs, I invite you to become a partner or to support us financially. Uh, you can go to KarenConrad.net and you can click on Give and it would be such a blessing. Just see what God would have you do in that area of support. Also, I want to encourage you to check out my website. Um, I do speak at various conferences and events, and so you can see where I'll be in person next, and I would love to see you. And also go to karissummit.com and find out when our next business summit is. We would love to meet you and have you part of all that we are doing, both at Karen Conrad Ministries and, of course, at Andrew Womack Ministries and 7M Ventures Incorporated. So thank you again for joining me. God bless you, and we will see you next time on Living with Karen Conrad. In the history of Andrew Womack Ministries, this is the most comprehensive product we've ever presented. We have taken all of the revelation that we have collectively and have put it into this product entitled Healing University. We wanted to give this to you in all forms and aspects. It is a teaching and it's an outline, plus then there's question and answers, plus points to ponder, and then dozens of scriptures in each lesson so you can meditate on it. Plus you're going to see real life testimonies of people getting healed. So we want to encourage you to check it out and get our Healing University. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. We're doing a new series called Carefree Living on the Good News Program next. Greg Fritz Ministries wants to minister to you through prayer. Call our helpline at 918-749-7744, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. You can also order product and speak to someone about becoming a partner with Greg Fritz Ministries. We look forward to hearing from you today. The program you're about to watch is part of a free MP3 series we're making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries entitled Carefree Living. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s for free by entering code CARE72 at checkout. Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. 
Hello, this is Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News Program. We are launching into a new series called Carefree Living. And I think you're going to be blessed by this. I think you're going to be helped. And I want to warn you to get ready to get happy. There is no reason to spend your life in fear and anxiety and worry. We have alternatives. We have another choice. We serve God and therefore his word applies to us. God's promises have no expiration date as far as the world goes and those generations living in the world. God's promises work for us today and they make life different for us. If you would like to get the teaching that went just before this series, it'll help you to kind of connect with what we're doing now. It was called Living in the End Times Without Losing Your Mind. You can go to our website to the free download section and you can get all 20 sessions absolutely free. It's a MP3 audio download or it's on-demand streaming. So you can stream these programs directly to your device and I think uh, they would really help you because the f that first series dealt with the subject of anger. We're talking now specifically about fear and all of its derivatives, including worry, anxiety, and phobias. And so you uh, are going to be blessed by this teaching because all of us are tempted to worry at, at times. And some people have developed it as an art. I mean, they're really, really good at worrying. But we can get rid of worry and replace it with peace. And the scripture we use for that is John 14, 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Boy, that's one thing that the world doesn't have right now. There's not a whole lot of peace going around. I've been watching the news and reading different articles and people are not full of peace. By and large, they are disturbed to say the least. But Jesus said to us, not necessarily to them, but to us, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. So what kind of peace does the world give? Well, the world gives peace when everything is peaceful, when every problem is solved, when there are no threats on the horizon, you can have peace. But that's not the kind of peace that Jesus has. He gives us peace as a force that it comes from the inside and it keeps uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says it keeps our heart or guards our hearts and minds. That's the kind of peace that's available through him and we can choose to accept that. So let me read this whole scripture uh, lest I get distracted again. It says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So there's troubling and then there's fear. There's anger, disturbed, perturbed. That's what that word trouble means. Or there's fear, which is worry, anxiety, phobias, nervousness. All of these things could, be, could come under the category of fear. Neither one of these things are Jesus' will for us. Neither one of these things are necessary. And I just, I'm convinced if we would deal with anger and fear as we live our lives in these last days, we could be happier, we could be filled with joy, we could be the exception rather than the rule. We could stand out in the crowd because we're not angry at anyone, we're not afraid of anything, we're free to live life as God meant us to live it, to be happy and to be filled with joy and faith. And, you know, try this. How about being uh, expectant? How about looking forward to the future with expectancy, with anticipation in a good way? How about we look forward to the future because God's going to do more in the future than he's done in our past? How about we be glad to get up every day and we face challenges? Certainly, God's not going to remove all the challenges, but he helps us to deal with them. He helps us get through them and there's nothing so big that God can't help you through it. We need to just back off and take a deep breath and enjoy living life 
in the, in the kingdom of God, because we are in the kingdom. We've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to get in the kingdom of God. You're already in the kingdom of God. And as a citizen of God's kingdom, you have a new father. You have a new name. You have a new covenant. You have protection. You have rights and privileges. All these things are true in your life right now if you're a Christian. So you don't have to feel like you're alone in this world and you're just being beat up by circumstances and you're you're subject to whatever the world decides to do next and how am I going to deal with this and what am I going to do about that and what if this happens and what if that happens. You can just forget all that and literally act like a person who has a God, who has a good God, who has an omnipotent God, an omniscient God, an omnipresent God, because you do, and he is working all the time in your behalf. The Bible says he never sleeps and he never slumbers. You know, and I like this take on that. He never sleeps and he never slumbers, so I can. When I'm asleep, he's awake. He's always on the job. Nothing escapes his, his attention. You are the apple of his eye. You don't have to live in fear in this fear-filled world. And I know there are fearful situations. And I know that people are stressing out over things real and imagined. Um, the future, which, whether, whether it's true or not, people are filled with fear and consequently they're filled with rage. A lot of the anger that we see in the world today, really the root causes, they're just afraid. If you, just, if you could look past that angry, that angry facade, there's a cold, uh, a frightened, confused little person in there that doesn't know what to do, that is overwhelmed by the problems of, of this age. And, and it's not, you know, God recognized that we lived in, in, in desperate times. In fact, I read this. Let me read it again. 2 Timothy 3.1. Know this, Paul said to Timothy, in the last days, perilous times will come. The Amplified says, understand this, that in the last days will come, set in, perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with, and hard to bear. And so the Amplified just simply defines some of these Greek words. So you could say that the, the definition of the Greek word perilous would be great uh, times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with, and hard to bear. We live in that world. That's the world we live in. There's no, God's not making any excuses. He's not saying, you know, just try to look on the bright side. Well, there may not be a bright side. What if there is no bright side? Then what do we do? Let's believe the Bible. That's the ultimate bright side. The problem is the Bible talks about invisible truths. And if we don't learn how to see the invisible and put confidence in the promises of God, which are invisible, and trust in the presence and the person of God who is invisible, then we're simply going to be held hostage by circumstances that surround us. And boy, the, 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 the scene can change, can it? I mean, one day you think you got it all worked out and you think the world's going to be okay. We're going we're gonna to get some things solved. And then the next day it all, it all breaks down and, and we feel like it's worse than ever. Don't live on that roller coaster. If you do, you'll never get over it because things are constantly changing. And then there's the media the, and, and, and the enemy the, to blow things up and to, and to you know, make things, blow it all out of proportion and scare you with things that aren't even true, that won't even happen. And yet people are obsessed over these things. All right, let's go on. I want to get to Romans 8.22. He says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Now, I'm going to go over there and read Romans 8. Um, and look at a few of these verses because this helps us understand. And I didn't want to just just jump into don't worry without giving you the 
the setting in which we live and exist and let you know that God's aware. If you think things are worse than they've ever been, you're probably right. We're not just pessimistic. Uh, things are going to get worse and, and, they, and they probably will continue to get worse. Not everything's going to, we're not living in a utopia. We're not in heaven yet. This is the world. And the, the world, if you didn't know that, this is under a curse ever since Adam sinned. And so the whole creation is laboring, just like you are, under the curse of your, you know, I'm not saying you're cursed, but we're in this fallen world and we're dealing with the effects of sin. Even if you're born again, you can feel the effects of sin in your mortal body. Your body's not born again yet and it, it, it ages, it gets old, you feel it. And he's saying, look, the whole creation is aging. It's moving toward another day. Thank God when, when, when uh, Adam sinned, God had an answer and his name was Jesus. Jesus saved the world and has redeemed the world, but it's yet to be manifested. So the world lives in this fallen state of sin, but it's going to give way to a new day in which everything is redeemed. Everything is made new, including your body. You're going to get a new body. Right now, if you're a Christian, your, your spirit's born again, but the rest of creation is going to have to be undergo this radical change. And so the further we get to the, the closer we get to the end, the more things are going to be in, in, in flux or in, you know, just general upheaval. And, and if, if that's the way you feel, then, then that's probably accurate. Things are, uh, if you use Paul's example of birth pangs, let's just think about that. Now, uh, before you write me about this, I am no expert on giving birth, um, and so let's get that straight right now. But but I have watched a lot of TV shows and movies, and one of the things that happen when a person is 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 pregnant, when when a woman is pregnant, the closer you get to the time of birth, of course, the more uncomfortable they get. And then when the birth pains start, and that's what Paul said, he says the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. He's, he went on to say, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And so he's, he's saying that everything is going to toward this new day, this, this, this where creation itself will literally be born again but until that happens we're experiencing birth pangs in in society in the world in the universe you see all kinds of things going on around us earthquakes and Paul talk, or Jesus talked about how there would be earthquakes and and different things in different places in the time of the end all of these Paul relates to birth pangs and when when a when a woman has birth pangs it they get more intense you can you know i'll just let let you vote on this and see if i'm right but the birth pangs get more intense and they get more frequent up until the time of birth so if that's the illustration the analogy that paul used then we can expect creation he says that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So that was 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> they were going through this process of experiencing these <laughs> contractions and, and which, had, which, which were intense and brought pain and, and, and brought discomfort. Well, that would increase in intensity and in frequency the closer you get to birth. And I believe that's what we're seeing. That's why Paul told Timothy in the last days, you know, perilous times will come. There will be hard to deal with and hard to bear times. We're living in that. Now, what are we going to do about it? Can, can we sit here and wish, you know, that we lived in happy days, that we could go back to the 40s and 50s, the good old days, which they probably weren't that good. You know, people were still sinning and making wrong choices and suffering and doing things. You know, all that. It's not as good as they make it sound. Although there was maybe more innocence in society or whatever, I don't know. But, but there's no use looking back. We can't go back there. 
We're here. What do we do? Where, where do we go from here? Let's go forward. But let's not go forward in, in fear and dread, but let's have faith and joy the way God meant for us to, to, to live. If Jesus was alive here on the earth right now, do you think he would be watching the news and, and, and wringing his hands and fretting over every report and wondering what if and what if this happens? No, he wouldn't live that way. And he doesn't want you to live that way either. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be free from circumstances. He wants you to build your life on his word and trust him to meet your needs. Let me show you where the title for carefree living came from. You want to see that? It's 1 Peter 5, 7. In the New King James, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So there's what you do. He didn't say you wouldn't have cares. He wouldn't say circumstances. I mean, it affects all of us. If taxes go up, it affects me. It affects you. It affects everyone. If, if, if there's a crisis, a tragedy in our nation, it affects all of us. If there's a flood, an earthquake, it affects us. We do have challenges. We're not saying that you're, you're crying or, or worrying about things that aren't there. There are plenty of, of things that actually are there. They do exist. But what, what Peter's saying is, take your cares, because you're going to have them, and cast them on him, for he cares for you. And the, the message Bible, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. Isn't that good? Live carefree before God. And that really brings it into perspective is that we're not just living in the world. We're not just here on our own. We're not alone in this world just waiting to see if we can survive. We have a God. And, and because of that, we can live carefree before God. Now, if you didn't have God, you wouldn't be able to live a carefree life. If it, it would be irresponsible or whatever. Or you'd be denying reality or you'd be high on drugs. But, but, but if, you, if you don't, so if you don't have a God, you can't really live a carefree life because there are many, many things we face that are bigger than we are. And so, but because we have a God who's bigger than all these things, who's promised to take care of us, we can live a carefree life before him. We can cast our cares on God because he cares for us. You know, there are people that believe in God. They're, I believe, called agnostics. They believe there's a God. He just doesn't care. Well, they're wrong. Do you know there are so many ways to get things wrong? There's only one way to get it right. And until you understand that there is a God in heaven who cares for you, who is a good God, a holy God, a righteous God, a merciful God, you, you, you don't understand life as it truly is. You can live carefree before God because he's a good God. He's a righteous God. He's an all-powerful God. And Peter said, he cares for you. And can I just say, you know, I don't want to condemn anybody right now. I want you to watch this program, and I believe we can lead you step by step into a life of carefree living. But when we worry and let fear and worry dominate our lives, we're acting as if we don't think God cares about us. Or if he does, he can't do anything for us. Either one of those stances is, is unbelief. It's not, it's not, a, it's really an insult to God and who he is. He is a good God and he cares for you and he can make a difference in your life. Because of that, we can live carefree before God. How many things are you worrying about right now? Are you carrying in your mind, on your shoulders, so to speak, that, that, that really they haven't happened yet, there's nothing you can do about them, and, and you might as well, you could just turn them over to God. How many things are you worried about right now that you can't even change? There is nothing that you could do to fix it, to change it, to replace it. You can't do a thing about it. And yet, you carry that worry and fear. Let me ask you this. How many things are you worried about right now that haven't even happened yet? That may not happen, but they certainly haven't happened yet. 
uh, uh, and, but you're worried about. That, that's, those are weights that you're carrying that are robbing your happiness. They're robbing your joy. They're robbing you of energy. They're robbing you possibly of health. A lot of health issues are caused just by stress, which is another form of worry and fear. Uh, there's, this thing goes so deep and we can get so free. I, I believe, you know, it's, we owe it to God to get happy and get free from worry and free from the weights that come to into our life because of worry. I hope you're getting this. I, I don't know if you hear, I'm, you certainly don't hear this in the secular world. We're not talking about mind over matter. We're not trying to, we're not saying stick your head in the sand and ignore what's going on. Or, no, we can look right at the, the situations in the world. We can, we can understand and know what's going on in society around and we need to be informed, but we don't have to worry. That's where we draw the line because God is our God. He's bigger than that. It exists, but he's bigger. I got promises from God that apply to my life, and so do you. And you can count on those. <laughs> Some of these fears will never even manifest, but you can count on the word of God. It will happen. Let me give you, let me help you put things in perspective. I love this verse, and I've quoted it many times on this program, but I'm going to quote it again. Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2 says, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, so I mean right there, God is our refuge and strength. So you know God is your your trust. Everybody would agree that, you know, any Christian would say, oh yes, he's my refuge, he's my strength. He's a very present help in trouble. I believe God, I love God, God loves me. I believe all that. Therefore, here's the, the conclusion or the consequences of having God, having a God like this. Therefore, we will not fear. You see, it's not fair. It's not right for you to believe that God is a refuge and strength, that God is your God, that God is a God of love, that God's a good God, that his word is true, and then fear because that's the opposite reaction. You're supposed to have a reaction to these facts, to these truths, and the reaction is this. Therefore, we will not fear. You say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, I didn't know God's promises had a limit. I didn't know God's promises had an expiration point where they work up until this. And then when it, when it comes to what you're going through, it doesn't really apply. God's not big enough to help you. No, that's not true. But let me ask you this. How big is your problem? If you were going to measure it on a scale from one to a hundred, how big do you think the problems you're facing are? Maybe they're in the 90s. Very well could be. You may be faced with a lot of situations that are that are on a scale from 1 to 100. They're in the 90s, maybe the high 90s. But let me ask you this. <laughs> Is it as big as this? Here's what he says. He says, therefore, because God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed. We're not talking about an earthquake. We're not talking about global warming. We're talking about the earth removed. That is catastrophic on a scale of one to a hundred. That's not even on the scale. It's a thousand. The earth removed. He said, because God is our God, we will not fear. And if you want a gauge to go by, he said, even if the earth is removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Again, that's not an earthquake where the things shake and buildings crack or fall. This is the mountains being carried into the sea. The earth changes its shape. Therefore, we will not fear. Isn't that amazing? What he's saying, he's saying the same thing I'm trying to say. He's saying God loves you. God is your refuge and strength. He cares for you. Therefore, you shouldn't fear. And there shouldn't be any limit or any threshold where you say anything beyond that, then I'm going to be afraid. No, even if the earth was removed, the mountains were carried into the midst of the sea, that dwarfs our problems. I can promise you that. It dwarfs our problems. Even if those things were to happen, <laughs> if, you, if you get up, open the door and the earth is gone, you shall not fear. Isn't that something? Well, he's basically saying, we're not going to fear no matter what. 
no matter what happens, I'm not going to, I don't know everything. I don't have it all figured out, but I know one thing. I am not going to be afraid. I'm not going to go to bed afraid. I'm not going to get up afraid. I'm not going to waste my time worrying. I'm not going to be anxious. I am going to declare war on worry. I'm going to declare war on fear, and I'm not going to let it exist in my life. Why? Because God is my refuge, and God is my strength. <laughs> wow, that that's really good stuff, isn't it? I prepare for these messages for you. I get these notes together, and by the way, we do have study notes, but I can't. I have to quit because it get, I get so excited. It's so good. The material, the Word of God is so good. These teachings are so life-changing. I just have to break, and then I wait till I can get in front of the camera so I can record. It's, it's tremendous. These truths will change your life. You need to declare war on worry and say goodbye to fear and anxiety and all of its derivatives. Don't let them uh, hound you anymore. The study notes are available, and I forgot to mention this on the first program, but we've got them, and uh, they're available on our website. You can go in, um, to the free study notes button, click on that, and find the uh, Carefree Living study notes, and they're made they're all set up for you. You can download them. If you can't <clears throat> download them, if you don't feel comfortable with that, call our office, 918-749-7744, and ask for them, and we'll mail them to you. Email us and give us your address. We'll mail you the study notes. Uh, you need to get these notes. I, I tell you, we are coming against culture because it's, it's culturally acceptable to worry and be afraid and to be anxious. So we're coming against that. You can't just do that overnight. You can't just wave your hand and change all these things. It takes time. And so we're going to take the time on these programs. We're going to one, one little stone at a time. We're going to chip away at, at, at uh, habits and ways of thinking and replace it with peace, joy, faith, love, all the fruits of the Spirit. You are going to love it. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, come back next time and we'll continue this teaching on carefree living. In this new series, you'll learn from the scriptures why worry is not an option and how to replace fear with faith in the midst of any trial. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s for free by entering code CARE72 at checkout. Greg Fritz Ministries wants to minister to you through prayer. Call our helpline at 918-749-7744, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. You can also order product and speak to someone about becoming a partner with Greg Fritz Ministries. We look forward to hearing from you today. I love Greg. I love his sense of humor. I love how he brings out the word. I just, just love Greg. Awesome man. Awesome man of God. Immediately he became a favorite teacher of mine because he delivers the Word of God with such warmth and balance and great clarity. He's just straight to the point and down to it and just to let go, be happy. I've been in ministry years. I've never heard anybody teach like this and I had breakthrough today that's going to impact other people. I am so grateful for Greg Fritz. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Partner with us to tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ. The faithful financial support of our partners enables us to produce the Good News program. We invite you to donate and partner with us today. Learn more at gregfritz.org. Ready to get more out of God's Word than ever before? We gladly announce the newly recreated Andrew Womack Living Commentary. Study with Andrew from Genesis to Revelation. This living commentary is packed with a lifetime of Andrew's own footnotes on over 32,000 verses and counting. This extensive living commentary contains multiple translations of the Bible, including the King James Version Plus, along with Strong's Concordance, where you can find the original Greek and Hebrew text. Andrew has also provided you with several historically respected commentaries. It's never been easier for you to study through the Bible with Andrew. Priced at only $120, this continuously updated living commentary is now available exclusively as a download for both Mac and Windows at awmi.net. 
Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. Hello, I'm Kenneth Copeland. Every believer has a voice. And it's the voice of victory. My God has made a way for me. This is Pastor George Pearsons. Welcome to this edition of the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. What an honor it is to be sitting here in the studio, being able to preach the uncompromised word of faith to you. And I thank Kenneth and Gloria for allowing me to take this week on the broadcast. You have so imparted life into me, faith into me. I've been working with the ministry here for 44 years, knowing Kenneth and Gloria for 45 years. And all of those years, I've paid very close attention to what they have said to me about standing and believing and receiving by faith the things that we need to have. You know, Brother Copeland said not too long ago that we are faith specialists. I thought that was very interesting. This ministry focuses on that. We preach that uncompromised word of faith from the top of the world to the bottom, all the way around the middle on every available voice. Now, we want to make available to you all of the outlines for this week's broadcast as well as all the broadcasts that we've had, you can go to kcm.org, click onto the picture of me there, and you can go and access these. You can use them, study them. Uh, Pastors, ministers, use these outlines to be able to do series in your church. It's so important to be able to have something to work from, and then you build on top of that what the Lord is showing you about this particular topic. So let's get on with our message today. We're talking this week about persistent faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our aggressive faith, even our persistent faith, even our bulldog faith. That is what that word faith is. In the Greek, it is an aggressive force, the force of faith. It changes things. It moves mountains. It does things in our lives. It heals our body. And so as we develop in our faith and learn about our faith, we know that we can take a stand of faith and we can overcome all the attacks of the enemy. Now, what we're talking about specifically this week, we're talking about persistence in faith. We're talking about being persistent. We're talking about standing against the wiles of the devil. And if you look with me at our scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6 in verses 10 and 11, and it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yesterday, when we were talking about this, we were talking about the wiles of the devil. And we found out that the Greek word for the word wiles is methodia. And methodia, we get our word method from. So the, <laughs> the devil is a method actor. He has methods. He has ways. He has plans. He has strategies. That's another word for the word wild. It's the word strategies and, and trickery and deceits. And he keeps the pressure on us by being persistent and not letting up. What are the things that he's saying to you? What are the things that have been going through your mind? What are the thoughts? Thoughts, thoughts of failure are not from God because he wants us to be successful in him. Thoughts of quitting are not from him. He doesn't want us to quit. He doesn't want us to throw in the towel. I was praying over this, and in yesterday's broadcast, I shared with you that the Lord really brought a word to me about some of the people that I'm addressing right now. And he said to me, he said, there's some people that they feel like their world is falling apart. They're overwhelmed. They've gotten over into a place where the devil has had that pile-up technique, and it's one thing on top of another on top of another, and it's just one gigantic pile of problems, issues, situations. And the devil would like to corner you into a place where you will give up and quit and think to yourself, there's no use in fighting this. 
I've got this thing going on over here, and I've got that thing going on over there, and I've got these issues with my family here, and these financial issues over here. And folks, that's where God works the most. When it looks like it is at, when you look like you're at the end of your rope, He works. When it looks like that you're about to fail, He works. When it looks like there are no answers, He works. He works in the realm of the impossibilities of our lives. But you see, the devil is the one who is trying to be persistent with us. And his, his constant pressure comes from persistence and us not doing anything about it. Us just caving in. Caving in to what he wants to do. The Lord God himself has plans. His plans for you are good and not for evil. His plans for you and I are to prosper us. And his plans for us are throughout all the days of our lives. We just keep growing. We just keep getting stronger in faith. We just keep improving. We just keep becoming more and more like Jesus every day, thinking like him, talking like him, acting like him. And that we fulfill the plans that God has for us on earth. And that's exactly what the devil tries to do against us, is to convince us and hold us back from fulfilling the fullness of the plan of God. Why? Because he wants to stop the word of God from coming out of us. He wants to stop that boldness that's on the inside of us. And some of you, that boldness that used to be there, and you've given in. You've quit. Well, don't let him do that. Don't let that persistence begin to wear you down. The devil's constant persistence is a major, uh, well, I was going to say distraction, and it is. It's a major distraction in our lives. And it's, it's designed to do two things, to wear down our resistance to stand. If he can wear you down, if he can get you into a weakened condition, then he'll weaken your resolve to fight the good fight of faith. And that's what this week is all about, to stir you up, to shake you, to shake your faith, to shake you out of that place. And you've been saying things you shouldn't be saying. You've been making declarations you should have been, you should not have been making. But we're going to turn this around. This situation is going to turn around and it's going to turn around because you are going to use that bulldog faith, that persistent faith, that aggressive faith to jump right in the middle of the devil's attack and say, this is it. This is enough. No more. No more. We're not doing this anymore. And the moment you declare that and the moment you say that, that's, that's when the devil begins to back down. That's, that's when he starts to hear from you and hear that faith on the inside of you dealing with that issue head on and taking authority over it. Persistence does not let go. Persistence does not give up until all resistance is broken and the desired result is attained. That's why you need to get these notes. That's why you need to go online and get these notes because these, these phrases that the Lord has given me, they, they have come out of not only a study in the word, but they've come out of experience because we've been challenged. Terry and I have been challenged. We have faced challenge after challenge after challenge, just like you have. But we realize this, persistence does not let go. Persistence does not give up until all resistance is broken and the desired result is attained. Now, either you do that or the devil does that. This is, this is a boxing match in the spirit. Who's going to win? The one that's going to win is the one that's going to be last standing. Last man standing, last woman standing. And that's who we are. We do not give up. We do not give in. We do not throw in the towel, but we keep on going until we attain the desired result that we want. But just for a moment, let's take a look at the devil's strategy. Let's see how he operates because we can use that same weapon. He uses words of fear, words of fear. And he piles that on and he's persistent with it. On the other hand, we use words of faith. 
and we pile that on, and we're persistent about that. But let's just take a look at a couple of examples of how the devil utilizes that persistence. And let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 8. And we're talking here, this is David and Goliath, and Goliath's persistence wore down Israel's resistance. He was doing exactly what the devil did. See, what we're doing here is we're revealing the tactics of the devil because that's what the devil does. He uses words of fear over and over and over and over again until fear is lodged down into your heart, until you're believing those lies of fear in your life. Well, Goliath's persistence wore down and was wearing down Israel's resistance. Let me read this to you from the New Living Translation. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I'm the Philistine champion, but you're only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Words of fear will shut you down. Words of fear on a persistent basis, on a day-to-day basis. Day to day. That's what's important about this. And that's what it's important to know about what the devil does. He uses every day. If you're not feeding on the word, if you're not building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, if you're not doing these things, then he's going to get the advantage on you. He's going to take advantage of you. And he's going to do it every day, every day. Because in verse 16, it says, For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. 40 days, day and night, day and night day and night. And that's what the devil does. He does it day and night. That's why the Lord just dropped this into my my heart about this scripture. That's why we have to, on the other hand, in the book of Joshua, it says, and here's, here is Joshua getting right, ready to go out and take the promised land. And he was dealing, he was dealing with fear. That's why the Lord had to say to him in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Joshua, there shall not be any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. See, Joshua was at a point, Moses is gone. His mentor is gone. Now it's him. And the devil's trying to tell him, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You're not going to get over into that promised land. You're not going to do it. But he said, I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. Take those words right now as if the Lord himself is saying that to you. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. Be strong and of a good courage. In verse 7, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Or the law is the word of God. Turn not from it, from the right hand or to the left. Stay focused. Stay focused that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, here's the key. Verse eight, this book of the law, this word of God shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. That's important. Day and night. So that you may observe to do according to all that is written. Here's the result. You, thou shalt make thy way prosperous and you shall have good success. The Amplified Bible says, you'll deal wisely in all the affairs of life. So you see the concept there, the concept of day and night, every day, every day, every day. And that's what Goliath was doing to the Israeli army. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. Verses 22 through 25. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Goth, 
came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. Now, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Goliath's persistence was wearing down Israel's resistance day after day after day. If you have to say to the devil, shut up and begin to confess the word of God, do it, do it. You need to shut his mouth. The way you do it is you begin to declare God's word, who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, what you can do in Christ Jesus. God says to us that in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. And you need to take a scripture like that and you need to begin to declare it. I am God's workmanship. I've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, good works. But you see here, we see that as soon as the army saw him, he didn't, at that point, he didn't even have to open his mouth. As soon as Goliath came out there, then they began to run away with fright. He was instilling fear into them. That's why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What are you listening to? What are you watching? Do you have the news on constantly? You got to stop doing that. You got to stop feeding on that. And you've got to start feeding on the unadulterated word of the living God. Because when you feed on that faith, it is feeding your spirit. Your fear, your spirit man is being fed. In a weakened condition, a weakened condition of a believer says to me, they've not been feeding on the word of God. But when we do, and when you get down on the inside of you, then nothing can stand against you. Well, in this particular instance, the the Israeli army ran away in fear. What was Goliath doing? Day after day after day, 40 days, he was persistently depositing words of fear down into them. Now, what I'm going to do is later on in the week, we're going to finish out this story. We're going to see how this turns around and we're going to see exactly what David did in his persistence where Goliath is concerned. I mean, we all know the story, but we're going to hold it to later on in the week that we get to the finale of it. But I want to give you another example, another example of persistence wearing down resistance in Judges chapter 16. And I'm reading from verses 16 and 17. Delilah, Delilah's persistence wore down Samson's resistance. Delilah's persistence in wanting to know Samson's secret She was persistent. It it broke down Samson's resistance. And, And let me read to you how this went. When she pressed him daily with her words, that's what the devil does. He presses us daily with words. You're a failure. You're not going to make it. You're not. This is not going to work out. This is going to turn bad. This is, this is the dreaded outcome is going to happen. That's how the devil does this. That's the wiles of the devil. That's the strategy, stratagem of the devil. The methodology is to press daily, persist daily with words. And with Delilah, she urged him so that it, her, his soul was vexed unto death. And then he finally broke down and told her all her heart. That's what he did. That's what she did. She broke down that resistance. In one translation, it says Delilah started nagging and pestering him day after day until he couldn't stand it any longer. She broke down his resistance. In the Good News translation, she kept on asking him day after day. He got so sick and tired of her bothering him about it that he finally told her the truth. In God's Word translation, Every day she made his life miserable with her questions. Has the devil been making your life miserable? Well, if he has, then you're listening to him. 
Stop listening to him. Stop listening to him and do, do what, what we used to do as kids. Ma, 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 ma. But pray and hold on the Holy Ghost when you're doing it. Don't listen to him. Because his words are designed to wear you out and to wear you down and get you to do what Samson did, to, to give up, to quit. In verses 15 through 17 in the New Living, Delilah pouted. How can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now and you still haven't told me what makes you strong. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. Tormented. That's the devil. He is the tormentor. He's the tormentor. The devil used to torment my mother about me. I mean, even after I got saved, I got saved when I was 19 years old. And I, I, may, and I wasn't a bad kid. I, was, I really wasn't. I mean, I didn't clean my room like I should have, but that's, that's about the extent of it. But even after I got saved, my mother was a champion worrier. Not warrior, warrior, but a worrier. A champion worrier. And I can remember her worrying about me even, even after I got saved and I'm out with my friends and we're in Bible studies. And my mother is picturing me dead along the side of the road. Well, praise God, I got to lead her to the Lord shortly after I got saved and, and got that turned around. But she would worry about everything. And what was going on? The devil was tormenting her. I pray for you right now. I pray for you that you take that stand against the tormentor. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you, we condemn it. We condemn it. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Somebody brought that to my attention the other day from the book of Isaiah and talked to me about how we are the ones that condemn those words. I condemn the words of failure. I replace it with the word of God. That's what we have to do. And so what happened, <clears throat> finally, Samson, he gave in. He quit. He shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as anyone else. And so we know what took place and we know what happened. It wasn't the best for him, but even in his death, he was able to glorify God. I've just got one minute left and let me show you another example, but yet it's a, it's, it's a good example and it's Bartimaeus. Let me just read this to you from Mark 10. Blind Bartimaeus persisted until he got his healing. In verses 47 and 48, when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, was nearby he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. But listen to this. He only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. You know what he did? He got fed up with being blind. He got persistent with his faith. He wasn't about to shut up until he got what he belonged to him. He refused to quit. And I'll finish this out with this. He applied nonstop, constant, continual, steady, relentless pressure on his covenant of healing and on the devil. He refused to let go. He did not give up until all resistance was broken and the desired result was attained. You receive that right now. You take your stand. You be strong in the Lord and you be persistent about the word of the living God. Father, in Jesus' name, we take hold of the devil's tactics right now and we believe in Jesus' name that we are rising up in our faith and we are giving glory to God. We're fully persuaded that what God started in us, he's going to finish in us in total victory in Jesus' name. I will be right back with you.
You have a free resource to help you study and apply the Bible-based truths you just heard. Download the BVOV broadcast study notes today at kcm.org slash notes. Collect the notes from each week and use them in a group Bible study. Use the message outline to teach from. Discuss the scriptures and key points with your family of believers. Gain understanding from all the teachings on the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Get the whole week of notes today at kcm.org slash notes. Does it feel like problem after problem has piled up against you? You're at the bottom of a mountain you can't climb? The enemy will do everything he can to get you to give up. But don't quit. Persistently use your faith and act on the Word of God to overcome every obstacle in your path. Get the Power of Consistency Package. Consistency, the Powerhouse of Faith, a CD set by Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. And Don't Give Up, Double Up, a mini book by Gloria Copeland. Discover what it means to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might so that you can begin to deal with life's issues head on and take authority over them through Jesus. The result of the word in your life is that your way is made prosperous and successful. So believe and declare God's word over the lies of the enemy. God says you are healed, strong, and prosperous. Make a stand of faith to victory. Your persistence will wear down the enemy's resistance. Live in consistent victory throughout your life. Request your The Power of Consistency package today, free from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. These resources will help you develop unshakable, reliable faith that's built on God's Word. Go to kcm.org slash TV special or call 800-600-7395. This free offer is good for 60 days. Outside the U.S., shipping charges may apply. Contact your regional office for more information. 1 John 5, 4 tells us, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith is our victory. So what area in life do you need victory in? It might be healing. It could be finances. It could be family. But just know this, our victory in life completely depends on our perseverance and our persistence in the word of God. I want to encourage you to get these free teaching materials and to fill your heart with faith. Use them to develop the kind of faith that lives in consistent victory. So to receive your free package, go to kcm.org and you'll be able to access that absolutely free. Listen, you can watch the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast free on kcm.org or KCM's Roku channel. It's available to you day or night at your convenience. And it's so important to continually feed your spirit with the Word of God. It'll give you a voice of victory. When you feed on the Word of God, when you feed on that Word, it's, it's like eating. It's feeding like your physical body. And I, I heard Brother Hagen talk about this one time that, that believers feed their bodies three huge, healthy meals a day, but they feed their spirit one measly meal a week, talking about going to church. Well, feed on the Word of God. That's what these broadcasts are all about. That's what these free products are all about. That's what Kenneth Copeland Ministries is all about. We are serving up a meal of faith that you'll be able to bite down on and digest and get your spirit strong, strong as it should be. So tomorrow, day three, we're going to be talking about how to resist the devil. This is Pastor George Pearson's reminding you that God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord. Today's Believer's Voice of Victory was brought to you by the faithful partners and friends of Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Go to kcm.org to download or request your free copy of today's broadcast. Continue to grow in your faith in God and believe Him for new visions, His manifested power, and great change in your life. Beyond the Game with Tony and JB, stories that need to be told. To the outside world, it looked like there was nothing happening. That wasn't true. It's things like that that happen all the time that the public doesn't know about. Your body has an expiration date. I'm in bed the day after my surgery. Brian says, Anthony, when is enough enough? Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. 
Stories you won't hear anywhere else. The Truth and Liberty Coalition is about what God's doing in the nations. This is a global movement, and what's happening in America is important because if America can get through this chapter, it's going to have ramifications for the reformation of nations all over the world. This is, the, this is a coalition for everyone watching, not just for America. Hello, my name's Greg Fritz, and I have the Good News Program here on GospelTruth.tv. I'm so thankful to Andrew Womack for offering the airtime on this channel absolutely free to those of us who are on it. But it does cost money. They've hired the best people to manage and to promote this channel. And if you enjoy it like I do, write Andrew a note and tell him thanks. And send an offering to help support GospelTruth.tv today. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. The first time I realized that Jesus took the absolute penalty, punishment, all of it for my sins, that was freedom for me. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to Tuesday's Gospel Truth broadcast. Today I'm continuing a uh, series that I started just yesterday talking about, Are You Satisfied with Jesus? I've got a little pamphlet that's only 28 pages long, but this is powerful. These are some of my favorite scriptures. I've meditated on these for years. And just a few months back, I was studying this, and then I dreamed about it all night long, and I was just so blessed by this that I got up and wrote this in one day. Now, I've spent some time editing it and doing some things, but I thought it'd be great just to teach on this one thing instead of this big, long series. This is something simple. Uh, this is the first time we've ever offered this. We're offering this as a free gift, and so I don't know for sure all the ways it'll be used, but I think that this would not only bless you, but this would be a great little something to give to somebody. It's really simple. I promise you this is something that people will be able to grasp easily. I, I can see people that have businesses putting something like this in their waiting room. People could just sit down and, and this uh, question, are you satisfied with Jesus, will grab people's attention. And as they read through this, it'll be a blessing to them. So yesterday I started this, and we were dealing out of John chapter 14. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. He told them, he says, where I'm going, you know, and the way to get there, you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known the Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Now, Jesus had just said, you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. Thomas says, nope, you're wrong. We're right. We don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. I tell you, when you tell God that he's wrong and you're right, that ought to be a clue to you that something is not working. You aren't thinking correctly. God is always right. God knows more than you do. And yet his disciples were just bold to say, no, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? So he said, I am the way. If you'd seen me, if you'd known me, you should have known my father also. And then Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father and he will be satisfied. And here's what I'm focusing on. Philip was saying, Jesus, we aren't satisfied with just you. Now think about this. Jesus had performed miracles like nobody in the history of the world before or after ever has. Now, we can do the same works that Jesus has done, but I believe that Jesus, you know, there's one passage in uh, John chapter, I believe chapter 20, that says that if everything that Jesus had done, all of the miracles that he had done had been written down, the entire world itself could not contain the volumes that should be written. We just have the highlights. Jesus had done miracles like nobody else ever had. Jesus had spoken like no other man had ever spoken. Jesus had done things that were just 
supernatural. Jesus had loved Philip like no one else had ever loved him. You know, when Philip came to the Lord, I mean the Lord, it was supernatural the way that he brought them together. And he had witnessed all of these things, and yet Philip was saying, Lord, if you'll show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. Without saying it, he said that, Jesus, you don't satisfy. But if we could see the Father, then we'd be satisfied. Think about this. If Jesus doesn't satisfy you, who or what will? What will it take to satisfy you? Let me give you a definition here. This is a dictionary definition of what the word satisfy means. It means to meet the expectations, needs, or desire of someone. Fulfill a desire or a need. Provide someone with adequate information or proof so that they are convinced about something. So in Philip's estimation, Jesus hadn't fulfilled all of Philip's expectations. Philip was expecting something more than what Jesus had provided. He hadn't met his desires. Philip uh, was saying that Jesus hadn't provided him with adequate proof. Philip was wanting something more than Jesus. Now, did you know when I say it this way, I know that every single person who's encountered the Lord and has truly been born again and has a relationship with God you wouldn't say that, oh, no, I'm not satisfied with Jesus. But in practice, in reality, did you know that this is exactly what our life is saying many times? Again, we've just gone through this virus situation, and I have heard Christians, I've seen some things, some of these posts on the Internet and things, and people are talking about how lonely they are and how depressed they are. Even Christians saying that. You know what you're saying without realizing it? You're saying that you aren't satisfied with Jesus. And I know some of you are shocked. No, I would never say that. But when, when the Lord says that He will never leave you nor forsake you and that to be in His presence, David said, one day in your presence is greater than anything else. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to spend 10,000 days someplace else there's just many scriptures. You know, uh, Psalms chapter 16, I believe it's around verse 11. Uh, it says that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. At His right hand, there are pleasures evermore. And yet there are Christians who, because you aren't able to get out and go someplace, because you've been sitting at home and you haven't had anything to do, you're bored and you're discouraged and you're depressed and you're feeling like, well, of course I am because I can't go do what my favorite thing is. I can't go over here and visit this person. And without you realizing what you're saying is that Jesus doesn't satisfy you. He's always with you. He will never leave you. In His presence, there is fullness of joy, but that's not enough for you. You've also got to have this thing over here. You've got to have your, uh, uh, you know, time off. You go out and you do things. You play games. You do this. You go visit people and you aren't satisfied. I'm not saying these things to hurt anybody, but I am saying that just as Philip was saying, Jesus, you aren't enough. You haven't met my needs. I've got expectations. I've got needs. I've got desires that are more than what you're meeting. Most of us would never just blatantly say it that way. But you know what you're saying is when you're sitting here saying, but I'm depressed, I'm discouraged. What you're saying is Jesus isn't enough for you. And I know that some of you are shocked. Oh, no, Jesus is fine in the spiritual realm, but I've got these physical needs. Jesus isn't only spiritual. He isn't only out to meet your spiritual needs. Jesus will provide your physical needs, your financial needs, your emotional needs, your relational needs. And yet many Christians have, have justified and they feel completely justified in being codependent on all of these other things. They've got to go out and have all of these other things that occupy their life. And I'm telling you that what you're saying is that Jesus isn't enough to satisfy you. You've got to have these other things. Now, am I saying that it's wrong for us to have a business? Am I saying it's wrong for us to have a job that we go to? Am I saying it's wrong to have friends and things? No, I'm not saying that. Those things are fine in their proper place. 
But if you are codependent upon all of these other things so that when you are just shut up with Jesus, He's not enough, and you get depressed and discouraged and stir crazy, and you you are feeling justified and all of these things, you know what you're saying? You're saying that Jesus isn't enough to satisfy you, that He hasn't met your needs, that you have to have all of these other things in your life. You know, one of the good things that could come and should come out of this pandemic that we've had where basically the world and work has been shut down and all of this, one of the good things that that could produce is for people to recognize that, God, my life isn't focused. It isn't centered upon you the way that it should be. I've literally got all of these other things that I am leaning upon that are so important to me that when they are taken away from me, then depression, then discouragement, then worry, then fear comes upon me. One of the good things that could come is that we recognize that, God, I'm not focused upon you. You know, I've often said it this way, that the only people who will ever let you down are the ones that you lean upon. It's, you know, it's, it's like a cane or something. If you're leaning on that thing and if it breaks, well, then you could fall. But if you aren't leaning on that cane, that cane could break. It doesn't matter because you aren't putting any of your weight upon it. You can get to a place to where Jesus is everything for you. And it doesn't matter what goes on in the world. It matters in the sense that it might affect you to some degree. It matters in the sense that you care about other people and you see that they are struggling and so you want to help them. But it is not going to affect you. This virus pandemic has not affected me in um, significant ways. Now, let me explain that, that I have had to... Uh, you know, send a lot of our employees home. We've got 650 employees and we didn't lay off a single person. Did you know that our income didn't go down? Because my focus, my dependence was upon Jesus. When they came out with this stimulus money that they gave people, I'm not going to criticize anybody who took it, but I didn't take it because Jesus is my source, not the government. And then I found out then I wasn't even qualified to take it because I've got more than 500 employees. But before they came out with these stipulations, I wasn't going to take it. I was trusting God and praise God. God, through my partners, has been sufficient and we haven't laid off a single person. Our income didn't go down. It went up. We didn't quit putting out materials. We set some records. We caught, we had record number of calls. We had to send our employees on. What I'm trying to say through all of this is that when you are leaning upon Jesus, it doesn't matter if a pandemic comes. It doesn't matter what happens. Nothing is going to affect you. The only people or the only things that will let you down are the things that you're leaning upon. And I'm saying to you that many of us have not been centered. Our life has not been centered and built upon and based upon Jesus the way that it's supposed to. And so when all of these other things that we depend upon that give us our contentment and our satisfaction are stripped away from us, all of a sudden it reveals this deficiency, not in Jesus, but in our lack of trust and reliance upon Jesus, our lack of being focused and centered upon Jesus. That's the problem. Jesus is more than enough. He wants to be your best friend. It doesn't matter if you can't get out and go socialize with your friends and do some of the things that you've done. And in their right place, all of those things are fine. But I'm saying that if they are stripped from you and all of a sudden you go into a tailspin and you can't adjust and it's been hard on you, it shows you that you aren't really satisfied with Jesus. Not that Jesus isn't satisfying, but that you haven't appropriated it. You have substituted all of these other things. I tell you, this is one of the serious problems in many Christians' lives is that we get so occupied with the affairs of this life and all of the things. We get so busy making a living and going to all of our social things and even with your kids, which in their place, all of these things are good. But you can get to where you're so busy going to soccer practice and ball practice and doing this and all of these things that you don't have any time for the Lord. And when all of a sudden these things are stripped from you and you have to depend upon Jesus, Jesus completely satisfies. But there are many people watching this 
that haven't been satisfied with Jesus, not because of his failure, but because of your failure to build your life around Jesus. Man, those are some strong statements that I'm making. But if you could receive what I'm saying, this could actually help you. If Philip would have thought about it, he was saying, Jesus, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. If somehow or another we could see God the Father sitting in heaven on the throne and the glory round about him and all the living creatures, and if we could see this, that would satisfy us. But Jesus, we aren't satisfied with you. Man, if you would stop, if Philip had stopped and thought about that, what a put down that is. And you know why he wasn't satisfied with Jesus? It's not because Jesus doesn't satisfy, but it's because they didn't know the true Jesus. They knew him in the natural, but they didn't know who he truly was. And this is what Jesus went on to say. Look at his reaction to Philip. How did, how did Jesus respond when Philip says, show us the Father and it'll be satisfied? He says, okay, I'll help you go beyond me. You really need something more than me. If you could just see the Father, then I believe that, man, that would satisfy you. No, he, he didn't, in a sense, validate Philip's misconception. Look what he said. Jesus said unto them, have I been so long time with you? And yet thou hast not known me, Philip. He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me doeth the works. Jesus is saying, Philip, I've been with you for three and a half years. Philip was one of the 12 apostles for three and a half years, they were with him day and night. They saw all of these miracles. They heard preaching and teaching like nobody else had ever spoken. They saw Jesus in control of mobs when they tried to come and kill him and take him. He'd just walk right through the middle of them. Uh, they saw him still the storms. He had authority over the weather. He calmed the sea. He walked on top of water. He raised the dead. He opened up blind eyes. They had been with Jesus day and night for three and a half years. There is no way of telling the things that Jesus shared with them personally, the things that they saw. They never saw any failure. Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. He was God manifest in the flesh. You know, the scripture says in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, that at the birth of Jesus, they said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. They called Jesus this little baby that was born. I mean, he had just been born, probably seven or eight pounds. Here he was totally dependent upon his mother. He was human in every single way. The people, you know, these uh, kings that came from the east and worshiped him and gave him these presents. They bowed down and worshiped him. And yet here was a baby, a helpless baby. And yet he was Lord at his birth. He didn't grow into becoming Lord. These angels were saying, Christ, the Lord at his birth. His body was a baby. And according to Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So his physical body had to grow. His mind, his physical mind had to grow. He did not come out of the womb speaking Hebrew. He did not know how to feed himself. He didn't know how to control his bowels. He didn't know how to walk. Jesus had to learn in all of these natural things just like us. He got tired. He had to sleep. He got dirty. He had to bathe. His hair, I'm sure, got matted. They didn't have, uh, you know, the hygiene that we have today. They couldn't take a shower every day. He walked in the hot Judean sun, and there's no indication that he had two or three trunks of food uh, with, uh, not food, but clothes with him and things like this. He didn't have fresh clothes every single day. Man, he wore the same clothes. He got hot and sweaty. I'm sure his hair got matted. He didn't have the shampoo that we have, the hair products. Jesus was, he was normal. He was human. He wasn't only human. In the spirit, he was Lord at his birth. 
It says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, preached on in the world, seen of angels, received up into glory. I may not have gotten that whole quotation right, but it says that God was manifest in the flesh. The only time God was manifest in the flesh was Jesus. Jesus was God in the flesh, but he was in the flesh. And one of the reasons that Philip didn't fully recognize who Jesus was because of Jesus' physical body. Philip had the disadvantage of having to see Jesus in his physical body. And I know that when I say that, some of you are just shocked. Like, what do you mean disadvantage? It would have been wonderful to be one of the 12 disciples and to see these miracles and to actually be able to see and touch Jesus and to hear him with your audible physical ears. That would have been awesome. Well, it would have in a lot of ways, but it actually would have been harder to believe that this was God. And I know some of you are shocked right now, but just follow my logic here. They saw him tired. They saw him hungry. They saw him have to sleep. And I don't mean any disrespect by this, but they saw him have to do, you know, all of the things that every one of us do. And they saw him. They saw his humanity. And it made it hard for them to really recognize who he truly was. You know, I am what they call a lucid dreamer. I read about this in the Reader's Digest. There was a whole thing on on sleep and dreaming. And a lot of people, like my wife, she says that she doesn't remember that she dreams, but I know she does. I've heard She's woken me up at times talking in her sleep and having dreams. So she dreams. All of us dream is what uh, people say, but... Not everybody remembers it, and some people, their dreams are vivid. I'm one of those that my dreams, I dream in color. I mean, my dreams are, I dream constantly. I could fall asleep and take a five-minute nap, and I'll dream multiple things. I dream all of the time. Sometimes it's hard for me to tell if I'm awake or I'm asleep because my dreams are just so real. But one time I had a dream where I was one of the disciples of Jesus, and I was walking along with the other disciples, and we had just seen him raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. We had seen him open up blind eyes. And as we were walking down the road, we were all talking about this, and we were, we were talking to each other like, did you see that? Did you see what he did? And I mean, we were excited. And the uh, again, when I dream, it's vivid to me. It was like I was there. I was experiencing the emotion of what it would have been like to be one of Jesus' disciples. And right in the midst of us praising God and talking about how awesome all of this was, Jesus just whirled around and put his finger right in my face and said to me what he said to Peter in the 16th chapter of Matthew. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And I mean, it just startled me. And everything... The fact that he raised people from the dead, the fact that he opened up the blind eyes, the fact that he walked in love, the fact that he controlled the weather and everything, every physical, natural thing said, you are God. But when I was looking at him in the face, he was as plain looking as I am. You know, this is what uh, Isaiah said, that when we see him, there isn't any beauty in him that we should desire him. Jesus wasn't a beautiful person. He was plain. He was common. He wasn't sinful, but there was nothing special about Jesus. And as I looked at his physical body, even though everything inside of me screamed, you are God, when I looked at his physical body and saw the natural part of him, it took all the faith I could muster to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so... Through that dream, I can somewhat relate to these disciples having to go beyond that body. That body was actually a disadvantage to them knowing who Jesus really was. And man, I have just said some powerful things that need further explanation, and I'm out of time. 
you need to write in and get this little booklet that we're putting out. It has all of this in there. This is our gift to you. I promise you this would make a difference. Listen to our announcer as he gives you the information and please call or write today. Andrew's brand new teaching, Are You Satisfied with Jesus?, is available as a booklet. And today, Andrew would like to offer it as his free gift to you. Go to awmi.net to receive your free copy and to order additional copies to share with friends and family for only $1 each. This new series is also available in a two-part CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. It's really awesome to be able to be a partner. Andrew's vision and his ministry and what he's done, it's just impacting the world with the truth of the gospel, with the truth of who Jesus really is. And when I saw where the money that I was giving was going, I was like, I'm going to give this ministry for the rest of my life. So being a partner is really coming together in the body of Christ and, and doing His will. Jamie and I are here just to thank you so much for being partners with us. I tell you, we are reaching around the world. I remember when Jamie and I were it. I would run the sound while she was doing the praise and worship, and then she'd come back and run the sound while I was preaching. We did it all ourselves. Now we have so many people helping us, and it couldn't happen without you. It's very true. We're very thankful for our partners and what they're doing, and you're going around the world, too, and everything that this ministry does. Amen. So we just wanted to say a special thank you, and uh, we love you. And every good thing that is happening through this ministry, you're going to share in every one of those rewards. So God bless you. Thank you for being a partner with us. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I'd like to give you a special invitation to join me on September the 24th through the 26th for our Identity in Christ conference. I'm going to have Pastor Dwayne Sheriff with me. He's one of my great friends. He's on my board of directors. He is one of the most powerful ministers that I know. And both of us, it is this truth about who we are in Christ, a revelation of what I call spirit, soul, and body that has changed our lives. And we are just going to take both of our teachings, both of our revelations, what God has done in our life, and just pour it into you for these three days. Remember, it's September the 24th through the 26th at our Karis Bible College in Woodland Park, our Identity in Christ Conference. Welcome to the AWM Minute, a small glimpse on how the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries are changing lives all around the world. Lives like Teresa Hotelling, who decided to fight the diagnosis of Sjogren's Syndrome and lupus by attending Karis Bible College. After sitting under the word for months, the reality of her identity in Christ became more real to her than the sickness she was fighting. And during worship one day, she took authority over all of her symptoms. It was like there was an explosion on the inside of me. And I just very calmly began to say, Sjogren syndrome, you get out of my body. Lupus, you get out of my body. Carpal tunnel, you be healed in Jesus' name. Back, you be healed in Jesus' name. And I, it was so calm. It was like surreal. And I just knew that it was done. Today, Teresa is completely healed and has graduated Karis to go into full-time ministry. To see her story, visit awmi.net today. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily Live Bible Study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily Live Bible Study five days a week. Bring Karis with you wherever you go with our new Karis app. 
free to download the Karis app allows you to easily access everything Karis Bible College has to offer in one place. Receive exclusive grace content and explore unique Karis features. Watch or listen to archived resources and teachings. Follow along with the Bible reading plan or listen to the audio Bible. The Karis app brings everything in one place. Download your app today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the Scripture says, If any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people, who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. Illnesses like negative emotions. If you don't know how to handle them, they will handle you. And you got to attack that thing with the Word of God. You will not fail, nor will you be governed by negative emotions. Renew your mind, your spirit. Renew your life at the 2020 Grace Life Conference. Check out this year's speakers you don't want to miss. Creflo Dollar, Taffy Dollar, Michael T. Smith, Gregory Diggow, and Andrew Womack. Don't miss out on this opportunity to set your life back on track. Come to the 2020 Grace Life Conference. Seats are limited, so register today. of depression this morning because most depressed people have experienced some kind of trauma which has brought sorrow into their lives. Now, I want to show you the causes, but then I want to show you some scriptures that will encourage you even in the midst of the cause. So go to uh, Psalms 40, uh, verses 1 through 3 in the New Living Translation. Psalms 40, verses 1 through 3 in the New Living Translation. So I'm going to give you five causes of depression, and I want you to build your, your guard up against it now. This is the only reason I'm giving it to you, so you can build your guard up against it. Okay, the first cause of depression, sorrow. Sorrow. Sorrow can cause depression in your life. Uh, Psalms 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. He turned to me. And heard my cry. I waited patiently for him to, 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 to help me. And he turned to me. He lifted me out of the pit of despair. Out of the mud. And out of the mire. He set my feet on solid ground. And, 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 and he steadied me <laughs> as I walked along. Man, that's God walking with you, right? Look at verse 3. He says... He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying that you won't ever see sorrow. I am saying that when sorrow comes, you can turn to God and trust him 
because he'll lift you up out of despair. He'll lift you up out of a pit. But sorrow, if you don't attack it, and like I said before, the way to deal with sorrow is if you're dealing with those thoughts of sorrow, I, I go to Psalms 40 and I read Psalms 40 and, and it tells me what God would do if I turn my attention there, then it delivers me up out of the sorrow. It'll turn my attention. The Bible talks about attend to my word. Attend to my word. Give attention, give attention to the word rather than giving attention to the situation that caused the sorrow. Sorrow causes depression. It is a cause of depression. But I'll go to a step further. I've met people who've been, who've been in sorrow for a long time. I met people who come to church, shout at church, get happy at church, go home, sit there for about five minutes and think about all the other stuff and be filled with sorrow. And instead of you being filled with sorrow, be filled with his word. If you'll be filled with his word, praise God, the sorrow won't be able to, to, to attach itself to your life and maintain depression. Okay? Number two. I want you to go to Psalms 3.3 3 in the King James. Psalms 3.3, 3, num number two. Second cause of depression, disappointment or unfulfilled expectations. Disappointment, which is unfulfilled expectations. You're, you become disappointed when what you expected to happen didn't happen. You're disappointed when you really built yourself up and you expected this thing to take place, it didn't take place. Now, I want you to be aware of something. Be careful not to set yourself up for disappointment because you're expecting things that you don't have a right to expect. Y'all hear what I'm saying? A lot of times, you, 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 you go ahead with a thing. You, you're expecting a relationship is closer than what, you, what, it, what it really is. You're, you're expecting for somebody to do something for you because you did these 10 things for them. Uh, you, you've, got to, you've got to adapt this, this way of thinking. Uh, you've got to come to the point where I don't expect anything, but I appreciate everything. I expect nothing, but I appreciate everything. And that will protect your heart from disappointment. But if you let your expectations get ahead of you, and you're expecting this to happen because you did that, you're expecting that to happen because, you know, you did that or you felt this way, and yet that expectation is, is just going to set you up for hurt. And when you don't get what you expected, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you have the potential of being depressed because you can't understand why it didn't happen. Or, you know, you go out with a friend, and truly a friend. And you just went out to have coffee, and now you expect it for this person to call you every day. You expect for this person to text you all the time. Why would you expect that? Why would you expect that? Or you went out on one date, and you expected for them to propose, and they didn't. Why would you, why would you expect that? I mean, you guys laugh, but you, it is something else how people just start expecting stuff they have no right to expect. You know, I felt like since I comforted you when you were in trouble, watch this, you should have at least called to check on me. Why? What gave you a right to expect just because, see, that's why when you do things, you've got to be very sincere about what you do and not do it because you're expecting for somebody to do like you do. Just because you're a certain way doesn't mean somebody, you, you can't expect for somebody else to be like you. You're doing what you do because you believe God called, told you to do it. You believe God told you to do it. But if you're, if you're doing it just so somebody could do it, you, you, your motives are wrong and, and, and you're, you're setting yourself up for disappointment and, and now you're walking around depressed and the other person don't even know that you're depressed because they didn't know you were expecting that and now you got an attitude with them. There it is. Your emotions now are moving you away from a relationship that could be a blessing to you, but, but you, you, you I, I don't know, you're, you're too needy, you too, I don't know what they call them, people who just, oh, Lord, have mercy. They just... Huh? Needy, clingy. E.
You can't say, hello, how are you doing? Because they're like, mm, I sure needed that. Nobody else told me or asked me how I was doing today. And by the way, today was my birthday, and I was, you was the only one that asked me how I felt. You're like, God, dog, I'm scared to be in this position. <laughs> Say it again, expect nothing. Expect nothing. Appreciate, everything. Appreciate everything. Now, that's not where God is concerned. Now, when you're dealing with God, expect everything. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's good, Lord. Expect everything and appreciate, appreciate it when it's nothing. In other words, when you, get, you didn't get what you, there's enough that he's already done for you to be grateful. That'll cause depression, and we got to stop it. There are a lot of people in here this morning who walk in disappointment because you expected for somebody to treat you a certain way because you treated somebody a certain way. Well, I mean, if it was me, it's not. It's not. Quit trying to change the rules. <laughs> yeah, you understand what I'm saying? We love to do that. We like to change the rules when, we, when it comes to us. But I just thought that since I did such and so, such and so, I just figured that, you know, they would do such and so, such and so. I mean, I know I would. <laughs> y'all, uh, yeah, let, let me go to number three, because y'all, y'all, y'all saying that some of y'all wiggling now, you know. You know. <laughs> Here's the third cause of depression. Watch this. Rejection. Rejection, feelings of not being accepted. It's, it's, it, rejection is really an issue of self-worth. It's, uh, it's this thing of being, feeling insignificant. Uh, this search for significance and, and when, when you're not accepted, you know, self-worth, the love and acceptance that, that, that we have from God should be enough. That's why it's so important for you to recognize how God loves you and how God accepts you. But then there's this other worldly kind of uh, self-worth that talks about performance and the opinions of others, and that's hard. If you're trying to build your self-worth based on how well other people think you perform, and if you're trying to build your self-worth based on other people's opinions of you, you are going to be depressed a whole lot. And there are lots of people in the world that do that, especially with the coming of the social media. We want acceptance. We want people's opinion of us to be good. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a human. I, I like for people to have a good opinion of me. But it can't be to the point where their opinion and their acceptance of me governs my value for myself and governs my self-worth. I, I can't let that happen. I depend on what God said about me. I'm the apple of his eye. He loves me. He expresses his love to me. I'm all right with him. He has a great opinion of me. And I just got to stick with that because if I, if I leave him and go to your cousins, <laughs> then I'm, I'm not, it's, it's, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to be where it needs to be. And that spirit of rejection, rejection can get you to a point where it creates a phobia where you start rejecting yourself before people reject you. And, and I, 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 I've counseled that before, and it's so sad. You, you know, you'll say hey to somebody, and, and they'll wave, but last week they said hello, and now when it went from a verbal salutation to a wave, you're like, they don't like me. They don't have anything to do with me. That, that, whoa, 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 it's not them. You have put yourself in a place where, and, and that, that comes from some kind of trauma too. It comes from something that happened when you were little, you hadn't been accepted, nobody's talking to you, and you, 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 just, you just automatically feel like they reject me. And they don't reject you. They love you. You've got to get over that trauma, and you've got to learn how to accept you. You've got to look at your mirror, in your mirror quite often and say, I am the apple of God's eye. I am all right with him. And then there's some people that, you know, there are going to be some people that you're going to be all right with anyway. I'm all right with that person, that person, 
and it might be two, but you got to be all right with those two. You don't need to be counting a whole bunch of folks. Remember I told you there's the outer court relationship, there's the inner court relationship, and there's the holy of holy relationship. In the holy of holy relationship, that's behind the veil. You don't need no 10 people behind the veil. The holy of holy relationship is they know everything about you. The outer court relationship is, you know, uh, we speak, we go eat lunch sometime, hey, how your mom and them? That's an inner court relationship. And an outer court relationship is, I know of you. We go to the same church. But you don't take out of court people and put them behind the veil. They don't know you well enough to be behind the veil. Is this helping anybody or do I need to just... Well, I want more scriptures, more scriptures. Just... Okay, Psalms 3. <laughs> Verse 3, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. You're my glory. Watch this. And the lifter up of my head. Boy, that encourages me right there. God, God says, I'll be a shield for you. I'll be a shield for you. I'll, I'll, I'll shield you against uh, rejection. I'll shield you against those, those horrible feelings of insignificance. I'll show you that you are significant to the kingdom. You're significant to other people. You have significance in this world. I'll show you that you do. Number four, here's the first, fourth cause of depression. <sighs> Dead religious traditions. Dead religious traditions can cause depression. Look at Psalms 42 and 11. If you are depressed, every time you come from church, come home from church, something is wrong with that church. <laughs> and I, I'm telling you, I am a witness to this. Being under the law is a dead religious tradition. And it can cause depression. It's coming to a church where you, what, your life as a Christian is never enough. Right, right. You come every week and you hear about how you're not enough. You, you didn't pray enough. If, if you lost a baby in a miscarriage, it's because you, you didn't say enough scriptures out loud. It, 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 the reason why you're in a mess you're in is because, you know, God's getting you for, for all the sin that you have right, done. And, right. and, 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 you know, you, 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 don't, you don't honor the man of God, and, or, or you, you didn't give. You didn't, you see, that's, that must be it. You, you, you lost your house because if you'd have been given, and, and, and you, you keep coming and you're trying, and, and you're like, because well, you got a gift, and you're not using your gift. You know you ought to be in that choir singing, and that, that's the reason why you can't get no husband, and you're like, God, dog. And, and then you get in the choir and you start singing, and then it's like you, you didn't fast enough. When the last time you went on a fast? Oh, doggone it, I got to starve myself. And, and it's just, it's just dead traditional stuff. And it says it's never enough. And this dead traditional stuff, you know, the Bible, the Bible talks about the fact that you, you got to be, God, Jesus came to deliver us from dead works. Dead works are doing stuff to try to deserve the blessing from God. And, and you just do stuff and you, you, and I got like that. I, I just did. Okay. All right, I'm going to just join everything. I'm going to join everything. I'm going to pray two, three hours a day. Uh, they, they told me to confess this until I had like three pages of confession. It took me about an hour to make all them confessions. And then you had to pray an hour in tongues. And then those mornings when you were praying real hard and you thought, I'm about finished, looked up, hey, but three minutes went by. And so you're not praying to the Lord anymore. You're praying to the clock to see how much longer. And then you look up, you got 15 more minutes, and you think, I don't know if I can make it. And you start out with rebo bo 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 and then ended up with la, 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 la. I leave the church depressed because I couldn't do it all right. I was never enough. But then one day I found out that his grace is sufficient. And that God doesn't love me because of my good works. God loves me 
because of my belief in Jesus Christ and all the works that he did. And once I got set free from that tradition, hallelujah, no more depression in that area. Free at last. From religious dead tradition, I'm free at last. You know, the Latin, I believe the Latin definition of religion means a return to bondage. If you're leaving a church, every, every church service, and you feel worse than when you came in, something is wrong with that church. Hallelujah. Ooh, got me tired just remembering it. <laughs> I ain't never going back to religion no more. I never going back to that stuff no more. All right, let me give you the last one. All right, I didn't read the, uh, the scripture. First, uh, Psalm 42, 11. Uh, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Soul, talking to his soul. And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So here's the key here. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to praise God. There's so much power in praise. You can complain or you can praise. You'll benefit better if you praise. Amen? Amen? If you run into something and it's a crazy situation, your benefit will come when you praise. Finally, <clears throat> the fifth cause of depression, illnesses or sicknesses. To be sick can cause depression. People become sad and self-centered from thinking about nothing else but being sick. Many people need to be delivered from depression before they can get healed in, in their physical bodies. Depression will try to destroy your life by hindering your faith. When, uh, when I was diagnosed with cancer, it, it, it wasn't that I felt anything. It wasn't that anything was hurting. It was the fact that somebody told me that I had an aggressive form of cancer and we need to move quick. The pressure, you're talking about feelings that come from thoughts that weigh you down. The thoughts were all about all the other people who had cancer and are now dead. So now will I be able to, to get out of this? Because if you're not careful, you start thinking that way. And, and, and you have thoughts like, well, let me go ahead and get ready to die. And, boy, you better know some word. Now, if all you think about is, I got cancer, I got cancer, I got cancer, I got cancer, and there's nothing else to think about, there's nothing you're exposing yourself to other than what the doctor says, and you go, and it gets progressively worse, and then they put you in these machines, and they do all of this stuff, and, and it's like, oh, Lord. If you do that, you, you probably going to go. You're going to go, because that's what you think. You're already dead inside. You're already dead in your thinking. And I knew I couldn't do that. I knew I couldn't do that. And if you do that, what happens, I had to take the first week to fight against depression by changing my thinking. Every time you go by a graveyard, every time you see the word dead somewhere. I was preaching one time and opened my Bible up and I was reading some, you know, the dead, or in the, oh, it said dead in the law, but I'm like, dead, dead. <laughs> I couldn't see myself in a casket. So I had to change the way I was thinking. I had to introduce what the word had to say. This is God's word. I'm going to think it. I got to get rid of this heavy thought. I didn't announce it to the church. 
I just felt like I don't need all that. Last thing I need is church full of folks coming around. And you know how some folks are. You're going to be all right. Gonna... The Lord told me that if you took five glasses of juice like this, it, it's just... Let's do this thing. Illnesses, like negative emotions, if you don't know how to handle them, they're going to handle you. And most people end up dying of something else other than the diagnosed situation because of the fear that was released. And you got to attack that thing with the Word of God. Now, right now, listening to this, some of y'all might be thinking, okay, well, tired of hearing all this. You're going to need this. I'm telling you, there's, there's something coming. There's something coming. You've been in the school of preparation for the days to come. I would love to hoop and holler at you all the time and to keep you all excited and shouting and stuff so you won't nod, but I told you nodding is not my issue, it's yours. Amen. Amen. But something's coming. And you're going to be ready for a great revival. You're going to see the difference now. In Goshen, they had enough straw to make bricks. At that time in Egypt, they didn't have straw to make bricks. In Goshen, there was daylight. In Egypt, it was dark. You're about to see that kind of distinction in the world today. A distinction between Egypt and Goshen. A distinction between not enough and more than enough. You can become a part of the not enough, or you can become a part of the more than enough, but you're going to be ready. This church will know what to do. You will not fail, nor will you be governed by negative emotions. In a world full of uncertainty and in the midst of unprecedented global events, the pressures of life can be overwhelming and lead to internal depression. But Christ has called us to overcome and win our internal and external battles. That's why we have designed a series just for you. You don't have to choose depression. You can choose your authority over depression and use your faith to defeat it and keep it out of your life. When you know how to properly divide the word, you know how to properly use the word. During these challenging times, Boost your faith and fight the good fight against depression, anxiety, and fear with the five-message series, Delivered from Depression, for just $30. Also available in this one-time offer is the Delivered from Depression series bundled with the powerful classic book, Winning in Troubled Times. Receive this $50 power pack for just $40 U.S. dollars. Call today or visit the website on the screen to order. Renew your mind, your spirit, renew your life at the 2020 Grace Life Conference. Check out this year's speakers you don't want to miss. Creflo Dollar. You got to have your own relationship with Jesus. Taffy Dollar. I receive the gift of grace. Michael T. Smith. Let me give you good news. You are not in the flesh. Gregory Dittow. It's the equalizer of every human being. And Andrew Womack. Being sensitive to the Lord can change your life. Your life will never be the same again. It's changed your mind, heart open. It's just life-changing experience. You can't miss it. Don't miss out on this opportunity to set your life back on track. Come to the 2020 Grace Life Conference at the World Dome in College Park, Georgia, July 6th through the 10th. Register by texting Grace Life to 51555 or visiting creflodollarministries.org. Seats are limited, so register today. We must respond to the spiritual laws of God. A proven principle Taffy and I have operated in for many, many years is the law of sowing and reaping. Now, when you sow into this ministry, you are sowing into good ground. Why? You see, your seed is not wasted. In fact, your seed is a twice sown seed, meaning that it'll work in different places at the same time. Your financial seed goes toward helping hurting people, both globally and within our local communities. We thank God for your support. You may support Creflo Dollar Ministries' outreach missions by calling us or visiting our website. You enrich lives in ways you can't begin to imagine. God bless you. 
Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. You know, if you would like to come to Karis Bible College, but you just can't bring it on yourself to leave where you are and move out here, I would like to let you know that we have extension schools all over the United States as well as many foreign countries. And uh, we have morning classes, night classes. We have Saturday classes where you meet just two Saturdays a month and do the rest by correspondence. There's many ways for you to take advantage. So go check out our website and see if there is a Karis Bible College close to you. As Karis continues to grow, new locations are constantly being added. Students are being equipped through the Word of God and grounded in the message of God's unconditional love and grace. With over 70 locations worldwide and brand new ones starting, there is a Karis waiting for you. Please go to karisbiblecollege.org slash mycampus to find a campus opening near you. You're watching Gospel Truth TV, teaching God's unconditional love and grace. Victory Life Today with Al and Angie Burke. Have you been praying and praying and praying and praying and getting nowhere? Well, I'm going to answer that question for you today. Hi, welcome to Victory Life Today. I'm Al Burke. And I'm Angie Burke. Thanks so much for joining us today. This is awesome. Yeah, I we love got good it. Stuff yes, today. I can say I've been praying and praying and praying and praying, or I used to say that, and don't get any answers. And I'm sure everyone out there listening today want to know. Your Why is answer. it I pray and pray awesome. and pray and get nowhere, and I've been praying for years and get nowhere? Well, I'm going to answer that question for you today. This is going to be a blockbuster. This teaching, there's probably two parts, maybe three, will change your life if you'll do it. And Amen. so, That's let me, awesome. Let me get into this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Al, there are so many things that we could be saying about that, you know, and, well, God doesn't want to answer, or it's not his will, or it's not his timing, or he's not even hearing me. And then we get this wrong uh, perception of God when he's just a good God, not holding out on us whatsoever. So we're going to be answering a lot of your questions today, or Al is really mostly. The, this revelation has personally been given to him, and he's experienced some of it too, so it's just been awesome. So we're excited. Okay, well, let's just get into it. Okay. I have been praying. I'm going to give you my story, okay? I have been praying over ringing in the ears for like 25 years. I've had this problem, I'm going to just say something like 25 years. And it started out, it was like a lot of nothing. But every year it got a little worse and a little worse. And so some after 25 years of this, it got so bad. And the, it was just so loud. I couldn't function. I couldn't think anymore. I was just burned out. And I said, look, Lord, I'm done. No one can live like this anymore. I'm out of here. Well, and you could say it this way, fortunately or unfortunately, God doesn't kill anybody. So you're going to live your life out however long that's going to go. So I was just saying, Lord, I'm done. I've had it. No one can live like this anymore. And I said, I just want you to know something, Lord. That when I die, whenever that is, and I'm going to come up before the throne, I am going to say this to you. Lord, the Bible says, by his stripes, you were healed. And I'm going to say, Lord, you never healed me. That's not true. 
And what about this one? All of God's promises are yes and amen. Well, why do I have this problem for 25 years? Why am I struggling with this so bad or struggled with it? And when I stand before the throne, I'm going to ask you those questions. Wow. So well, you can do that because you have a personal relationship with well, him. You I can actually this, talk to him. I look at it this way. If I have a relationship with anybody, right? to some degree, you know, I'm going to talk to them based on my relationship with them. What, what If I have an employee, I'm going to talk to them. And so I, anyway, I, this one I was, I said to the Lord, I said, look, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, this is the way the Lord answered me. Praise God for one, just a short word from the Lord. And the Lord said this to me. He said, I answered your prayer 25 years ago, the first time you prayed. And what happened was because your receiver was broken, you couldn't receive it. It came from heaven and went and bounced off of you, went back to heaven. Now there's a building in heaven. And in that building is body parts, all kind of body parts for people. And this is what the Lord was showing me. And he said, in that building is a bin with your name on it, with new ears. And there's a day. Okay. And what's the, the date on that bin was the first date that you prayed. The first day you prayed 25 years ago. That date is still recorded on that bin. And those body parts are still waiting for you. Wow. But it doesn't mean you're not going to get him here. It doesn't mean it's just for heaven. Well, you know what? I, I, so I said, you know what, Lord? No offense. Okay. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, Lord, there's only you and me, and one of us is a problem. And, <laughs> and I don't know who it you. is. <laughs> you know? But I don't need new body parts when I get to heaven. I need them now. Why are they sitting up there? And why are thousands of body parts sitting up there? And what the wow. Lord said this to me was, I sent you the healing the first time. And you've been praying it for 25 years. You could say it this way. You've been praying for 25 years over and over and over, praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and getting nowhere. When your body parts are sitting here, your problem is not that you're praying. And what it, it implies that you've been praying for 25 years for nothing. I heard you the first time. Your body parts are sitting here. And not only did you pray, in that prayer is taking authority and believing and standing against the enemy when it came and everything. And so so it's all that. Oh all God. that's included in prayer. You, you name it. Yep. I, I did it. I remember I was with you. Every kind of taking it to the courts of heaven and authority and rebuking mm -hmm. and commanding. I've done everything. You know, praying and praying and praying for 25 years. No healing when the Bible says you're healed. Wow. And what the Lord showed me is this is how God can say you already have it, but you don't. In other words, God's going to say, you already got it. You're already healed. It's sitting up here. The problem is not that God didn't hear you. The problem isn't that you didn't believe God. The problem is your receiver is broken. And this is what the Lord showed me. He said, your receiver is broken. And he gave me a vision of a direct TV receiver with a big chunk taken out of it. And he said, you can't receive. If you have direct TV and there's a big chunk taken out of your, you're not going to get the picture. In fact, we have direct TV and I wasn't getting a good picture and it was all screwed up. And I said, what's going on with this? And I went outside and there was a big leaves in front of the receiver. There was nothing wrong with the receiver. There was wow. nothing wrong with my TV set. They were broadcasting the signal. This, it was blocked. My receiver, you could say was broken or covered over, was blocked. Wow. And this is what the Lord said this to me. He said, your receiver is broken. And then the Lord showed this to me, and he said, I heard you the first time, and now I'm going to read you a scripture to show you. Or you're going to, would you read this oh, scripture, yeah, Daniel I'll read 10? It in Daniel, yes. Then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand this and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. From the first day he prayed. When he, okay. What he's implying when you read this, 
is Daniel, you've been praying 21 days for nothing. Right, because three because the enemy held it up for 21 days. He didn't know that. So he kept praying and praying and praying and praying that the answer wasn't given. And it's the same thing we're doing today. We keep yes. praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. And the answer's already been done and given and do it's finished. You've oh. already got it. Andrew Womack has out a book and it's called You've Already Got It. And in that book, he talks about a receiver. You have to receive it. Right. And so what happens is we're busy praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and not receiving because if you read that, I don't know, did you read it there? It says, it, the first day you prayed, God heard you. It was this other thing, when you set your heart to understand. Did That's you right. read that in there? Yes, from the first day that you, from the first day that you set your heart to understand this and to humble yourself before me, your words were heard. Wow. Here's the key. So we good. don't set ourselves to understand. And we don't humble ourselves before God. That's why we're praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. And your body parts are sitting in heaven. Because wow. God has answered your prayer. He's true to the scriptures. He says, yes, all of God's promises are yes and amen. And yes, you were healed. Um, oh, man, that's good, Al. We'll talk about the, the, uh, the heart attitude, the heart to understand. This is a big thing with the heart to understand. Because we don't really have a heart to understand. Let me read you this scripture. Are you going to read that for me? Matthew 12? Um, yes. Let me read, read you Matthew 12, 38 and 39. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Man, he was strong. But none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Did you ever notice, I don't know if you you go through the scripture when, not all the time, but most of the time when they asked Jesus a question, he didn't answer the question. He either asked them another question or he answered like another question. Yeah, he does that to me too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Doesn't he do that to you? All the time, all the time. You know, like I'm praying and praying and I'm, oh God, I got this problem. And God comes up and says, is something wrong? <laughs> There's something wrong. In other words, I already know what you're doing. I already know what you're going through. Why are you praying and praying and praying? And why are you all upset? I've got this handled. I've got your life handled. So, and when you read that, uh, he's saying to them, that you read this, he says, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the Lord said to him, teacher, what will the sign be of you of your coming? And he calls them a wicked generation. He doesn't answer them. Because <laughs> he knew their heart. Because they were just trying to do what the news media does a lot today, like a trick question. Or they were trying to trip him up in his words. Yeah. You know what I mean? They were trying to, they were not, you know, and it proves it. If you drop down, to, I think it's verse 41. Yeah, verse 41, it says, The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah. This is, they came here and they said, teacher, show us a sign. And he's saying, you guys haven't even repented. You have not set your heart to understand. You're just trying to give me a hard time. You're just trying to get me a trick question. I saw, whether you like him or not, I'm just saying I saw President Trump. This news reporter asked him a question, and he looked at him, and he it was maybe a woman. I don't remember. He looked at him, and he said, that's a stupid question. He go, he said, "What a stupid question! What a stupid question!" You know, and and I could and yeah, I could see God up there saying, "I'm not answering stupid questions," yeah. but in my mercy, I'll let you know you're a wicked generation. Now, wicked wow. means twisted. They twisted what the Old Testament law said because they were teachers of the law. Then they twisted it so that it worked for them. That's why they were so mad at Jesus. They were so mad at Jesus because he was exposing them for who they really were. Right. So yeah. you have to begin to learn the only way you're going to fix your receiver, quit praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. Fix your receiver 
and this will work for you. Yeah, so praying over and over and over again is not the issue. It's not what we really should be doing because God, as Al said, heard you the first time. But impl- it really, it implies that God doesn't hear you or can't hear you or he needs a hearing aid. I mean, that's what, that's what you're really saying. I mean, we're talking about God here. But you know yeah. what I always do? I always ask God, and, and that's another whole teaching, but you can ask God for something. It says to lay your petitions out before the Lord. But then you start thanking him because, because the answer is on its way in the physical, but it's already been taken care of in the supernatural. Yeah, that's so good. That's exactly right. And we pray like God needs a hearing aid, or maybe you need to go down to the drugstore and buy God new batteries for his hearing aid and give them to an angel. And say that's the way we pray because we pray the same thing a thousand times. And what we're trying to do is badger God into giving us an answer. Do you ever have like, well, you would know when your kids were little? Yes. And they go, mommy, I want this. Mommy, I want this. Mommy, I want. And they just pound on you. Right. You heard him the first time. Right. Right. And maybe you were more than willing in your heart, mind, and ability when you heard him the first time to do that. Right. But you were busy at the moment. Right. And so it's like, okay, let's just wait a minute here. Wait a minute. No, mommy, will you do this? Mommy, will you? And this is what we do. Childish ways that we pray and operate. When God's saying, this is what he said to me, fix your receiver. And Al, I like this one because you gave me this one. It says, the manifestation of an answered prayer indicates our ability to believe and receive, not God's ability to give. I love that. It's already given. I love that. Absolutely. That's really good. I gave that to you? I don't know. It just showed up here. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) So, um, you know, let me me put it this way so you can understand it. Let's say I went down to the bank. I, I go to Wells Fargo. And I put a thousand dollars in there and I come back and I say to you, Hey, there's a thousand dollars in Wells Fargo in your name. I already gave it to you. It's done. But you say, he don't have no thousand dollars. I can't be bothered. No, I'm not going to waste my time going in there and they're going to tell me get out of here or who knows why, but you never go down to Wells Fargo or wherever and you never receive it. That's sad. It isn't that I didn't do it. You know, there's a story. Did you put it in my account? <laughs> oh, I know I you'll receive right it. Now. I know you'll receive it. I'm a good it. receiver. And you know what? Really, if you think of I like what you said. Most of us are not good receivers. We're good prayers. Mm-hmm. Prayer, 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 prayer. And we're going to intercede, intercede, intercede. Now, intercession's okay, but it's really, oh, I don't want to get in trouble. So anyway, <laughs> the Lord showed me something. About all of this. Many years ago, I watched this TV show and it was in World War II and the guy got all shot up and he was in a hospital. And you know how back then they had like a hundred beds in a big room and he, he was bad. And he said he got out of bed and he said, wow, I feel great. I feel like a million bucks. And he walked out and he was walking out of the building and the nurse was walking and he walked up to the nurse to tell her he was feeling good and he walked right through her. And he was like, what was that? So he went out and he actually went down the street and he was walking down the street trying to talk to people and no one would even acknowledge he was there. And he said, I leaned up against the telephone pole and you know how sometimes those wires are on like an angle? Yeah, the cables. cable. And he said, my arm was going through the cable just like that. And he was like, what is this? So he said, yeah, I know what I need to do. I'm going to go back. So he went back to the hospital. What that man was at this point is really what we would call a ghost. He was a disembodied spirit. He was a ghost. So he walked up to the, and he started looking for himself. And you know, you don't, you've never really seen yourself. You've seen a reflection of yourself, but you've never seen yourself. And he was looking for himself and you you would think he would know. But anyway, when, when you, have never really seen yourself and you're all shot up with bandages on you. It's a little hard to find yourself. So he kept looking. And when he would go up to the wrong person, it would go like this. It would repel him. It's like, that was weird. And he went up to the next guy and it would bounce back. And when he went up to himself, it sucked him right in. His body sucked his spirit right in. And this is what the Lord told me. He said, if you fix your receiver, 
you will suck the healing right in. Oh, amen. That's so that awesome? good. That's so good. Al. So the problem is that you, isn't that you didn't pray enough. I wonder, um, oh. I sometimes wonder how many times in 25 years have I prayed this spoke to the ringing, commanded it. Well, well, in Matthew 6, 7, it, it says here, but when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. That says it so perfectly. Right, right. What do we do? We pray it, and we pray it, and we pray it, and we pray it, and we think, look, if I just pray this long enough and hard enough, I'm going to beat on God long enough and hard enough. Yeah. He's finally going to, it's, it's like the one with the unjust judge. You have yes. that there? Or yes. I well, I have this, Luke 18, 7 and 8, and says, yes, that's right. And that woman kept coming to the judge right. and kept coming to the she judge. She kept pounding on so him. He got so sick of it. He gave her justice. Right. He says, I got to get this woman out of here, so I'll just give her what she wants. And so we uh, think that God's like that. But this is what it says, Luke 18, 7 and 8 says, And shall not God avenge his own elect and be patient with them who cry day and night to him? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Yes, he will avenge you speedily. That's God's plan. But it requires faith. Well, he, you know what? We've got this all backwards. We're sitting here going, we got to pound the gates of heaven and pound on God like this. God's not an unjust judge. It's the right. opposite. He said, I'll avenge you speedily. Absolutely. And what that means is, I'll answer your prayer speedily, and I will bear long with you. What that means is your healing's back up in heaven. And if you can have faith and fix your receiver, you'll get it back. That's what that scripture means. It's wow. not telling you to just keep praying and praying. He's the opposite of an unjust judge. Absolutely. I don't know how we got that wrong over the years. Absolutely. But, Al, maybe I could talk about the uh, the waterfall of blessings because sure. people— uh, you know, people don't understand why they're not getting their healing or whatever. But God showed me a long time ago that, um, that, you know, he's constantly, if you're born again, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, he's constantly, you, you're, you're, uh, eligible for all of his blessings, the complete blessed life. Anything that he has given you that's good, you're entitled to. There is a waterfall of blessings that stream down from heaven, and it's everything from prosperity to health to healing to good relationships, whatever it is, wholesome, uh, good, anything. God's not uh, mad at you. Absolutely. So he's constantly pouring all that out. So if you're under that waterfall, and what that means is if you're under the waterfall of blessings, then you're really in obedience to him. You're doing what he wants you to do. You're giving, you're tithing, you're, you're ministering to people, you're using your faith correctly. If you, then you're staying under that waterfall and those blessings will pour out on you. But the problem is, let me just say this. God never moves. His intent is always to bless you night and day. But the problem is we walk out from under that waterfall. We either stop tithing or stop believing, or as Al says, our receiver stops working. It blocks up because of some things we're doing or some things we're not doing, whatever it might be. We're the ones that walk out from that blessing. And then we wonder why God is not answering our prayers by giving us the harvest he promised us. Meanwhile, we stopped giving. That's an example. We stopped giving, walked out from under the waterfall, and wonder why our tithe is not bringing in the hundredfold return that God promised. So that's that's really, it's us. We're the ones that leave. We're the ones that move. Have you ever seen a waterfall move? <laughs> no, no, no. Right? No. I mean, it's always there. It is stationary. God is always there. It's really the, what you're saying is exactly the same thing with the broken receiver. Right. You've got this receiver. And I, this happened to me, and I, I said this earlier, that there was a big palm frond that had grown in front of the receiver. I remember I said, oh, no, I have to call direct TV. Oh, no, it's going to take hours. What are we going to gonna have to unplug, plug? And this house is so big, we're yeah. going upstairs, downstairs. And I said, I'm not looking forward to it. And then you went outside and you said, you know what, Ange? That whole thing is covered. There's something blocking the receiver. I love that. It's like a broken receiver or our way of living. And I'm going to get into how it's broken here maybe in the next show. Mm -hmm. I can mention it before. But... What's happened is because it's because of us. Direct TV is still sending the signal just like always. Right. And the TV is ready to go. 
the receiver's not working. It's either broken or it's covered with a palm frond. You right. can't, it doesn't work. And here's what we do. We're calling direct TV. 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 Your thing doesn't work. It's not working. I don't understand. What's the problem? That is so good. That is so great because I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and you're not answering. What's the problem? What did I do wrong? What am I? now, Alf, there are, there are people that when you go to God with that heart that we talked about in the beginning, uh, there are people that go to him with that heart and they really want to know and they say, what am I doing wrong? That's all you have to ask. Okay. There's two ways. You can either come to Jesus with a question or you can question Jesus. And that's what I was doing. I was questioning God. You said this and you said that, and it's not happening, right? Instead of saying, Lord, why isn't this happening? The problem is we have to set our hearts to, and these guys, these Pharisees in this scripture, they didn't set their heart to understand. They didn't humble themselves before God. They were trying to pull a trick question. They did not, they were not the least bit interested in him or who he says he was or whatever. They just wanted to trick him. He was in their way big time. Wow, wow. And so what they were going to do is we'll do the trick questions until we, and and they could never come up with a trick question that Jesus couldn't answer. And I always thought, you know, the Lord showed this to me, but I always just recently, and I always never could understand, stand. It's like, Lord, you didn't answer that guy's question. Yeah, you know, even yeah. even when they came, even the when they came and they said, "Lord, when will be the time of the end and you're coming?" He goes, "See to it that you be not deceived." You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> well, we don't care about deceived. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It's true. He does this all the time in the scripture. It's kind of like he, he and, and he answers in parables and he does all these things. Why? Because if your receiver is working, those parables are easy to That's understand. That's exactly right. When you have no receiver or you're trying to do a trick question and you're trying to pull a trick, your receiver's broken and you won't understand the parables. Wow, that's very, very good. That's very good. And we, and we, and when God asks another question to us, again, if your heart is softened to him, you'll know he's up to something. Okay. There's something you want to tell me. I'm on this track, but you want me to know this. Now it might be, it might be for the same topic, but He wants me to see it from a different angle. That's only if you have a heart to understand and you're humble enough to ask him in the first place. If you set your heart to understand and he begins to move and he starts asking you questions, then you know he's moving, he's changing your thinking. Now he's, then when you answer that question, he moves it to this next question and he leads you to you make your own conclusion. He's the best coach. You know, these and life coaches, that's what they that's do. exactly what they do. They get you to come to the realization of something. And that's what Jesus does. That's what he, he does. He just works you and asks you and what prompts it, you. And, 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 and actually it's not so he could see our heart. It's so that we could see our heart. Yeah. He already knows our heart. Oh my but, gosh. That's so good. <laughs> so, uh, so he's leading all these things and, and that's this awesome. Is, that's awesome. That was awesome, Al. And I'd like to, you know, if you like what Al is saying, he has a book out called Walking by Faith into Prosperity. And this is another revelation that he has been given by God that will really, truly change your life. And you'll know how to get your harvest to come into your life and things that might stop it, like stopping the receivers, stopping that money coming back into you, into your life. But go to victorylifeministries.org today and get your copy of Walking by Faith into Prosperity. This really came from all of his life and what he has lived. And God is so true to his word and he loves you and wants you to be prosperous. Thanks so much for joining us today. And remember, victory is always yours through Jesus Christ. We'll see you next time. Have you been suffering physically for months or even years? Maybe you've prayed and prayed but haven't seen results. For over 20 years, Mercy Santos suffered from symptoms of MS. She was a Christian but lacked knowledge of the finished work of Jesus Christ and how to pray correctly. In our book, I Am Healed, both Mercy and I reveal the truths in God's word that set her free from years of suffering. And you too can be healed completely. After reading this book, you will be able to say with mercy, I am healed. 
you will be both encouraged and motivated as you step out to experience God's beautiful love for you. Remember this, what God has done for mercy, He will also do for you. So go to VictoryLifeMinistries.org and get your copy of I Am Healed today. Want to dive deeper into the Word, but your busy schedule robs you of that opportunity? Now you can listen to the Gospel Truth wherever you go with the Gospel Truth radio app. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, we are broadcasting the Gospel, not only our individual television programs, but we've got conferences on there and it's great. No matter how your time is divided up each day, now you can plug into the Gospel Truth 24-7 at your convenience. It's a great way to stay connected in a world that demands so much of your time. Tap the app and start listening to Gospel Truth Radio. Go to the App Store and type in Gospel Truth Radio and download it to your smartphone. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. Andrew brought good news to me. I could understand the Bible more the way he taught it. Jesus forgave you one time, and that's for everything. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on prayer and talking specifically about New Testament prayer after Jesus has come and reconciled us to God versus the way prayer was done in the Old Testament. And I, this is a new wrinkle in most people's brains. Most people have never even thought, it has never crossed their mind that there is a different way to pray in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. Some people might say, well, in the New Testament, we, we pray in the name of Jesus, but they don't even know what that means. I've been sharing some things on prayer. I've got this book, this teaching entitled, A Better Way to Pray, and I have it in Spanish. I have a study guide. I have CDs, DVDs. I really encourage you to get these materials because I tell you, the things I'm saying here are radically different than the way most people approach, approach prayer. And this is one of the reasons that they aren't getting the right results. You know, when the Lord told us to use His name, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, He will give it unto you. Most people don't understand. That's more than just saying, in the name of Jesus. It's more than just mouthing the words. Do you understand what that means? Do you understand what Jesus did? And the truth is, most people don't, because they will pray the exact same prayers that were prayed in the Old Covenant and they will pray the same prayers in the New Testament with just, you know, in the name of Jesus on the end. And in a sense, that's taking the name of Jesus in vain. When you're saying in the name of Jesus, you're saying because of what Jesus did, because He has paid for my sins, because He has reconciled me to God, because He has interceded and He has won your favor for me. Father, I believe now I receive these things because of what Jesus did. That's what you should be saying when you use in the name of Jesus. And yet I have had people come to me by the thousands who say something similar to, why hasn't God healed me? I fast, I pray, I pay my tithes, I go to church, I'm living a holy life, I'm doing everything I can. Why hasn't God healed me? 
There's some of you watching this program right now that that's exactly the attitude that you've been expressing towards God. I'm telling you, in statements like that, it says why God hadn't healed you. Because you aren't pointing to what Jesus did for you. You're pointing to what you have been doing for Jesus. And you are expecting that because I do this and this and this, God is going to move in my life because of what I do. That is anti-Christ. That is taking the name of Jesus in vain. You aren't approaching God on the basis of what Jesus has done. You are approaching God on the basis of what you have done. And you're pleading with an angry God as if he was still angry. But the Bible teaches us that Jesus has reconciled God unto us. There isn't any anger in God towards you because he has been appeased through the sacrifice of Jesus. And for a New Testament Christian to pray the way Old Testament saints did is anti-Christ. Now, I'm not saying that you are anti-Christ. I'm not saying you are of the devil. I'm saying that mindset is against what Jesus has done. It voids what Jesus has done. And then for you to tack in the name of Jesus onto the end of your prayer is taking the name of Jesus in vain. You aren't using it the way that it's intended. You don't understand that there is a difference in the New Testament. Yesterday I used Exodus chapter 32 and showed you how Moses pled with God. God was so ticked off he was going to destroy the entire nation of Israel and start over with Moses and make a new nation. And Moses told God to repent and turn from his fierce wrath. And Exodus 32, 14 says God repented. And, and see, people, I've, I've had them take that exact passage of Scripture and say, this is the way we need to intercede. Just as Moses did, we need to come boldly before God. We need to beg and plead with Him not to pour out His wrath, not to do these things. There's a number of things wrong with that. One of the things is that you think God is still angry. God has had His wrath satisfied through the Lord Jesus. All of God's wrath came upon Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 32. He drew all of God's wrath. You know, I may teach on that later in this week because it fits perfectly with what we're talking about right here. But all of God's wrath was poured upon Jesus and God is not angry with you. Now, I could stop and teach for a week or something explaining this, but let me just say that for the New Testament believer, those who've accepted the salvation that comes through Jesus, all of God's wrath has been satisfied. And according to the promise in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 9 and 10, God will never be angry with us. He will never be wroth. He will never be dissatisfied. He will never take His covenant of peace and mercy away from us ever. You are never going to experience God's wrath. But even for the non-believer... We live in a day where God's wrath has been satisfied through Jesus and God is extending mercy even towards the unbeliever. Now, if they continually reject this, there is coming a day when the wrath of God will come. But we aren't living in that day right now. So for the New Testament believer, you are absolutely free and clear of any wrath and punishment from God. For those who aren't believers, there is a grace and a mercy coming towards God that was not evident even in the Old Testament. And there will come a time where if they continue to reject Jesus, they will be punished for that rejection of Jesus. But it's not today. God is not pouring out His wrath even on the unbeliever. So in the New Testament, Jesus changed everything. God is no longer angry. And so for you to approach God as if He's this angry, mean, uh, wrathful God that was described in the Old Testament, like in Exodus chapter 32, and for you to approach Him that way and say, repent from your fierce wrath, turn from your wrath, repent of this evil that you thought to do. First of all, you don't even understand how God and His holiness and His justice has been satisfied through Jesus. And then for you to tell God to repent, what you are doing is taking the place of a mediator. You are trying to reconcile two parties that are opposed to each other. And I'm telling you, God's not opposed to us anymore. And you are taking the place of Jesus. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, There is only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Jesus ended 
all mediation, all intercession, all pleading with God for mercy that is described in the Old Testament. Jesus obtained for us what we couldn't do. What Moses did was effective at his time, but what Jesus did is a million times more effective. And for you to approach God as if Jesus hadn't atoned, as if he hasn't reconciled us unto God, and plead with God to repent the same way that Moses did, that is anti-Christ. It is against what Jesus has done. Here's another example that is often used, and that's Genesis chapter 18, where the Lord sent two angels down to Sodom to see if they were guilty of everything that had been reported to him. And if they were, he was going to bring destruction on the uh, area of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Genesis chapter 18, in verse 23, it says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Here is Abraham pleading with God and saying, God, you can't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What if there were only 50 righteous people there? Would you kill the righteous people along with the wicked? A righteous, a holy, just person wouldn't do that. God, surely you wouldn't do this. And in verse 26, it says, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. In other words, he knew he was pushing the envelope here. He was getting the Lord down, and he, he knew that he might be going too far. So he said, this will be my last time. This is the last time I'm going to intercede and ask. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. You know, we don't know for sure, but the Lord came down from fifty to ten. I believe that if Abraham would have kept going and said, would you destroy it if there's only one righteous person there? It's possible that the Lord might have pardoned all of Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of one righteous person. And in verse 33, it says, And the Lord went his way as soon as he had uh, left communion with Abram, and Abram returned unto his place. And then in Genesis chapter 19, you find that there wasn't even ten righteous people. Over in Peter, it says that uh, Lot was a righteous man, a just man. And so there was one righteous person there, and God, in his mercy, and because of Abraham's intercession, he spared Lot's life and, and Lot's wife. He brought Lot's wife out, but she turned back and longed after the city, and she turned it into a pillar of salt. And Lot's two daughters came out with him. So there was only three people saved of all of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that wasn't something that Abraham negotiated or interceded for. This was just the mercy of God that he delivered Lot and his two daughters out of Sodom. And so ultimately the entire area was destroyed with fire and brimstone. And I've often heard people uh, use this as a pattern and say this is the way that a New Testament intercessor needs to be interceding. We need to be praying for America and saying, Oh God, you know, please spare America. Don't bring your judgment. Don't bring your wrath upon America. What about the righteous? And we intercede. And uh, we, we are hoping that there's enough good here that it will, you know, uh, put off the judgment of God from coming upon this nation. I'm telling you, if Abraham, under the old covenant, prior to what Jesus did, if he could intercede with God, and if he could bring God down to where he would not destroy 
this entire area because of just 10 righteous people, then I can guarantee you that Jesus' intercession was a million times more inter uh, effective than Abraham's intercession. And Jesus has brought it down that even though the United States is guilty of many of the same things that Sodom and Gomorrah was guilty of, I'm not saying it's because we aren't deserving of judgment, but I'm saying that because of Jesus' intercession, He has satisfied the wrath of God. If God could be turned from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, if there were only ten righteous because of Abraham, I believe that today America or whatever nation you are watching this program in, I believe that Jesus has interceded for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us, according to Hebrews chapter 7. And He has turned the wrath of God. And God is not going to destroy this nation or your nation or any nation because of their sin. Jesus has made a difference. I used to say things like, if God doesn't destroy America, if He doesn't judge America, He's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the logic behind that was that America is becoming as corrupt and as perverse as Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, the, the main sin, there was many sins, but the main sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was homosexuality. Matter of fact, homosexuality today is often referred to as sodomy. You know why that? Because that was, they came from Sodom and homosexuality is so associated with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah that they call it sodomy today. And I mean, that was the main sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were blatant with it. They were open with it. America now is, is per, they aren't just tolerating homosexuality. I'm not against homosexuals. I've got people I know that have had problems with homosexuality, and I haven't treated a one of them badly. I don't do bad things to them. I don't ridicule them. I don't insult them. I don't do things to them. I treat them with respect and honor. I'm not against homosexuals, but I am against homosexuality because it is an abomination. It is a sin. It's wrong. And it's one thing to operate in grace and mercy towards homosexuals where you don't sit there and condemn them and just treat them as trash. But it is an entirely different thing to actually promote homosexuality. And the government and so much of our society today is actually promoting it. It's not a matter of just tolerating it and let people live the way that they choose to. You have to promote it. You have to uh, sanction their marriages. You have to sanction something that is ungodly. There is a push to try and make ministries like mine uh, hire homosexuals, and if I don't, then I'm a homophobe and stuff like that. And I tell you, that is absolutely wrong. I had somebody contact me recently and say, why would you criticize homosexuality? You don't criticize lawyers. And what they did, they went on to say lawyers lie and steal. They have a terrible reputation. Why don't you come out against that? And did you know what? I do criticize dishonesty. I do talk about things. But the difference, the reason I don't single out lawyers is because, for one thing, not all lawyers are dishonest and lie and cheat and steal. That is a gross, um, you know, I don't know, overstatement. It's a putting people in a box and stuff. Not all lawyers are like that. I know some lawyers that have great integrity and stuff. So I speak against uh, lack of integrity and lying and stealing and manipulation and control. I speak against those things. But the difference, the reason I don't come out against lawyers or against some other sins the way that I do homosexuality is because the lawyers who are dishonest don't sit there and promote it as being, this is the way all lawyers should be. This is the way God made me to be. And you have to accept me. And if I apply for a job, and if I want to be your lawyer, you're going to be discriminating against me if I lie and steal. You have to accept my theft and my lying and all of these things. And lawyers don't have parades promoting dishonest practice and, and taking bribes and doing stuff like this. There are lawyers, sure. There are, you know, doctors. There's all kinds of everybody. There are, in every profession, there are people that do things wrong, but they don't hold parades and brag about it and demand that you accept their immorality. 
But homosexuality has gotten to a place where it's not only practiced, it's promoted, and they are trying to cram it down my throat and down your throat, and that's what's wrong with it. So anyway, that's my little sideline. Let me get back to what I was saying, that America has become like Sodom and Gomorrah in many ways, that they not only are practicing homosexuality, but they are promoting it. They're having parades. They're, they're bragging about it. They are flaunting it in the face of God. So when I say that God, you know, I used to say that if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. The logic behind that was that America has become just as corrupt in certain ways as Sodom and Gomorrah, and we are worthy of judgment. But now, with the revelation that God has given me, I understand that if God did judge America for our homosexuality and for these other things, he would have to apologize to Jesus, because Jesus paid for this. Jesus atoned for our sins. It says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That means the atoning sacrifice. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus didn't only forgive the sins of people who he knew would one day accept him and become Christians. But Jesus paid for the sins of the entire world. Those who don't accept him. Those who are homosexuals and who are flaunting their sin and trying to promote it and trying to change society so that they embrace it and promote it and protect it. Jesus paid for the sins of those people. And now God would be unjust uh, uh, to judge those people because of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, am I saying that therefore it's okay? No, it's still wrong. And it's giving Satan a tremendous inroad into their life. You know, I could just, I've taught on this recently. I won't go into detail, but I've got a little uh, booklet type of thing that we put out about abortion, about homosexuality, and about creationism versus evolution. And I put a lot of stacked scientific things in there that, you know, I just I don't know off the top of my head, but we put them in this little thing, research, interviewing people and things. And homosexuals, they tend to live like uh, 20 years less than heterosexual people. Did you know that cigarettes take an average of seven years off of a person's life? And yet we've come out and the Surgeon General puts a warning on all cigarettes that this could be hazardous to your health. And that takes an average of seven years off of your life. The average homosexual lives 20 years less. Why don't we put a warning on that? Because it's not politically correct and because we're hypocrites and we aren't just looking at things in an objective way. There is now a politically correct way to look at things. And so what I'm saying is I, I am not saying that homosexuality is okay because God bore the sin and he's not mad and he's not going to destroy America because of our embracing of this lifestyle. Just because I'm saying that the judgment of God is not coming is not me condoning it and promoting it. It is a destructive lifestyle. It hurts people. It destroys people's lives. It takes years off of your life. And it, on and on I could go. Just because God has paid for the sins of the whole world doesn't mean that it's okay then just to go live in sin. No, Satan is going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour out of 1 Peter chapter 5. And if you give place to Satan, he is going to come in and eat your lunch and pop the bag. You do not want to live in sin. But I'm saying God is not going to be judging your sin. He judged your sin in Jesus. And the only way that you will ever suffer the judgment of God is if you reject His atonement, the payment that Jesus made for your sins. If you reject His atonement, then you will have to pay for your own sins. You will have to pay primarily for the sin of rejecting the greatest sacrifice that was ever made, and that's the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. But your individual sins have been dealt with, and the church as a whole hasn't embraced this. They are telling people, repent because God's going to judge you. But repent because God is going to destroy America or whatever country that you are watching this in. And they are trying to get people to intercede against an angry God and stop him from pouring out his wrath. The way that Abraham tried to do it here in Genesis chapter 18. And I'm saying that under the new covenant, prayer has changed. 
Jesus has satisfied every single demand of God for justice. And now God is not dangling America or you or any other nation over hell with a thin thread that's on fire about ready to burn and drop you into hell. No, God has rescued the entire human race. He's paid for the sins. It doesn't mean that it's automatic. You do have to put faith in the Lord Jesus. But if you have put faith in Jesus, you are redeemed from the wrath of God. God is not going to be angry with you. And it's wrong for you to approach God as if he is still angry, as if the atonement of Jesus didn't make a difference. And you're going to plead with God the way Abraham did. You're going to plead with God the way that Moses did and ask God to turn from his fierce wrath. I'm telling you, that is not New Testament prayer. I'd like to encourage all of you parents to send your kids to our Kingdom Youth Conference on July the 10th through the 11th right here at our facilities at Karis Bible College. This is the second year that we've hosted this. And I tell you, last year we saw hundreds and hundreds of young people get their life just radically changed. I tell you, you need to become a force for good in your child's life. It's sometimes hard to do on your own. We're there to help you. So make sure that you send them on July the 10th through the 11th to Karis Bible College for our Kingdom Youth Conference. I want to let you know that we are doing what we call a live Bible study. Every Tuesday night at 6 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, we are broadcasting from our facilities here in Woodland Park, and we are just sharing the Word. And it's actually live. You can text in your questions. You can call and ask for prayer. But we will answer as many of your questions as we can, about 25, 30 minutes worth of teaching and maybe 25 minutes worth of answering questions. It's just a great interactive thing. Every Tuesday night, 6 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, God already had determined a purpose for your life. A God-given purpose. God has a purpose to train you in what you're called to do. And I'll tell you, Karis Bible College is the place for that. Man, if you want a life change, come to Karis. Come on to Karis! You need to take a step of faith and start believing God for something big. God made every one of you for something special. The next two to three years could be the most powerful time of your life. If you sit under the Word for four hours a day, for five days a week, for two or three years, I guarantee you, you are going to have God speak to you and start revealing purpose to you. We all have a purpose and a destiny, and you will find that out when you attend Karis Bible College. Every one of you were created for a purpose. Do you know what that purpose is? Andrew's complete teaching titled, A Better Way to Pray, is available as a book in either English or Spanish. Today, Andrew would like to offer this book as his free gift to you. Go to awmi.net to get your copy today. I'd like to encourage you to get this free book that we're offering on prayer. I've got other product here, study guide, DVDs, CDs, but we're offering this book to you as our gift. And I tell you, this is a powerful teaching, especially during this time. You know, we're just going through this um, virus that hit the world, actually a pandemic. And man, people are praying, but many times they're praying wrong out of desperation, begging God. They don't know the rights and privileges that God has given us, and I promise you this would transform your prayer life. We're offering this as a free gift to you, so listen to our announcer as he gives you the details, and please call or write today to receive our free book on A Better Way to Pray. Get Andrew's A Better Way to Pray book absolutely free by going to awmi.net today. This offer is limited to one free book per household and is only available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. A Better Way to Pray is also available as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. 
and as a companion study guide. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. Ready to get more out of God's Word than ever before? We gladly announce the newly recreated Andrew Womack Living Commentary. Study with Andrew from Genesis to Revelation. This living commentary is packed with a lifetime of Andrew's own footnotes on over 32,000 verses and counting. This extensive living commentary contains multiple translations of the Bible, including the King James Version Plus, along with Strong's Concordance, where you can find the original Greek and Hebrew text. Andrew has also provided you with several historically respected commentaries. It's never been easier for you to study through the Bible with Andrew. Priced at only $120, this continuously updated living commentary is now available exclusively as a download for both Mac and Windows at awmi.net. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. Have you ever felt frustrated waiting for the promises of God to manifest? Well, you know, there is a rest and a peace in the process of waiting, and you can experience it today. So hold on and find out how. Why live a normal life when you could be living the abundant life? Welcome to the Abundant Life program with Ashley and Carly Terradez. Hello and welcome to Abundant Life. We're so glad you've joined us today in the lounge. My name is Ashley Terradez and this is my awesome wife Carly. And we're in the middle of a series here. We're talking about seeing the promises of God manifest in our life every day, praise God. We're talking about creation, confession, or confession, creation, and manifestation. How God's promises come about in our life, praise God. So where are we up to, Carly? Yeah, so we've been talking this whole time about the process of confession, creation, and manifestation. And just about how in, in, from the minute that the Word of God leaves our lips, it goes to action for the very thing which we sent it to prosper in. But in, there is sometimes a moment between the minute it leaves our mouth and the moment that we see it manifest in the natural. And in the middle of that time, you know, um, it can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. It can seem, especially if it's more than a few seconds, right? right. And, and let's face it, in, in today's society, we want to microwave every miracle. We want everything now. Everything's got to be every, now, You know right? what? It's like if, it, if the video is longer than six seconds, we're not interested. You know, I pray, God, give me patience now. That type I of thing. I want patience now. We're very much instant. <laughs> we're very instant uh, generation. Right. And we're not into waiting. That's and it. we want to make sure that people understand it's not God who's making us wait. God's not holding out on us, but there is a period of time between the seed and the harvest. And sometimes that time can be almost nothing, it can just be seconds, but sometimes it can be a period of time. And that period of time, when it, as it goes on, can cause us to get weary, can cause us to be discouraged because we're not seeing the promises of God come, to about. We talk, come about. We're talking about when you sow a seed, there's a period of time between when the seed is sown and when the fruit or the, the crop grows. Mm -hmm. And in that period of time is when often we have to be careful because that's a period of time we can get discouraged. We can dig up that seed and it can end up uh, not, not working because mm -hmm. we've digging, uh, dug the seed up. Mm -hmm. We don't dig in the seed up. We, du we dig the seed up, but we dug the seed up. Right. You don't dig in. Digging's no, not good. No, don't dig it. 
Yeah, okay. Anyway. I knew a guy once who wouldn't dig. They called him Douglas. <laughs> so carry on. You should Douglas, stick to preaching. I really should. <laughs> You know, um, but in this process that we're talking about, it's right. You know, God's promises are yes and amen, not never, wait, or maybe, mm. right? But in our hearts, sometimes it's just hard for our hearts to really wrap our minds around how good God is. Amen. And there can be some things, there can be some hindrances, and so that process is longer than it needs to be, whether that's fear, worry, unbelief, just lack of knowledge, um, just just being calm, just just being more attached to, to what we feel than what we know spiritually. There is a growth process that is happening. God is not the one holding out on us, right? right. Matthew nine twenty nine. according to our faith, let it be unto us. We're the ones according to our faith and according to how we how we believe in it's going to happen deter- that determine how we receive from God, not him. So, but in that process, however long that process is that Ash is describing, whether it's seconds, whether you're receiving from God instantaneously, or whether there's, there is a period of time, we can become weary. But what I want to talk about today is that the fact that we can have peace in the process. So no matter, no matter where we are in that process, our minds can be in perfect peace. Last time we talked about the combination of faith and patience. In Hebrews 6 verse 12, it says that by faith and patience, we inherit the promises. We talked about faith, patience not being this, oh my goodness, drudgery, drearery, dre- dreary. Dreary. We get, we're making some new words up today. <laughs> But a toil, a labor, mm-hmm. but actually patience is a confident endurance. It is a cheerful expectation that something amazing is happening. And we can come into a place where we have absolute confidence that we know that the minute we spoke the word, it is in the creation phase and, and we can be giving God glory and thanks that we know that our manifestation is a guarantee. It's not a maybe, right? It's not a wait and see. It's not a, you know, if you do better at, okay? God's promises are always yes and amen. And what that'll do is that'll give us peace and confidence because we know that something amazing is happening. We just can't see it yet. We've talked about how in the creation phase, the minute between the confession and manifestation, you have the creation in the middle. That's the bit that's invisible. But we can have full confidence knowing that the word of God that's been spoken from our mouth is producing something. It's just working in an area at the moment where we can't see it yet. That's why it's not manifest yet. Mm -hmm. It's not in the physical yet. But we know something is happening. But I want to look at some scriptures here because we we can have peace in the process. And it's in the process, that in-between phase, that people get weary and they lose heart and they get discouraged. But when we press into the things of God, and it really is a pressing, you know, in Hebrews it talks about we have to labor to enter the rest that God has given us. You know, this is interesting because um, one of the first times that, that peace is, is, is mentioned is, is in, in Genesis. And it's, the, it's on the seventh day. You know, the number seven mm-hmm. is the number of completion. Wow. Well, on the seventh Seventh day, God, having created everything, he rested. His first, you know, Adam's first job, a day on the job, was a day off, wow. was to rest. And God didn't rest because he was tired. Right? He was rested like, because he was, he was finished. Out. God, you know, he created everything in six days. He was worn out. He wasn't, he wasn't resting because he was tired. He was mm-hmm. resting because it was complete. There's nothing more to That's do. That's right. If you're painting a picture, you get to the point where it's just perfect. It's like, one more brush stroke isn't needed. That's it. It's, you just rest. You step back and it's finished. And that's how God felt about creation. It was perfect and he rested. He, he yeah. took a step back and rested. And, you know, we've been through so many different scriptures. And if, you, if this is the first program that you're tuning in, I just encourage you to go back and listen to the rest, okay? But we can have confidence. We speak the word of God and then we enter into his rest. Because in faith, when we're in faith and we speak the word in faith, There is peace in faith. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this in Hebrews um, 4. This whole chapter of Hebrews 4 is talking about the rest that God gives us when we're in faith. Okay, so it's it's talking about, it's giving some examples here of of Joshua and the promised land. You know, um, the Israelites, when when they came out of Egypt, there were many of them that couldn't enter into the promised land because of their unbelief. God was trying to give them rest. He was trying to give them a, the promised land, a promise. He was trying to make his promise manifest to them. But there were many of them that couldn't enter in because of unbelief. Look at this in um, 
Verse 4, it says, For he spoke somewhere about the seventh day like this, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. God rested, okay, because things were complete. Mm-hmm. Um, and again in the present passage, he said, They shall not enter my rest. Theref- since therefore it remains for some to enter, some of the children of, of Israel could enter, and they to whom it was first preached did not enter due to their unbelief. This is referring to the to the spies that came back and 10 came back with a negative report and two came back with a positive Joshua report. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua so, and Caleb. So, they came, so basically they saw the same things. They, they went the to the promised things. land to spy it out. God had told them, this is your land. So they went to spy it out. They, all 12 spies saw the same things, but they came back and 10 spies saw it negatively. They saw it like, this is no, there's no way we can do this. And two spies come back like, we're well able. Let's go and take mm-hmm. this land. And that's the difference in our hearts. What, how is your heart seeing things? How are you believing? Are you believing that things are just too much? Or are you believing that we've got all things are possible for those who believe? There's a big difference. There is. And that mindset was the very determining factor that, entered, that determined whether they could enter into the promised land or not. They all saw the same circumstances. Actually, it's dead right. But only some of them could enter in because of how they saw those challenges. Some of them saw them as a challenge that could not be overcome. These giants are massive, too big. They're, they're, they're going to kill us. Others, you know, Joshua and Caleb, it says they had a different spirit within mm. them. They saw the same giants, but they saw them as an opportunity. Yeah. An opportunity. They were excited. They were inherited the, the promises of God with faith and patience. Right? That's the difference, that, that, that cheerful expectation, that, that endurance, some, something good, something amazing is going to happen. Watch God defeat these giants on our behalf. That was their attitude. But it, this carries on. It says, so they could not, the other people, they could, the, who, um, to whom it was first preached, they could not enter due to their unbelief. They couldn't see past the natural circumstances. All they could see was the negative. And sometimes, you know, in the period between when we confess the word of God and we see it, and when we see it manifest in our natural, bo- in our in our bodies, whether it's a healing, whether it's a provision, an answer to prayer, in whatever way, we can be tempted to only look at the natural circumstances. And this is where some of those children of Israel were, and they, they because of their unbelief, they couldn't enter into the rest that God was trying to get to them. So he said they could not enter in due to their unbelief. And he establishes a certain day, day saying, Today, saying um, through David after so long a time, it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice and not harden your hearts, okay, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have later spoken of another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. For whoever enters his rest will also cease from his own works, as God did from his on the seventh day. Let us labor, therefore, to enter that rest, lest anyone fall by the same pattern of unbelief. You see, unbelief comes by a pattern. It is a way of thinking. It's not that we just wake up one day and think, oh, this faith stuff doesn't work. We're going to have to go and get a new Bible. We're going to have to go get a new preacher or a new church. Or we're just going to have to go get a whole new religion. Or we're going to have to go try something else because this doesn't work. No, unbelief is a pattern. It is a way of thinking. It is little seeds of doubt that get sown over time in our hearts and start to take, take fruit, take root rather, and bear fruit. Last time we talked about uh, the parable of the sower and how in, in Luke um, 8, 15, how in the fourth type of ground, they were the people that took the word of God and they held on to it with faith and patience and planted the word in the, of God in their heart and it bore, and it bared fruit, right? Mm-hmm. Bore fruit. Well, here, you know, unbelief bears fruit the same way. It comes by seeds. It comes by seeds of negativity. And, of, and you are the most susceptible to this pattern of unbelief in the period of waiting. I hate mm-hmm. saying that, but you know what I mean? That period of time between when you speak the word of God and when you see it manifest. Because during that time, in the creation phase, you know, confession, creation, and manifestation, we can't see what's going on oftentimes. We can't see the seed that's been sown germinating below the soil. And so we are susceptible to thinking, to just looking at the natural, which doesn't look like very much is going on. That, that can, if we're not careful, can develop in us a pattern of unbelief, a certain way of thinking that, that leads to a lack of peace. And, you know, it says here, let us labor, therefore, to enter the rest. You know, it's a fight, isn't it, to stay in the rest of God? It's kind of an oxymoron. 
It's a the good labor, fight. It's, we labor and we're fighting. We're working to enter rest. It's a good fight of faith, you know. Yeah. And uh, basically it's because we're so programmed to perform and to do certain things before we'd be good enough to receive from God, whereas the gospel turns that all on its head. You know mm -hmm. what Jesus did? He paid the price for us. He took on our sin. He took on our sickness. He took on our poverty. He took on our anxiety. And we now, just through our relationship with Jesus, get all those things as a free gift. We take on Jesus' righteousness. We take on Jesus' health and healing. We take on Jesus' prosperity. We take on Jesus' peace. So we don't have to do anything. We don't mm -hmm. have to make it happen. It's already happened. What we have to do, the only labor we have to do, if you like, the only fight we have to fight is the good fight to stay in his rest. We have to fight to stay in the rest of yeah. God because if we're not careful, our human nature and our religious mindset, we'll end up trying to make it happen ourselves right. and get back into works and get back into the law and say, if I perform well enough, if I do certain things, if I pray enough and read my Bible enough, I'll be worthy. No, we pray and read the Bible because we want to, because it's a good thing to do. But none of that makes you worthy to receive the promises of God. The only thing that makes you worthy to receive the promises of God is believing that Jesus has already done it. He's believing that Jesus has already done it for us. That's the only thing. Jesus makes us worthy. Because we accept Jesus now, that's why we're made worthy. So we have to labor to stay in that position. We have to labor and make sure we are staying in the position. You know, Jesus plus nothing is all we need. Mm -hmm. Jesus plus any of our own works uh, equals nothing. We, we void what Jesus has done by trying to make it happen ourselves. So that's why we have to labor to stay in that rest. Because it's a battle sometimes. Our natural mind, sometimes religion, some churches, some ministries will teach us that you have to do all these things. You know, in Paul's day, it was you have to be circumcised, or you have to only eat certain foods, or you have to follow these traditions, or you have to follow these holidays. I'm telling you, all of that is works, it's labor for the wrong reasons. The only way we receive from God is through Jesus. Jesus yeah, yeah. alone. And that's how it works. So we have to labor to stay in that position of resting in what yeah. Christ has already done. Resting in the finished work of the cross is what we have to do. Amen. You know, sometimes people ask me, is it wrong to pray for somebody more than once or to pray for a situation more than one time? Is that showing a lack of faith or is it showing unbelief? Um, and, and here's how I like to look at this. It really depends on our motivation mm -hmm. because we're all about, you know, we speak the word, we confess the word, we sow a seed of faith one time and then we know that there is peace and rest in that faith. That means we've labored to enter the rest and then we rest. We've sown the word. We can have absolute confidence that, that God is working on our behalf, that it's going on in this, in, in, behind the scenes where we can't see and we just wait. So does it, is it therefore it, with that same mentality, unbelief, to, to pray more than once? Well, I like to think of it like this. There is examples in the scriptures of where Jesus prayed for the same, same person more than one time. He prayed for them twice. It depends on, so it's not a sin to pray for people twice, okay, for, for, to speak the same thing twice. Really, what we're looking at here is what is our motivation behind doing that. So are we trusting in our prayers? Right. Now, this is, this is subtle because it's very easy to do this. We can actually trust in our own prayers rather than trust in the person we're praying to. Yes. And, you know, a lot of time we can end up saying, well, we're praying the right prayers. And, and I, I know what you're saying. I, I've met people and I've been guilty of it myself that we, we pray a certain amount of time. And if we pray a certain way and if we, we keep pray praying, long enough or hard praying, enough keep praying, or keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, and eventually we'll wear God down. I used to believe this before I understood the truth. We'll wear God down and eventually he'll have to just give in. You know, we'll try to twist his arm. That's what a lot of prayer chains are about. It's like what our kids do with us. I mean, it's like <laughs> they ask and ask and ask and ask. And after a while, I'm just so tired. I'm like, You're just, so distracted, you I'm just like, say just, yes. Just have it already. <laughs> it's like it's how not to parent one on one. <laughs> but you know, God's not like that. God is waiting to say yes. God is waiting to give to us. He's the biggest giver. He's waiting to give, for, to, give to us. So it's not about us trying to wear God down. It's not about us uh, saying long prayers. In fact, some of those the most powerful prayers I've ever prayed have been the shortest prayers. Been like, Jesus, help. It's been like, be gone and, and things like the shortest prayers. So, you know, when Jesus prayed, if you look through the Gospels and, and watch how Jesus prayed, oftentimes Jesus prayed very short prayers. Yep, short prayers. You know, when Hannah, our daughter Hannah was healed, it was a very short prayer. Mm -hmm. It was just a life to your body, curse the disease, done. And a lot of the time, a short prayer is a prayer of faith. Sometimes a long prayer, I'm guilty of this, we keep praying and keep praying until we see something happen or until we feel like we've prayed enough to get God's attention. Yeah. That's religion, that's, that's works, that is not the, the right thing to do. So I know what you're saying, Carly, that it can be, it's about an attitude, it's about where our trust is. Right. And we can pray over and over if our trust is in God. 
oh, we can, you know, by praying twice it might be wrong because we're putting our trust in our prayers. Do we believe God heard us the first time? Mm -hmm. You know, what is our motivation for praying a second time? I pray for people a lot, mm -hmm. amen, and, and sometimes I'll pray for people and especially in the area of healing, maybe, maybe most of
sudden, the demon spirit that had come into her spoke up out of her mouth, of her voice, and said, no, she didn't. She went in there because she wanted to. And when she came into our territory, we had the right to come into her. And it came in through her mind. Now, you can repeat that over and over and over. I've seen many people delivered. And the story is usually always the same. They played with a Ouija board. They read tarot cards. They went to an X-rated movie. They went to this. They went to that. They played with this. They dabbled in this. Satan has to gain entrance through the mind first before he can come in and possess all of you. And it's in stages. You say, Pastor Cole, why are you getting into this? Because the, the modern day church, pop culture church, doesn't understand these things. They understand psychology, but they don't understand demon possession. They don't understand how the devil works. So Satan has to get a foothold in your mind. I, I, I saw a, a situation where we administered deliverance to uh, uh, some people, uh, children, adults, all kinds of people. And when you find out what happened, they opened themselves up to some kind of demonic influence. And the demons always come. It can be just false doctrine. It can be a lie. It can be enticement. It can be some kind of um, wrong thinking, wrong book, watching the wrong thing, running around with the wrong people. Politicians imbibe the wrong spirit. They get a wrong thought in their mind. Uh, if, if you watch enough television and go to enough movies and watch social media and all that kind of stuff, you will probably wind up being one of the most confused people on the planet. Satan has to get a foothold in the mind first. That's the battleground. And he does it with thoughts. The first thing he does is seed a thought to you, a thought about committing suicide. I ministered deliverance to a lot of people uh, pastoring over 37 years. And when people would come in, I would say, did you ever have a thought of taking your own life? Did you ever have a thought of driving down the street and turning the car into a telephone pole, running off an embankment? And some would say, yeah, I did. Where'd that come from? I said, it came from a demon spirit. And here's the way the devil operates. There's, I, I think I used to teach five or seven steps to possession. The number one step the devil has is the thought. The thought has to come. Kill somebody, rape somebody, steal from somebody, knock somebody in the head, take this pill, go over here, do this. The first thought is, is, is what Satan puts in there. Now, let me just say to you, the thought itself is not sin. You haven't sinned just because you had a thought. But the second step is meditation on the thought. Now, you're get, this is where it gets dangerous. Because as you meditate on that thought, as you go back and watch that, that pornography again, as you steal again, as you smoke another uh, uh, joint, marijuana, as you take another drug, take another drink, if you go back to that bar, if you, go, if you keep meditating on it, then the next step is action. The first step is the thought. Second step is the action. You haven't sinned until you act on it now. You know, the scriptures where Jesus told uh, the hearers, he said, if you, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You know why he said that? He, now, the thought itself is not sin. But what happens is the thought is, here's, here's the thought. If I had the chance to commit adultery with that man or that woman, I would do it. Then you don't even have to commit the act because you've already done it in your heart. You were saying, if I had the chance, if I had the opportunity, I would do it. Then he said, you don't even have to commit the act because you've already said in your heart you would do it. And therefore, unto you, it's sin. The action part 
is is built and you know compiled on thought after thought after thought after thought. Why do you think Hollywood, television, media, why do you think that they keep throwing the same thoughts, the same ideology, the same doctrines at us? They don't know they're doing it. It's it's demonic. It's to get you to believe it. Why do you think advertisers keep showing the same commercial over, over, and over, and over, and over? It's repetition. They're teaching you. They're branding you with this thought. I have seen Tom Selleck do that ad for AIG um, reverse mortgages so many times. I, I started turning it off, muting it. I can almost quote him word for word. I know what you're thinking. I had the same thoughts. <laughs> you got to realize he's getting paid big dollars. He's an actor. But yet he is seeding you with an idea. He's getting you to think a certain way. A con man has to gain your confidence. They have to con you into believing something that's wrong. I'm telling you all this so you'll know how wrong thoughts enter into the mind. When you hear politicians tell you the same thing over and over, it's, it's called managing expectations. They're setting you up. They're priming you. They're telling you something they want you to believe. It may or may not be true. But if they can get you to believe it by hearing it enough over and over and over and over, one of the issues de we're dealing with today in our culture and have for years is climate change. And there are people that will absolutely swear that human involvement in the climate is destroying the planet and you can't convince them any different. I know people that believe the world is flat and they will prove it to you. Now, I've even had people tell me out of the Bible that it proves that the world is flat. They have believed the flat earth society. You can go online and pull it up. <laughs> Just because you can get somebody to believe something doesn't make it right. But that's the way the process is. Advertisers, they know that if they advertise something enough times over and over and over and over, mail order, people that use mail, even preachers, even Christians, if they mail something. I've been on mailing lists, oh my goodness, got to be decades. I sent one offering. I got on that mailing list. I've never sent anything else. I still get the letters. I still get the letters over and over. Why? Because the law of averages, if you get that letter enough times, marketers know this, you're going to respond. I went to the post office years ago, got all the junk mail out of my box, took it up to the counter, and I said, I want to send all of this mail back to the sender, telling them to remove me from, my, from their mailing list. And the guy behind the counter said, well, you'll have to pull the, pay the postage. I said, I'll gladly do it. Several dollars worth of postage at that time. This was probably 10, 20 years ago. I said, I want to send it back. He said, you'll have to pay the postage. I, I said, okay, I'll pay the postage. Then he said, but we don't really want you to do that. I said, why not? He said, this is where the post office makes all its money is junk mail. We don't want them to stop sending you their junk mail, because that's <laughs> where we make our money. Oh, my goodness. Everybody knows the law of averages, just repeating it, repeating it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. That's the way the devil works. He seeds you with a wrong thought. He seeds you with a wrong doctrine. He makes you believe the wrong thing. And when you take it, when you imbibe it, when you take ownership of it, make it your own, it comes into you, and you become that thought. Now, let me go back and read you some scripture. 2 Timothy 4. Well, I tell you what, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want you to read with me verse 11. And for this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, God's doing this because these are people. It, it, I should have read the previous verses. 
It says the mystery of iniquity doth already work. This is verse 7. The mystery of iniquity. Um, and only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This is the apostasy. Go down to verse 3 or back to verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day, day of apostasy, apostasy day of rebellion, uh, shall not come except there come first a falling away. So we're in that day now, the falling away, the apostasy, the backsliding, the rebellion against authority. And he said, that's the mystery of iniquity. It's already working. And he says, because those people are going to believe a lie, it says God is going to allow them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. This is a willful thing. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now go back over to Romans and you'll see in the book of Romans chapter 1 and let's go to um, verse 24. Well, I tell you what, let's back up to verse 21. Because they, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, foolish in their heart, a heart were darkened, professing themselves wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds, four-footed beasts and creeping things. Dr. Summerall told me one time he was over in India and he was watching this man fix uh, one of their false gods. It was, it was a, a shrine. It was like a totem pole. And there were all kinds of faces and birds and wings and stuff. So he watched the guy and he went over to him. This is what Brother Summerall was. He was very inquisitive. He walked over and he said, what are you doing to this workman? He said, I am fixing my God. And Brother Summerall said, you made your God. He said, yes, I made my God. He said, and demons come and worship here. He knew. <laughs> he knew that what he had built was a false idol. But people still came and still do today. So he said they changed the incorruptible, uncorruptible God into a corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. God also gave them up to uncleanness. Listen to this. Through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves and change the truth of God into a lie. He's talking about homosexuality. He said, for this God, cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. Now, this is not hate speech. This is in Romans chapter 1. This is the Bible. God's trying to show us how Satan works. He has to get a wrong thought into your mind. And most of the reason that we uh, take wrong thoughts is because of pride, self-centeredness, pleasure. We don't even think about it, how it compares to the Word of God. Uh, he turns them over here in verse 28, and it says, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now, that's their will. They made a decision here. So, he turned them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What is a reprobate mind? It's a mind that's void of judgment. It's a mind that doesn't really know how to think. Go over to uh, Proverbs. And I want to show you something. Go over to the first chapter of Proverbs. And I want you to listen to the language here. Because so many people are blaming God when God is giving you the right to make your own decisions. Listen to this. This is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. Because I have called and you refused, I've stretched out my hand, no man regarded. You have set it not all my counsel. You would take none of my reproof. Therefore, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when fear cometh. 
When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction comes as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish comes upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for they hated knowledge. Did you get that? They wouldn't take his word. They hated knowledge. They did not choose the word of the Lord. They would not have my counsel. And they despised all my reproof. These are willful actions on the part of the people. Therefore, when you see the word therefore, Charles Capps used to always say, see what it's there for. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. So you can't blame God for that. That's not God's fault. He tried to warn them. He rebuked them. He chastised them. He loved them. But they refused. That's apostasy. That's the rebellion against authority. And what it does is it drives you down and down and down and down and down. And these people were like that. that that's what they had done. They refused God's correction. They would not hear what he had to say. They stoned the prophets. They didn't want to know. God. So he turned them over to a reprobate mind to do whatever they wanted to do. And that's what God has to do. That's what he has done. AIDS is not the judgment of the homosexual community. AIDS is the recompense of the reward. It's the hardest of sowing wrong seeds. It's, it's the wrong thoughts that have been germinated and are coming up. A falling away, the apostasy, is the rebellion against authority, the mystery of iniquity. Uh, let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 4, and I think it uses, yeah, I think I read this earlier. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, uh, but they will... After their own lusts, did you hear that? After their own lusts, they'll heap to themselves, teaching, having itching ears. They shall be turned away from the truth and turned into fables, fairy tales. So you wonder why people are so messed up? It's because they have refused the truth and they've been turned into fairy tales. Um, that's where you get what we started with. Evil is good. Good is evil. Isaiah said, woe unto those that call evil good and good evil. Now, let's answer the question. What's wrong with wrong? What's wrong with wrong? A lot of people today, pastors, ministry leaders, church members, they don't want to say anything's wrong. I guess they feel like they'll get scolded for being pessimistic or intolerant. <laughs> oh, how many years ago, 10, 12, 15 years ago, I was doing a meeting down in Fort Worth, Texas, and the, the uh, host pastor was taking me back to his house. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and said that there's a word coming up that you need to, or two words coming up that you need to know about. Study them out. And he said, the biggest one is intolerance. He said, you're going to see the total perversion of that word, intolerance. And, the, and he said, and the next one is community service. And I thought, man, that is so strange. What do you mean by that, Lord? Community service. And he said this to me. He said, it is unscriptural. to substitute community service for the anointing. Now listen again. It is unscriptural to substitute community service for the anointing. He didn't say that community service was wrong. The Bible doesn't teach that it's wrong. The Bible encourages us to be involved in the community and to help people, to be light and salt. He didn't say community service was wrong. He said the substitution of it for the anointing is what's wrong. 
You're supposed to have the anointing in your life, in your church, in your ministry. You're not supposed to be a benevolent ministry per se. It doesn't take the anointing to paint somebody's house, build some steps, sweep off the sidewalk. And there's nothing wrong with doing any of those things unless you are substituting it for the anointing. When you clean the anointing out of your church, you clean the gifts of the spirit out of your church, you clean the anointing out of the church and you substitute community service, you're missing God. And then intolerance or tolerance, God said tolerance is going to be used abusively. And it has been. Now we'll continue this tomorrow. Be sure and join me. Right and wrong thinking. And remember Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and wherever you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily live Bible study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily live Bible study five days a week. You know, I've got great news for those of you who've been wanting to partake of Keras, but you just can't move. You can't seem to uh, find how to fit it into your schedule. We now have what we call e on this little iPad, and you get all of the first-year courses here. There's a total of 39 courses, eight hours teaching per course. So that, I think, is 312 hours worth of teaching. It's loaded on here so that you don't have to have an Internet connection. It comes with headphones, wireless headphones, and this way you can take advantage of the first year of CARES curriculum, whatever your situation is. And you can interact with our staff, you take tests, they know where you are in this process. It's just a great way to take advantage of it. Check it out, eCARES. Welcome to our broadcast. My name is Larry Hutton. This is Limitless Life, and we are going to learn some more wonderful truths today that's just so relevant, so helpful, so uplifting that we can go out and have a fun and happy and fulfilled life, and it's all about Jesus, the real Jesus, not the religious one. Man, when you learn about the real Jesus, you find out, okay, I can have a fun, happy, fulfilled life. I can actually take all the limits off my uh, off my life because Jesus lives in me. I live in him and now I can start walking in God's ways and thinking God's thoughts and and I can actually have the blessings of heaven in my life while I'm on the earth. I you know I heard everything growing up I heard everything was just wait till the end, brother. Wait till the everybody said the sweet by and by. Now I understand that the sweet 
by and by, the by and by meaning the life after we leave here and go to heaven, that's going to be sweet. I realize that. But God wanted the sweet here and now, (laughs) not just the sweet by and by. He wanted me living sweet in the here and now. And he made a way. And he even said it. He said, I've come that you might have life, have it abundantly. He didn't say, I've come so that you can have life after you die. That's the biggest part of it because we're going to spend eternity with him. And that's a lot longer than this 100 years or however long you live down here. But life begins the moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's when God's life is in you for eternity and you can start partaking of it now. But you have to learn how. And that's what a lot of Christians never do. I didn't for many, many years. So I never partook of the good life, the blessed life, the happy life, the fun life in God. Listen, God knows more about F-U-N than any human being. Human beings will do everything they can do apart from God to to have fun. And their fun is so fleeting and just doesn't last. But man, I've been having so much fun as a child of God. So much fun in my life, so much happiness, so much fulfillment, so much contentment. I mean, wow, I, I, I love life to the fullest. And it doesn't matter what people do. Not even my wife's spouse, not even my friends. Not, whatever people do is not going to rob me of the fun and happiness and fulfillment and joy that God's given me. And you can live that kind of life all the time. It's not, you know, we say it's a mindset. Well, it is because when your mind is renewed, then you can be set to walk in God's word and God's ways and it'll it'll really bless you. But it's more than a mindset. It's a heart set. It's a, a spirit set. It's a real you. The real you is an eternal being. So, yeah, you are spirit, but that spirit is an eternal being. It's more real than this physical body that you have right now. So, um, God wants you to live in this kind of life all the time. And that's what we're talking about all the time, no matter what we teach on. In fact, the series we're doing right now, I love this series because it touches so many different areas of our lives. So let's get back into this. We started this series four months ago, uh, which means now we're into our fifth month. This is our 17th week. This is going to be our 82nd lesson. So if you've just joined us, man, go back and listen to the archives. Um, you'll want to get a hold of this for sure. Uh, 81 lessons up till now in all of these things. Uh, It's a three-part series. So part A, part B, and part C, A, B, C. I call it the ABCs of true Christianity. And part A being, uh, who are you in Christ Jesus? What has God uh, already made you? And then part B, the second part of the series, is what God has given you. What do you already have being a child of God? And then part C is, what has God called you to do? What's your purpose in life? What are you here for? What, is, what has God enabled you to do because of who you are and what you have? So this, this three-part series, um, you take this as a Christian and learn these three things, three areas, which includes so much. That's why we're in our 82nd lesson. And we're going to be doing so many more. But you learn all of this stuff. You will have such a foundation of Christ-like. Then you will be a Christian. (laughs) Christ-like is what Christian means, right? So Christ-like, he he walked in victory. I mean, he even even said this when he was on the earth, when they were trying to find him, to crucify him, wanting to kill him. He said to them, he said, listen, no man can take my life from me. He said, I have the power to lay it down, which is what he did when he went to the cross. He had to lay it down because no man could take it from him. No man couldn't kill him. Even all the whippings and beatings and everything, they could not kill Jesus. He had to lay his life down. He said, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. No man can take it from me. So uh, think about that type of authority and power that God's given us as children of the Most High God. Well, the first six weeks we did cover 23 things that God has made you, and then the last 10 weeks, now into our 11th week, we've been covering Part B of what has God given you. <clears throat> our foundation text is found in 1 John 4:17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. And we've been zeroing in on as He is, 
so are we in this world and what that means. So uh, part B of our series is what we're in right now. The second part is part B, and that's what God has given you. So far, we have found out, number one, <clears throat> God has given you Jesus. He's given you himself. And we went into a lot of detail about what does that mean. It's, it's a lot more than just the words God gave you, Jesus. Boy, there's a lot of understanding about that one. Number two, God has given you the same anointing that he gave Jesus, which means that anointing will destroy yoke, remove burdens, set the captives free, and set you free as well. So he's given you the same anointing that he gave Jesus. Number three, God has given you his Zoe. What does that mean? His very life is living, not just his life is inside you, but it's actually living inside you. Wow, that's the kind of life you want to partake of. Number four, God has given you a team, a permanent position on that team, and then God put himself on your team. That is a team that is unbeatable. That's the team that God gave you. Whew. Man, that's good. Number five, God has given you his love. And when 1 Corinthians 13, when God said love never fails, that was not written specifically to marriages. I know we use it when we're doing teaching on marriages and relationships. God's love never fails. And so we go through all those verses four through eight. But when God said, when God said love never fails, he was letting us know that, listen, love is a force. Love is a force that's got to be reckoned with, and it will never fail. It'll never um, pass away. It'll never get weak. It'll never stop. It's just going to be. It's going to just keep going and going and going. So, when when you and I understand God has given me His love, and love never fails, then that means I can partake of that that He's given me, so that I don't have failures in my life. And I'm talking about in every area of my life, not just my relationships, but in every area. Love never, remember God is love. So God never fails. And he'll never fail you in your finances. So love never fails in your finances if you learn to partake of this powerful force that's available. Number six, God has given you the Holy Spirit. You ought to be partaking of his help every day. He's, Jesus said he was another comforter. So even though Jesus was the comforter when he was on the earth, Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter when I leave. And so after he left, he sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter, but he's so much more, and we learned a lot about what that means. Number seven, God has given you his weapons and his armor. That is powerful. When you understand every... Now, we have to fight battles in life. We have to go through tests and trials and hardships, which means... You know, we're going to fight. But the Bible tells us in Timothy we're supposed to fight the good fight of faith, right? So I'm not supposed to be fighting just to fight. I'm not just supposed to be, like Paul said, swinging and beating in the air with, you know, with no purpose in mind. No, I'm supposed to be striving for the mastery, man. I'm sp supposed to be striving to win. I'm going to win my battle. But God has given me his weapons and his armors to win with. So I can use God's weapons and God's armor. Listen, God's weapons and God's armor, they are supernatural. They are all mighty. They're part of God. So you're not going to lose with God's weapons and armor. Number eight, God has already given you everything you need to live a fun, happy, fulfilled life. And we've been talking about that. We talked about a lot of scriptures that show us God has already given me everything that I need. So if I'm not living a fun life, if I'm not living a happy life, if I'm not living a fulfilled life, I need to go back through the scriptures that we've already looked at and see, all right, so I need to put my faith in what Jesus did concerning that, 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 and then I can start living a fun life. I can start living a happy life. I can start living a fulfilled life. Hallelujah. Number nine, God has given you all of heaven's authority and the power to back it up. So that's why God's given us authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing can hurt us if we understand we have this authority and, and heaven's power backing us up. And, of course, we have to release our faith in that. Uh, number 10, God has given you nine attributes of his character. Really, he's given you nine attributes of himself. Um, love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, 
gentleness, self-control, those nine fruit of the Spirit are part of God Himself, part of His attributes. And He's given you those things. You have love. You have joy. You have peace. You have patience. You have kindness. You have goodness. You have God's faith. And you have God's faithfulness. And you have God's gentleness. And you have God's self-control, temperance or self-control. Uh, number 11, God has given you the name. You are, we found out you're actually called by that name, but you've been given the name. That's why when Peter got a revelation of that, he said, such as I have, give I thee. And he used that name of Jesus and caused miracles and healings to take place. Number 12, God has given you the word. The word is powerful. It is alive. It will never let you down. It'll never fail you. It won't return void. Even if you've been standing, like some people say, standing on the word, or like Ephesians says, standing on the word, uh, you've been doing that, you haven't seen anything happen, don't you quit. Don't you quit. God's word has been given to you and it will not fail you. Number 12 or number 13, God has given you the blood. God's given you the blood of Jesus as your own personal eternal sacrifice. So just like the blood washed you clean, the blood will keep you clean, but you have to put faith in the blood to get born again and you have to put faith in the blood to keep clean. So you, so you keep using that cleansing because, you know, you're going to screw up. <laughs> you're going to do things that say things that come across wrong. And it's amazing how no matter how uh, long we've been walking with God, you still end up saying stupid things or doing stupid things. And you think, oh, God, my God, thank you for the blood, because that blood was given for my sins past present and thank God future. Of course, when the blood was given, it was all future sin because I wasn't even born yet. So thank God that his blood does cover future sins as well. But I'm forgiven of past sins and present sins and future sins because of the blood. And so it's a sacrifice that is eternal once and for all. Number 14, God has given you full access to his presence, full access to his throne anytime, anywhere, for anything. He's given you that access. That belongs to you, man. You have, you have the golden ticket. <laughs> you have the golden key, man. Access anytime. Just walk right in. Amen. And we talked about all that. Number 15, God has given you total freedom and liberty for you to live your life. Total freedom. God has already given you freedom. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He's already given you freedom. He's already given you liberty. You've been liberated from all bondage. Spirit, soul, body, financial, every part. Every part you've been liberated. Number 16, God has given you angels. And I love this one because we went into a lot of different scriptures. But God's actually given you angels when you were either born or as a little child. We saw scripture didn't specify exactly when it happened, but at, when you were born or as a little tiny child, you were given angels, uh, plural, not just one, but you were given angels and they stay with you, we found out, through the rest of your life on earth as your help. They help you. Wow, they're assigned to help you. And number 17, God has given you a pathway to brighter tomorrows and a wonderful future. This is the one we're actually on, we're discussing right now, been discussing the last couple of programs, that God has given you a way, a pathway to brighter tomorrows and a wonderful future. So maybe your past has been hellish, maybe your present is hellish, but you need to put your faith out there. That's why we're learning these things. You need to believe God, because if you'll believe God, then your tomorrows can be brighter and your future can be wonderful. All right, well, we ended in Psalm 18, verse 30, last program. Let's just reread that real quick. David made this statement in the psalm. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. This psalm is actually taken from uh, a song that David wrote that's recorded in 2 Samuel. So he said, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield 
to all those who trust in him. So now we're going to turn to the actual psalm that was written, and we'll see this verse in there as well. But let's turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 22. I want to read three verses, 31, 32, and 33, which is part of, we're not going to read the whole song. It would do you good. You'd be blessed to do that. But right now we're just zeroing in on this, this way, this pathway that God's made us for brighter tomorrows and a wonderful future. Look at um, verse 31, 2 Samuel 22, verse 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. That's what we just read there in Psalm 18, verse 30. So here he says the same thing. Of course, this is where the psalm came from. But he says, as for God, and we're talking about our God. Now, David knew him as a God far away. David knew him as a God that, you know, you can't touch him and you can't, talk to him personally, you know, face to face. You can't have him living in you. You can't, you know, you can't uh, know real, real blessing until you die. But, but you and I, we have it so much better off than David did. So much better off. Back when I was even studying David one time when it said David was a man after God's own heart, I started looking all of the sins in David's life and the terrible decisions he made and the failures and the mistakes and the fears and all of the works of darkness that Satan worked in David's life. <clears throat> and I, so I, I couldn't reconcile, wait a minute, David, a man after God's own heart. And look, he, he cheated. He, he committed adultery. He lied. He killed people. He, he did all these terrible things. And so then I realized when I studied it all out, I found out that when it says God's, uh, David was a man after God's own heart, it didn't mean that it's a, it's a person that you and I are supposed to follow his ways. What it was talking about is when David missed it, he was a man that would quickly repent. And that's the man after God's own heart. He had a repentant heart. He had a heart that was towards God. And so that even though he kept screwing up and living in sin, he had a heart that would come back to God. And so that's, that's what it means, a man, after David, a, a man after God's own heart. So if we miss it because we love God, man, repent, get your heart right back with God and, and keep walking in his ways. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock? except our God. In other words, a rock meaning a foundation that won't fall apart. We won't fall apart in life when he's our rock, right? Then he says in verse 33, God is my strength. God is my power. And he makes my way perfect. So we see in verse 31, God's way is perfect. We see in verse 33, he makes my way. Remember, we found out this word way is the uh, Hebrew word derek, D-E-R-E-K. So derek, and it means a course of life, a mode of action. It's plural. So it's not just talking about one way. Remember, God has many ways. He has a way for your marriage, a way for your finances, a way for your physical health, a way for your emotions, a way in every area of your life. You can take the limits off, limitless life, right? And so God's way is perfect, and he makes my way perfect. And so my way is made perfect because he's already given me this way, but I have to partake of that. I have to walk in the way. The, the New Testament calls it working out your salvation. You've been given the salvation. Work it out. Walk it out, right? Walk by faith and not by sight. But I want you to notice three things in this verse, in verse 31. As for God, his way, underline circle, highlight that those two words, his way is perfect. Then I want you to underline the word of the Lord. So those two words, the word, underline that, highlight it or circle it, is his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. I want you to underline those three words, trust in him. Notice God's way, look, look what you have underlined now, God's way, God's word, and faith in God. Tr trust in God. That's faith in God. 
God's way, God's word, and faith are all connected. And that comes before verse 33, he makes my way perfect. Uh Aha. So, yeah, he does indeed make my way perfect, but in order for me to walk in that way, then I have to believe, and that is a verb, that's a, a verb that, that denotes action. So I have to do something with the word because his, his way is perfect and he makes my way perfect. His way is supposed to be my way. And so I've got to use the word to walk in that way. And that means I've got to trust or exercise my faith in his word to walk in his ways. Are you getting this? I hope I'm making this easy to turn to because God's ways are perfect and we can. We've already gone to Isaiah 55. If you weren't with us that lesson, we already studied out Isaiah 55 verse 8 where, you know, God said, my ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and your ways. But then we read the whole passage and found out God said, but you can know my thoughts and you can walk in my ways if you'll learn my word because my word contains my word, contains my uh, ways and it contains my thoughts and my word won't return void. So if you'll take hold of it, if you'll learn it, it'll just be like rain that comes to the earth or snow that falls down and brings forth fruit in, in the earth's life. My word will do the same thing in your life. It'll bring my thoughts and my ways to you. So we can know God's thoughts and ways and his ways are perfect and his word is tried. You know, this, this says in verse um, tw- uh, 31, his word is proven. The, new, new, uh, the King James says tried is proven. That means it's already been proven out. It's already been tried over and over and over by many people and it worked for them. And so now God's saying, listen, I've already proven it out. I've already tried it in many people's lives. So it's already proven for you. It's already a tried thing, man. It'll work. And it's a shield. God's word is a shield. That's good news. And when it, when it says shield, it doesn't just say shield in one area. So man, take the limits off your life. Limitless life, man. Shield. He's a shield. God's word is a shield, and God is a shield to me. His way is a shield to me. God, his way, his word is a shield to all who trust in him. Wow, that's cool. I'll tell you what, let's jump over to Proverbs 13. I think this is a good time to deal with this one right here. Proverbs 13, 18. Hallelujah. Proverbs 13, 18, we're talking about that God has made, uh, God has given you brighter tomorrows and a wonderful future. All right. So Proverbs 13, 18, it says poverty and shame will come to him who disdains. The King James says refuses. Uh, New King James that I'm reading from here says disdains correction. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains or refuses correction. So that's talking about If you refuse God's word, if you refuse to be instructed by God's word, you refuse to be corrected by God's word. This says poverty and shame come to him who disdains or refuses correction. Uh, The King James says instruction. So that's why I'm saying this is letting us know, listen, if you refuse to be corrected, if you refuse to be instructed by God and by his word, then this tells you you're not going to have a good way. You're not going to have brighter tomorrows. You're not going to have a wonderful future. Uh, I tell people all the time, listen, I, I have great days. Uh, my next week will be better than this week. My next month will be better than this month. This next year will be better than last year. I keep having that happening. You know why? Because I believe for it. I speak it. Every morning when I get out of bed, I know you've heard me say this, but some of you haven't. Some of you need to hear it again. Every morning when I get out of bed, I did it this morning when I got out of bed. I said, this is a day the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in this day. God has loaded this day with benefits. He has forgiven all my sin. He has healed me of all my diseases. He has redeemed my life from destruction. He has crowned me with loving kindness and tender mercies. He has satisfied my mouth with good things so my youth is renewed like the eagles. And something good is going to happen to me today. Good things are happening to me tomorrow, next week, next month, and this year great things are happening to me. I say those things every day. 
Why? Because I want them happening in my life. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, so I just keep releasing life instead of death. Man, we're, we're going to have to pick up in Proverbs 13 here in the next program because I want you to see some things in this proverb. This is wisdom, the wisdom of God. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you sharing these things. I know some of you keep sharing these things on social media. Thank you for those of you that are financially supporting our program. You're helping us reach you and other people all over the world. And thank you for loving me and being with me today. I love you back. Call you blessed. Have a Jesus-filled day. See you next program. If you would like to schedule Larry Hutton to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to LarryHutton.org and choose Contact Us from the menu bar or call 1-888-887-WORD. Do you know yourself, who you really are? Not the natural carnal person that the world says you are, but the saved, word-filled, Holy Spirit-empowered believer that you really are in the eyes of God. At times, each of us has struggled with our identity, ability, and purpose in our lives as believers. But God's Word is filled with His descriptions of who you really are in Him. In this two-part scripture recording, you will hear Dr. Hutton quote all the Bible scriptures about who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what you can do in Christ. In Him scriptures will help you build and strengthen the very foundations of your faith, enabling you to believe and therefore speak all that God has created you to be, to have, and to do, not in your own power, but in Him. To order In Him Scriptures, go to LarryHutton.org or call 888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton, where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org, or you can call 888-887-WORD. Karis Online was perfect for my busy life. And the best part is, my relationship with God and family is forever changed. Thanks to Karis Online, I've grown as a person. I see I can change the world right where I'm at. And because of that, this is my mission field. Taking my Karis courses online really fits into my schedule. I'm seeing life differently, and the people around me, they're noticing. Karis Online has meant the world to us. We're hearing God's voice better than ever before. We love this new stage in our lives. How will Karis change your life? Why not find out today? Go to karisdistanceeducation.org to get started. karisdistanceeducation.org Hello, friends. It's a real honor for me to have airtime on Andrew Womack's network, Gospel Truth TV. And just so you know, he doesn't charge any of us ministers anything to be on the network. He just wants to bless you. So if our ministry is being a blessing to you or other ministries are being a blessing to you, consider becoming a monthly partner with Gospel Truth. You'll be glad you did. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in Upper Ephesus setting on fragments of what was once the upper marketplace in Ephesus. This was a very luxurious marketplace where the affluent shopped. Just behind me was the Basilica, which was a huge art gallery filled with statues and etchings and paintings. It was magnificent. And any time of any day of the week, you would have seen the very wealthy walking through this area, beautifully attired. This was an area of those that were really affluent. But today it's all gone. The only thing that remains are the foundation stones. And these foundation stones are so significant, you could build on top of them today. The buildings which once stood on top of them are gone, but the foundation is still in place. And I wanna to talk to you for a moment about your foundation. What kind of foundation do you have? In Hebrews chapter five and verse 12, the writer of Hebrews says, by now, 
you ought to be a rabbi. When it says by now, the Greek word means you're really morally obligated. After all you've seen, all you've heard, after all the books you've read, all the preaching you've heard, by now even you ought to be a teacher. The Greek word didaskalos, which really means a rabbi. You ought to be a rabbi. After all you've heard, after all you've seen. But he said, instead, you have need that someone take you back to school and teach you the first principles of the doctrines of Christ. First principles is from the Greek word arches. It means you need to go back to the starting point or you need to learn the ABCs. Very often, people get in a hurry spiritually. They try to be deep and profound before they even know the ABCs. And the ABCs are essential. If you don't know the ABCs, then you're going to end up making a tragic mistake somewhere down the road. You need to know the ABCs of your faith. Do you know them? Don't assume that you do. You need to make sure you're really established in the foundational principles of the doctrines of Christ. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. I've been waiting for you, and I'm excited today to get into our text where we're going to talk about eternal judgment. You say, wow, is that exciting? Well, it really is exciting. I think when you hear what I have to say to you today, it's going to give you a brand new view about what the Bible calls eternal judgment. And this phrase, eternal judgment, is found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, where the writer of Hebrews is giving us foundational doctrines that you and I need for our lives. So let's begin Hebrews chapter 6, very quickly review verse 1, verse 2, and then we're going to get right into our subject. But the Bible says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, as we've seen in every program, this word principles is the Greek word arches. It describes a starting point, a beginning point, or what I call the ABCs of the doctrines of Christ. Every Christian needs to know these doctrines. These are the ABCs. That's not my opinion. That's what Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 says. Now, the beginning of verse 1 says we are to leave them, which means we're not to be stuck in this level. Eventually, we're to grow up, we're to go on, move on to deeper things. But a child doesn't go to the 12th grade until first he's passed the first grade. And the first grade are these doctrines spiritually, which now are described in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and verse 2. These are fundamental. They are elementary. You need to know these doctrines, and so do I. What are they? Well, the Bible says, therefore, leaving the principles, the ABCs of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. We've seen before the word perfection, the Greek word teleotes, the Greek word which describes a child or a student going from one class up into the next class. That's God's intention. Not that you get stuck. God wants you to keep growing and advancing, going on unto perfection or unto maturity. And then he gives us these principles or these ABCs. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. So number one, repentance from dead works. That is a foundational doctrine that you need to understand. What is repentance? What repentance is not? You need to know how to do it. It is foundational to your faith. Number two, he mentions faith toward God. We've already seen the Greek says, Epitheon, the word epi means upon, the word theon is the word God. It's faith upon God is really a better translation. It describes a faith that rests on Christ and not anything else. A faith that is rooted totally in Christ, resting wholly upon Christ and not on anything else. That's foundational to your faith. If you don't have that one right, then you need to go back and make sure you're really saved. It is essential for you to understand, for you to really be saved. Then he says the doctrine of baptisms, which is plural, and because it's plural, it tells us there's more than one baptism. There are multiple baptisms. In fact, there are three in the New Testament, and God wants you to have all three. What are they? Go to the archive, watch that program, find out. This is central to your faith. Then he says laying on of hands, and we saw that the laying on of hands is something well established in Scripture. God uses the human hand to impart power, gifts, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the laying on of hands is central to the power of God being operational in the church. In the midst of all these doctrines that we're to intellectually know, now God tells us something we need to do to have experience. 
We need to have the laying on of hands. We need to be constantly taking our hands out of our pockets, putting them on people to impart the power of God. This is a central doctrine of our faith. Do you use your hands? God wants you to. Then it says, and the resurrection of the dead, which is what we covered in the last program. We saw that there will be three resurrections in the future. The first resurrection will occur simultaneously with the rapture of the church. If you and I die before that time, we'll be raised in that resurrection. Everyone that has died in Christ, their bodies will be raised from the dead when the rapture of the church takes place. But then there'll be a second resurrection, which occurs at the end of the tribulation. All of those who died in Jesus during the tribulation, those who died as martyrs at the end of the tribulation will be raised from the dead. And then the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 that at the very end of the millennial reign of Christ, there will be a third final resurrection, and this will be the resurrection of the ungodly, the unsaved, the unjust, and they will be summoned before God to give account for their lives. And the Bible calls this the great white throne judgment. Now, today our subject is eternal judgment. So we're going to begin right here and get this one out of the way. You're not going to stand before the great white throne because you're in Christ. The great white throne judgment is for the ungodly. It's for the unsaved. It's for unbelievers. It's something that will happen at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. And the Bible talks about it in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. Listen to what the Bible says. And I saw a great white throne. There it is. This is the throne of God. And him that sat on it. And from whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. My friend, I'm going to tell you, God has books on every person's life. And the verse says the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is a terrible judgment that awaits the ungodly at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. That's not for you and me because you and me are in Jesus Christ. However, we will also have a judgment, but it's not that judgment. And the judgment which we will have really is not a judgment like you would think of a judgment. It's more of an evaluation and a time of designation. And I'll explain it to you. But there's a common misconception that because the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ, that we're going to stand before Jesus as believers, and we're going to have to give account for the sins that we did in our life. And that is a misconception. That is not true. That is totally contrary to the teaching of Scripture. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it is not for condemnation. Furthermore, God's not going to deal with you about any sin that's confessed and is under the blood because God will never bring that up to you again, not even at the judgment seat of Christ. Once it's under the blood, it's under the blood and God will never deal with you about that again It's gone. So the judgment seat of Christ is not a place where you're going to be condemned. It's not a place where God's going to deal with you about sin that's already confessed and forgiven. That's gone. Then what is the judgment seat of Christ? That's a very good question. Well, let's see what the Bible says about the judgment seat of Christ. The Apostle Paul talks about the judgment seat of Christ twice in Scripture. The first time is in Romans chapter 14, verse 10 and 11, and I want to read it to you. It says, For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, so then each of us will give account of himself to God. Now, Paul refers to this again in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. But let's begin here in Romans chapter 14 and see what these words mean. Again, the verse says, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. The first thing it says, we will all stand. And the word stand is a Greek word, peristomy, which means to stand. It does not mean crawl. 
It does not mean grovel. It indicates no shame whatsoever. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, washed in the blood. People that belong to Jesus Christ will not grovel, will not crawl, will not beg. We're going to stand there. A moment's coming when you're going to stand before Jesus. And the Bible says we'll stand before the judgment seat of God. Well, interesting that in Greek, the word judgment does not appear. It is simply not there. The Greek word is the word bima. If you were going to translate this correctly, it would say we're going to stand before the bima of God. But nobody knows what that means. So the translators translated it judgment seat. You'll understand why in just a moment. But really the word judgment is not in the text and it conveys a wrong idea. It's really a place of evaluation. Now, let me tell you what this word judgment seat, the Greek word bima really means. And I'm going to read to you directly from my notes. It was a platform, a bima, was a platform on which a judge sat in order to give judgments or rewards. It was a place of evaluation and designation, which I'll explain to you in just a moment. I'm going to say it again. It was a place of evaluation and designation. The word bima, here translated judgment seat, was taken from the Isthmian Games where athletes competed for a reward. And as they competed, they competed under the careful scrutiny of judges who watched to make sure every rule of the contest was obeyed. The victors, after the game was finished, were led to a platform which was called the Bema. The King James Version translated judgment seat, but it's the Bema. And the bema was the place where the judge placed laurel crowns on the heads of those who had fought well and those who had fought according to the rules. And by using the word bema, here translated judgment seat, but really it's the Greek word bema, Paul pictures believers, you and me, as competitors in a spiritual contest. And just as victorious athletes appeared before the bema, to receive a physical reward, Christians one day will ultimately appear before Christ's bema, before that platform where he's standing, to receive an incorruptible crown. That's what we're going to receive. The judge bestowed rewards to the victors, and listen carefully to this phrase, it was not a place where he whipped losers. Losers were not whipped at the bema. They were not whipped at the judgment seat. The judgment seat was primarily a place where rewards were given to those who had fought and competed according to the rules. It was not a place where people were whipped or condemned. It just wasn't. And it's not here in Romans chapter 14, verse 10 through 12 either. The bema was in the first century, and the bema will be, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, this word bema, it will be a place of evaluation where our works and our efforts, our faith, are evaluated by Christ. And it's also a place of designation where Christ will designate what kind of reward or award should be given to us for what we did in obedience to his plan. That's what is the judgment seat of Christ, which is very different from the idea of a place of condemnation and judgment. There's no judgment there. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Say amen. Now, the Bible says we'll give account. That's the next thing this verse says. We will give account of himself or ourself to God. Give account is the Greek word which means he's going to give a factual report. When we stand before the Lord, we will give a factual report of what we did and what we did not do. Did we really play correctly? Did we do what we were told to do? Did we fight according to the rules? We will have to give a factual report. That's in my future, and that's in your future as well. Then the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, almost word for word the same thing. But Paul repeats it. Listen to what he says. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Let's look at some of the words in this verse. First of all, he says we must all appear. The word appear, the Greek word phaneros, which in this case can also be translated to be revealed. 
when we appear before Christ, some things are going to be revealed. That's what it means. And the Bible here in this verse says, it will be revealed what we did in the body, whether it was good or bad. When we appear before Christ, it will be a time of revelation when everything will be clear about what we've done in our walk of faith. The Bible says we'll appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat is again the Greek word bima. It's coming before one who is going to evaluate us and to designate what kind of reward that we need to receive for what we have done. And the Bible says each one will receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. When the Bible says each one, there's no escaping this fact. It is a Greek word, hekestas, a Greek word which is all-inclusive. It embraces every single believer. It doesn't matter who you are, how long you've been saved, how newly you've been saved. It doesn't matter if you've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. You're in this word, hekestas, each one, every single one of us are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ The Bible says that we may receive what is due. The Greek word komidzo, which means to receive what he has coming to him. To receive what he has coming to him. If you've worked hard, you have a reward coming to you. If you haven't worked very hard, you may not have much coming to you. But in that moment, we're each going to receive what we have coming to us, what we have done in the body, whether it be good or bad. The Bible is very clear about this. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, The Apostle Paul also talks about eternal judgment, the judgment seat of Christ and what's going to happen and how we're going to be judged or how Christ is going to evaluate our life work when we stand before him. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 13, we're not going to read them. I'm just going to tell you about them. The Bible says a day is coming in the future when what we have done will be tried by fire and it will be revealed if we've built our lives correctly, if we've really done what God told us to do, did we do it with the right motivation? It will be revealed, the Bible says, by fire, which carries the idea of something purifying. This is a very intense examination. If we have not been building our lives correctly, if we weren't obedient, if we didn't do what the Lord told us to do, if we didn't play according to the rules, then it may be that what we built will go up in a puff of smoke. But the Bible says the good news is you'll be saved even if you escape through the flames because you're saved by the blood of Jesus, not by your works. You'll be saved regardless if you're in Christ. But the Bible says that day will come when what we have built, how we've built, the motivation with which we've built, it will be revealed by fire, describing a very thorough, intense, examination. The Bible's clear about this. Also in Matthew chapter 25, verse 19, Jesus gives us the parable about the master who gave talents to his servants. Then he left, and after a period of time, the master came back. And when the master came back, he called his servants and asked for an account of what they did with the talents that he had given to them. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 25, verse 19, that the master reckoned with them. He reckoned with them. Listen to this. I'm going to read to you directly from my notes. This word reckoned in Greek is a bookkeeping term that means to compare accounts, to compare what you were given to what you've done with what you've been given. Did you do anything with it? Did it stay the same? Did you increase it to compare accounts? Or it was used to portray an accountant who's putting together a profit and loss statement for his boss. He is examining the books to determine the real financial status of the corporation. Wow. Jesus uses this word, and in using this word reckon, he really tells us how he'll deal with us when we stand before the bima, the judgment seat of Christ. He'll compare accounts. Look at what he gave to us. See what did we do with it. He'll look at the profit and loss statement of our lives, and on the basis of what he sees during this time of evaluation, he will designate what kind of reward we should receive. Again, the judgment seat of Christ is not a whipping place. It's a place of evaluation and a place of designation. What kind of rewards are going to be given to believers that have been faithful? Well, the Bible tells us explicitly about five different crowns which are going to be given to believers. Crown number one, the crown 
of incorruption. Sometimes it's called the incorruptible crown. It's referred to in 1 Corinthians 9.25. The Apostle Paul describes it as a crown which will be given to believers who practice self-discipline. Second crown, it's called the crown of rejoicing. And this crown is referred to in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. And this is often called the soul winner's crown. Crown number three is called the crown of righteousness. It's referred to in 2 Timothy 4.8. It describes a crown that is given to those that are longing for Jesus' appearance and who have lived a holy life in anticipation of his coming. Crown number four is called the crown of glory. It's referred to in 1 Peter 5.4. It's often called the pastor's crown because it is a crown that will be given to pastors for doing a faithful job with their congregations. And then there's crown number five, which is called the crown of life. And it's referred to in James 1, 12 and Revelation 2, 10. This crown is often referred to as the martyr's crown because this is a crown given to those who have suffered for their faith and yet they have remained faithful. These are the five kinds of awards or rewards which are going to be given to us when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is in our future. And again, it's not a whipping post. It's a place where our works will be evaluated and Christ will designate what kind of reward to give to us. I think about the Apostle Paul who in 2 Timothy 4.8 talked about this moment when he'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but also to all them that love his appearing. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If we are in Christ, thank God, we will not appear before the great white throne judgment. But we will stand, not crawl, not grovel, but stand before the judgment seat of Christ, where rewards will be given to us for our faithfulness. And we're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment. So many Christians live their entire lives skimming the surface of the Word of God. Most never discover the profound truth treasures that lie deep within the text. But you can discover those truths today. In Sparkling Gems from the Greek Volumes 1 and 2, Rick Renner unlocks the brilliant treasures within God's Word and shows you how to live an intimate, uncompromising life with God. In an easy-to-read devotional format, each volume of Sparkling Gems explores more than 1,000 in-depth Greek word studies, revealing profound wisdom and counsel from the Bible. These volumes of biblical wisdom and teaching are sure to inspire and provoke you to plunge deeper into to what God has for your life. Get one or both of these valuable resources today. Sparkling Gems 1 for just $40 and Sparkling Gems 2 for only $45. These in-depth study tools will deepen your biblical understanding as you dig into the original Greek and the New Testament, unlocking hidden treasures from God's Word. Each volume will challenge you to adjust your actions, realign your attitudes, and act on the practical applications of God's Word. Through it all, Rick guides into a deeper understanding of God's Word to strengthen your faith and reignite fresh passion to pursue God's plan for your life. Don't miss this special offer. Order one or both of these resources today. Sparkling Gems 1 and 2. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Order your copies right now. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. Your help is helping us change the lives of people all around the world, especially the street kids of Moscow. Moscow is home to over 20 million people and many children with special needs, but especially children who live on the streets. Because of our partners, we're able to help assist the House of Mercy impact homeless children. House of Mercy is a foster home that has rescued hundreds of children from the streets or from other bad situations and has given them a new chance at life. One of these children is Vita. He was abandoned as a toddler and was raised by dogs until he was rescued by the House of Mercy. Some call this the Mowgli Syndrome, a name taken from the character from the classic jungle book story. Because of your gift and the work we are doing at the House of Mercy, Vita is now a healthy child. He is going to school, is being restored after receiving spiritual, emotional, and physical care by the House of Mercy. This is just one story of how the House of Mercy has helped hundreds of children reclaim their lives and fulfill their destinies. This is all possible due to the partners who support our work. Will you consider becoming a partner so that we can continue changing other homeless children's lives?
lives like Vita. There are so many more children who need the help of the House of Mercy. Will you show them your care today by giving a gift of any size? When you give, you show the love of Jesus to these precious children. Right now, right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner in this important work. Please call or go to renner.org to make a donation of any amount. Your financial support is helping us change the lives of children, children just like Vita. I have had such a good time talking to you from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, these foundational doctrines of our faith. And today we have finished this series. And as we close, I want to tell you if you have any questions about what I've taught, or if you have a prayer request, please contact us and we'll get right back to you. We believe in prayer. We'll pray for you. We would love to know how to better pray for you. Let us know and our team will go to prayer on your behalf. But remember that we're offering my books, Sparkling Gems from the Greek. These are wonderful daily devotionals. You don't have to order both, or you can order both, or you can order just one of them at a time. But in each one of these books, there is a thousand Greek word studies that will help you walk from where you are into the next level that God has planned for your life. So order your copy today. Use the information that's on the screen, and we'll get right with you. But I want to pray for you. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the glorious moment when we're going to stand before Jesus and he gives us rewards for our faithfulness. And we ask you to help us be faithful to the very end in Jesus' name. Wow, thank you for being with me today. And remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This is Rick Renner. I want to talk to you about the coronavirus. My friend, God has not given you a spirit of fear. That's what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. But he's given you power, love, and a sound mind. Use your mind. Think straight. Think right. You have authority over everything, including a virus. And God has not given you the spirit of fear. And I want you to hang on to that today. Beyond the Game with Tony and JB, stories that need to be told. To the outside world, it looked like there was nothing happening. I, that wasn't true. It's things like that that happen all the time that the public doesn't know about. Your body has an expiration date. I'm in bed the day after my surgery. Brian says, Anthony, when is enough enough? Beyond the Game with Tony and JB, stories you won't hear anywhere else. Viewer supported Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. Welcome, welcome to Grace for Today. We are so glad that you are connected and joined with us. 
We've, we've been talking about something really amazing this week. We are talking and ministering on the Great Commission. You know, I really believe that when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we have some really good news to share with somebody. And so, like I said, we've got good news. Whether you share with people across the street, around the block, around your state, around the nation, or around the world, we are all called to participate in this amazing Great Commission. Praise God. You know, we're all ministers of the gospel in the yeah. sense that when you're born again, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are all to be ministers of reconciliation. And we're all to share the message that God's not mad at you, that God loves you, that he's already paid for the sins of That's the world right. in the person of Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, that God was in Christ, not imputing our trespasses to us. Thank God our sins have already been paid for. And you know what we have to do to receive it? All we have to do to receive it is just believe it. And we're all supposed to share that. You know, I like that both of us received Jesus Christ as young children. We were in churches that taught about receiving him as our personal Lord and Savior. And both of us also had amazing encounters as far as receiving the Holy Spirit, too. And I just remember receiving Jesus and then um, later, years later, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was such a powerful encounter. You can't help but be excited Amen. and want to share. And we just want to remind everybody right now, if you have any questions, just put that in the comment section. And, and if we have time, we would be so happy to answer any question that you have. We also want to remind you, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can call our offices here. Or if you need an agreement for prayer for anything, we just want to encourage you and invite you to call. So again, we have some really awesome, amazing news to share. And is, was there something that you wanted to read out of the Bible? You know, yesterday we were in Matthew chapter uh, 20. Uh, Eight, mm -hmm. verse 18 to verse 20, where Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations. Mm -hmm. Go teach all nations yes. to observe what I commanded you. Yes. And that's really focused on discipleship, more the pastoring mm -hmm. aspect of ministry. Right. I was just thinking, you know, JT Wilkins is our worship leader. He, uh -huh. He's African-American. Our uh, new youth uh, director, director. Mm -hmm. is Hispanic. He's from old Mexico, Javier Macias. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're bringing all nations together and we're working together to build the body of Christ. Yes. But he says, I want you to go to all nations. I want you to make disciples of them. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the mm -hmm. Son, and the Holy Spirit. We talk about how that means to immerse them into who God is, who mm -hmm. Christ is, who the Holy That's Spirit right. is. That's good. Teach them, Jesus said, to observe my commandments mm -hmm. and love Oh, I'm with you always, even to the end of this age or this world. Amen. And so Jesus has given us authority and we're to go in his authority and we're to share the gospel and empower people to live out the gospel. Today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 16, Mark verse 15 to verse 20. And in Mark's gospel, it's really more evangelistic, more of an evangelist type ministry. And he says, I want you to go into all the world and I want you to preach the gospel to every and, creature. And there's something that we brought out. There's been a misconception. I loved it. We learned this from Dr. Lester Sumrall. He said, it's time for the body of Christ to quit arguing over silly little disputes and work together as the body of Christ, even if it isn't the same denomination. If you can agree on God, run with it. But let's work together in bringing unity to get this amazing message out. You know, whenever there's um, separate, when there's strife and and trying to cause a separation with groups, that's the devil's work. We're about the kingdom Amen. of God, the kingdom of light. We work together to get this amazing message out. We have some just really neat things to share with you regarding around the world during these interesting times when when all of society, you know, and as as we supported our president closed our campuses, it was amazing. The word of God literally blew up because of technology. The word of God really went to all ends of the earth. And we have some uh, other testimonies to share with you today and even some exciting things tomorrow. But before I'm just going to you can just tell I'm so excited about what God is doing. But we better start reading some scriptures here. So in Mark's gospel, he says, go preach the gospel to every creature in verse 15, Mark 16, 15. Then he says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved and he that believes not shall be damned or condemned. Mm -hmm. So 
really the focus is on the believing. What do you have to do to be saved? You must believe on Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, when Philip uh, was ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch uh, under Candace the queen Mm -hmm. of Ethiopia, and he was riding in the chariot, the the man said, here's water. What hinders me uh, from being baptized? And he Mm -hmm. said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. In Acts chapter 8, verse 37, that's not in some translations. Mm -hmm. But you've got to believe on the name of Jesus. You've got to believe Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus lived a sinless, perfect, pure life. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and God raised him from the dead. It's a substitution. You know, we call it the vicarious suffering of Christ. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the gospel and believe it, the Bible says that you're saved. And then he goes on in Romans 10, Paul says it this way, that if you will confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved for with the heart man believes unto righteousness. You see, Jesus made righteousness available for every person when he died and rose again. Now say that again. Jesus Jesus made made for right standing with God, righteousness available for every person, every person when he died and rose again. Amen. But you've got to believe the gospel to receive it. You've got to believe in Jesus. We have to invite him into our heart. He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. The way you get receive righteousness is you believe your way into it. So Jesus made righteousness available in his death and resurrection. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus had never sinned, yet he became a sin offering for all of humanity that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we were total sinners. We were completely unrighteous. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Mm -hmm. And yet Jesus, the righteous one, became a sin offering for us. It was a substitution so that we might receive his righteousness as a gift. And the Bible says that we uh, have received the grace of God and the gift of righteousness in Romans 5, 17. what What is a gift? It's something you don't pay for you don't pay for it you didn't earn it when I when we give each other gifts or, or give our friends or family gifts it's it's something that you we again you didn't um, earn it you didn't pay for it it's it's free you just choose to receive the gift all you have to do is open it up praise God That's awesome. and salvation is available to everyone praise okay. God Amen. And all you need to do is open the gift. But what are we Just supposed to do? Just believe on Jesus. It has We're it in to here. share the message of Jesus. It's good news. Why wouldn't you want to share it? The gospel is and the message of Jesus. And I love this. Go into all the world. You know, everything about the Great Commission is go. You don't. You just don't hunker down and and stay isolated forever in a cave. You are to go. And like I said, whether a lot of times people think, well, I don't really feel like I'm called to go on the um, mission field. But whether we're all called to go, whether it's a neighbor uh, across the fence, across the street, around the block, or in our own home, it, or in our <laughs> own home. So praise God. But we all have an amazing message. Of love to share with somebody. I remember Dr. Summerall telling this story about a lady in his church that wanted to go to India. And he said, you get that big chief and all those little oh, no. <laughs> Indians saved at home and then you can go to India. Yeah. But we need to start right where we're at. Praise That's God. I, I always have believed that ministry starts in the home and then it's an overflow. So when, when we were raising our children, uh, even as being full time ministers, being pastors, that having uh, three children, three sons, my priority when they were in our home was that they would know they would have their own revelation, their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So again, ministry starts in the home and then, and then it's an overflow. But I like how it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And I, then I like how it goes on. I hope you're right. Praise God. And all these signs will follow those who believe. So we not only share the message of the gospel, we share the power of the gospel. That's awesome. Paul said, when I preached the gospel, it was not in word only, but in power and much assurance and in the Holy Ghost. And praise God, he said, my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. When Jesus sent forth the disciples in Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10, he said, I want you to go uh, preach the gospel. And when you go preach the kingdom of heaven, heal the sick. 
That's raise amazing. the dead. Amen. Cast out devils. That's praise amazing. God. And the disciples came back and they were so excited. You know, Lord Jesus, in your name. In your name. The, the devils are subject right. to us. He said, don't rejoice in this. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice mm -hmm. that you have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Because a relationship with God is what makes this work. That's awesome. When, and when it, another way of saying this, when it says that these signs will follow the believers, it's really saying that God always backs up his word. Praise God. You know, the Bible says this in Jeremiah 1, verse 12. He says, I will hasten my word to perform it. So it isn't about you performing. It's no. God. We share the message and then God will we back can't it do up. It. That's right. We can. It's all about him. But God does it. That's and so right. he says this. Uh, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out devils. A lot of times people leave that off to last, but Jesus mm -hmm. named it first. That's amazing. So we have authority over the work of the devil mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus. He says they will speak with new tongues. Thank God you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. If you've never received the personal prayer language of praying in tongues as a believer, you need to receive that That's gift. Right. Today. You could call our ministry. I have trained prayer ministers. They'll be happy uh, to pray for you, to minister to you. And so if you need to receive that, call today. Mm -hmm. Then he says, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. There's not only going to be divine power, there's going to be divine protection. Yes, I like that. I like you know, how we, it brings all that out. We go in the power of the Holy Ghost, and God protects mm -hmm. us. That's right. That's right. So it goes on to say they will take up uh, serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they uh, will recover. Isn't Praise that amazing? God. You know, and I want to bring something out. Someone answered this years ago for me. So what is the difference when we talk about we're going to lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover? Or what about when you're in the church, and, and you're a believer, and you've been standing on something? Someone answered it this way. As a believer, we are to take our authority over sickness. But for those who maybe have not, because people are like, why is it when you go to other countries or go to different areas where they don't even know Jesus, they're healed um, instantly? And this is what this is talking about. There are signs and wonders for those who do not believe, and it helps cause them to believe. It shows them that there is a God, and he is real. Praise God. Mm -hmm. And so it says they'll take up serpents if they drink any de deadly thing. It will not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You know, sometimes people get mad that are from other mm -hmm. circles mm -hmm. that don't really believe in the present day ministry of Jesus to heal the sick. But when you read in the Bible, Jesus had a preaching, teaching, healing ministry. Yeah, we brought it out. I asked you when Jesus was here, his ministry on the earth, I asked you, how many people did Jesus heal? And it says 14 times in the New Testament that Jesus healed them all. That's Healing right. is a very integral part of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Psalm 103 verse 3 says, he forgives all of our sins and he heals all of our diseases. Mm -hmm. James chapter 5 says, if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them pray the prayer of faith over them, anointing them with oil. And he says, the prayer of faith will save the sick. And if they've committed sins, they'll be forgiven. So forgiveness and healing. Mm -hmm. First Peter 2 24 says, who his own self bear our sin in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes, by whose wounds you were healed. Forgiveness and healing. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's all awesome. of those scriptures tie together the forgiveness yes. of sins and the healing of the body. You know, when Jesus had his earthly ministry, uh, the disciples are brought this one man. It might not have been the disciples, but mm -hmm. a man's friend. They brought a man's yes. friend. It's in Mark chapter 2 and Matthew chapter uh, 9. Four friends come carrying their friend late to the meeting where Jesus was teaching in a house. It was so full of religious people, they couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. So what they did, I mean, there's a faith that will not be done. They tore a hole in the roof. Yes. <laughs> I could see dirt falling down and straw and sawdust. And Jesus, it says, looked up and seeing their faith. And, and they dropped see. him down. And Jesus said, son, cheer up. Your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. And as the religious people in the room began to question and doubt, Jesus mm -hmm. sensed that. And he said, well, what's it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up, take up your bed and go to your house. Because, you know, a lot of times people think because they've sinned that they, they can't be healed. 
And so Jesus more than once just takes care of that. He's Praise like, God. I have the power to forgive you. I have the power to um, heal you. And I want to bring something else out that I've heard over the years and just from some of my traditional background, a lot of times people will ag- agree or declare that Jesus did heal people. But they say, you know, because the um, the disciples are gone and Jesus is gone, the healing ministry and speaking in tongues is gone. But this passage right here in Mark 16 just really takes care of that. Yes, Jesus has ascended. And we're going to read that just in a minute here. Jesus ha- has ascended, is sitting at the right hand of God. But he has said, now you're going to go. You're my disciples. You're my people. You're going to go in my authority in the name of Jesus. And uh, people will receive Jesus Christ. People will receive their healing. Isn't that amazing? So healing and speaking in tongues did not go away just because Jesus ascended to heaven. He's like, now you run with it. Praise God. You run with it. And that shows us why we here at this ministry believe in healing and speaking in tongues is for today. So you better read the next couple of scriptures. When you read it in the book of Acts. Yes. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues was not given until the day of Pentecost. So that was 50 days after Jesus was raised from the dead. So Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week in the Passover feast. Then 50 days later on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was sent. Mm -hmm. And they were all with one accord. They were in one place. They were praying in the upper room in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit blew in. They heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind and forked tongues of fire sat on each one of them and They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And that's never ceased. After Peter preached that message, you know, they said, what is this? You know, that was their question. You know, some of them mocked and said, these men are drunk. Peter said, no, it's only nine in the morning. They haven't got drunk yet. They haven't had time to get drunk yet. (laughs) He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Mm -hmm. Joel. In the last days, God said he would pour out a spirit on all flesh. The sons and daughters would prophesy. Old men would dream dreams. Young men would see visions. On my servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out of my spirit. And it will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be be saved. saved. And then he began to preach this same Jesus who you crucified. God raised him from the dead. And he has sent forth this, which you now see and hear. And they said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, for this promise is to you and to your children and to as many as are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So that promise of praying in tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was to the disciples, it was to their children, it was to as many as are far off, as many as are called. Wow. Well, how many did call? Well, I believe that God called everyone at the cross. Mm-hmm. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself, take all judgment to himself, talking about the cross. Mm-hmm. In John chapter 12, I believe it's verse 32. He was talking about that. So God called everyone at the cross. Now, how do we get saved? We have to answer the call. Mm-hmm. We're justified by faith mm-hmm. when we believe on Jesus. But once you answer that call, did you know you are a candidate as a believer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's right. And in the book of Acts, I believe near, nearly every believer received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. There wasn't this great divide in the church that there is today about spirit filled or not spirit filled. Mm -hmm. They just went ahead and believed. And you know what? Many foreign nations, it's not like that either. I know in foreign nations, there's Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterians. Mm -hmm. They all receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Our son Aaron has a good friend that went to him with him to to high school, and he was part of a Presbyterian church, and he married a a Catholic young lady that loves Jesus Christ. But they go to a charismatic uh, Catholic church. Praise God. Praise God, right here in Colorado Springs. So I thank God for the move of the Spirit wherever it is. I thank God for people that are moving toward God and moving into the things of God, moving into the power of the Spirit. So we want to keep preaching and we want to go with the power of the Holy Spirit and demonstrating the gospel. We have two more scriptures still to read, but we have um, a, a precious person named Michael who asked a couple of things. I feel like we've kind of addressed it, but I, I want to hear, hear you answer this. So Michael did ask, why do some translations leave out Mark 16, 9 through 20? I, all the Bibles I own 
Mark 16, 9 through 20 is in there. They also ask, why do people think all the gifts went away when the apostles died? That's a very good question because I know when, again, the traditional background I have, I heard that also more than once. So can you answer why some people think all the gifts went away when the well, apostles died? They, why some, they why base it on a trans- different Greek oh, okay. uh, um, translation, mm-hmm. and I'm not that familiar with it, mm-hmm. but my Bible has Mark 16. All my Bibles have Mark 16. There probably are and some. I, I believe we, I remember a couple of people knocking on our door when we were in the country. Their Bible didn't have that. You know what? Bit. You can go to the book of Acts mm-hmm. and you there can you see go. that these signs happened and, and it followed the disciples. And Amen. it wasn't only the disciples. Stephen was a servant in the church mm-hmm. and Stephen did great wonders and signs among the people. Mm-hmm. He was a layman. So this wasn't just for the apostles. It was for believers. That's you can right. go to the other areas of the gospel and still prove this. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, the same works that I do and greater works mm-hmm. than these shall you do because I go to my father. So that's awesome. I, that's a, a, a passage. And then again, just now what we're reading, believers, these signs will follow you. You're going to, you're right. going to preach the word of God. I like what you just shared, greater works than he, he will you do. But let's just go on here in, in Mark, and I'm going to just look at um, verses 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying of signs. Amen. And so, so God, when you look, look at this, I mean, they were acting on the words of Jesus. That's right. And, and notice this. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Them is in italics. That means it wasn't in the original language. Mm -hmm. The Lord, they preached the word, and the Lord worked with the word that they preached and confirmed the word with signs following. Some churches nearly have almost no healings, almost Mm -hmm. no miracles. And the reason is they don't preach this. They don't believe it. They might be selective in what messages they and preach or whatever. And if you don't preach it, mm-hmm. I know years ago, John Osteen, he was a Baptist, and then he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's awesome. And when he started preaching these things and preaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and preaching on healing, then people started receiving these things. So if you want people to receive them, you've got to preach them. Okay, stop right there, because that just leads us up to the next question. So we have another very precious person that has asked, Hannah's asked, how, how do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Great questions. Well, the way I received it, you know, there was an altar call given at a, at it was in a Bible study. Andrew Almack was actually mm-hmm. teaching. This was in 1978. But we know people that were driving tractor and got out and received right. the right. Lord. Or it, but he was teaching a Bible study in my aunt's apartment. Mm-hmm. His ministry wasn't very big. He had six Bible studies a week then. And at the end, after he taught, he gave the altar call for people to come and receive it. And and they come up in front of him. And then he said, I want all the people who are already baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues to come and get behind them and pray for them. Okay. And then I decided after all those people went up there that I went up, that I wanted to receive it. So I went and got in the back of them. And when they prayed for them, I just lifted my hands toward heaven. And I just opened up my mouth and I just started speaking in tongues. Mm-hmm. And I've been speaking in tongues every since for mm-hmm. 42 years. Mm-hmm. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I like how the Bible says if your son asks for a, what, help a me fish, up. you won't give him a stone. Right. You know, and if he asks for bread, you're not going to give him a serpent. There but the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit, this is in mm-hmm. Luke's Gospel, to mm-hmm. those who ask him. I think it's Luke chapter 11. And so it, it's just ask. You ask for it. You believe Again, that you a, receive it's another, it. It's a free gift. And then you it's just, gift. The, the, you just that's how you receive Jesus. You ask, you believe, and you confess Jesus mm-hmm. is Lord. Well, that the Holy Spirit, you ask, you believe that you receive it, and then you act on it. You've got to like open your you mouth. Said that. You, you see, the Holy Spirit it. is a gentleman. And the Holy Spirit is not going to grab your tongue and make you speak. You've got to open your mouth and begin to speak. God will give so you the you begin words. begin to say, nene shero, rama, na, 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 te. Right. begin to speak in my heavenly language. Nene shero, rama, it's an na, act na, of your te. will. Amen. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter mm-hmm. 11. I will pray with my understanding. I will pray with my spirit. And when I pray with my spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. So most of the time when I pray in tongues, my mind does not know what I'm saying unless God gives me revelation and I get an interpretation of what I'm praying. So let's just do that right now. 
So we just want to invite you, Hannah, or anyone else watching right now, if you'd like, if you have asked Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you'd like to receive the baptism right now, we just agree with you. So we thank you, Lord, that you say that we ask and we will receive. So just begin as we pray with you. Just begin to speak in your heavenly language. You can also call the number here. But again, K N N N S H E R O R A R A M A N A N A N A N A T E K N N N A S H E R O R A M A N A N A T E. You can receive that our call. So and you have one more thing you want to share. Just open up your heart and just pray out Amen. of your spirit towards That's God. That's awesome. And so when they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord worked with them. I thank God I like that, that during my ministry, I've been preaching full time now, pastoring full time, I've been preaching a lot longer than this, but pastoring full time for 32 years. And during my ministry, the Lord has worked with me. And the Lord has confirmed the word that I've preached with signs following. We have less Praise than a, mu- uh, a minute to wind down today's message. What else would you like to share? Well, here just next- thank you so much for tuning in. Yes, thank, thank you for you. connecting with us. Um, I want to say a big thank you to our partners that are helping us share the gospel all around the world. We're on several television networks. We have That's these right. live broadcasts. We reach people in different ways. We support missionaries all over the world on all mm-hmm. the continents. And so if you would like to uh, partner with us, we would love to have your help. Praise God. And uh, continue to share this gospel in a lot of different places. And we just want to say blessings and thank you so much for connecting with us. Please share this with your friends. And uh, we would love to hear from you. Thanks so much for connecting with us today. God bless you. Remember that Jesus loves you. Did you know Colorado Springs, Colorado is a great place to visit? And if you're visiting Colorado Springs, we want you to come to Karis Christian Center. We have services every Sunday at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. We would love to have you here. We have a great church family that loves God, loves the Word, loves to worship, loves to minister to people. And so we'd like to have you here and check out our midweek too. Thanks so much. We'd love to see you. Blessings. We just want to say a very special thank you to all of our partners. We're taking the word of God around the world. We hear weekly from countries all over the world, from the Middle East, from Asia, from Europe, from Africa, from South America, from Mexico. Praise God, our partners are helping us share the word. If you want to become a partner, just give us a call today. We would love to hear from you. Blessings. Thanks for watching Grace for Today. This broadcast is made possible by our faithful partners. If you would like to become a partner, need prayer, or have a question, please call us at 719-418-4000. Go to www.lawsonpadu.com or write us at PO Box 63733, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80962. See you next time on Grace for Today. Bring Keras with you wherever you go with our new Keras app. Free to download, the Keras app allows you to easily access everything Keras Bible College has to offer in one place. Receive exclusive grace content and explore unique Keras features. Watch or listen to archived resources and teachings. Follow along with the Bible reading plan or listen to the audio Bible. The Keras app brings everything in one place. Download your app today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the Scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people, who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. The 
God has proven himself trustworthy. And so we trust him. We have faith. We fear the Lord. Okay, so it's with this idea of the fear of the Lord that now I'm going to trace a few things. This is a large subject, okay? And I'm going to try to summarize it. So this isn't a detailed explanation. It's just a summary because if we're going to understand how to live well, that it's going to look different. I tell you, walking and living in the fear of the Lord will look different. But you need to understand what it is. And, and I just, we're hitting the highlights of what this means. Okay, so the fear of the Lord. We'll start in the New Testament just with one verse to just get you a, a sense of how this works towards us living different. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Since we have these promises, these great and precious promises, um, that would be in 2 Corinthians 6. If you look at 2 Corinthians 6, you'll, you'll see that part of those promises are God's presence, God's power, um, and our relationship with him. And so since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. It was really quiet. Uh, is, it quiet is it quiet everywhere else? Oh, man, that was, whew. apparently that's a really heavy verse. Bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So there is a defilement that if we participate in the world, if we give in to lust and greed and pride, I'm not talking about struggling with lust or greed or pride or being tempted by lust or greed or pride. Our flesh that is apart from the Lord, our flesh does have a default desire for those things that we are tempted by that. It's just not the orientation of your life anymore in Christ. But you exist in the world and to willingly engage in that kind of life, a life controlled or oriented around self, you will participate in things that will defile you, defile you in the body and even defile your heart. And so he says, cleansing ourselves, meaning you need to be separate from that. But how are you to be separate from that? Because you and I lack the willpower. Like our strongest efforts still make us end up being oriented around self. So we need something else. And he says, bringing holiness, holiness being that separateness, that set apart, that godly life, bringing holiness to completion. How? In the fear of God. So the process, we have been cleansed in Christ, okay? So again, referencing pretty much all of Pastor Dwayne's sermons last year. <laughs> um, so an entire year's worth of sermons. Uh, let's just, you know, go back and study that this week. Um, you already are cleansed in your spirit, but there are things we do that can defile us. Not, not before God, but our witness before others. Okay, we're still sinless before the Lord. Okay, but, but he wants more than just being sinless before him. He wants his glory to shine through us which means we're going to look different than the world around us. So holiness is a way to do that. Well, there's been lots of programs and principles and lots of pressure. Oh, three Ps there. That was an accident. Um, <laughs> pressure to be holy in different religious circles that is we're going to make you holy. So you need to stop watching these movies. You need to stop doing this. You need to cut your hair this way. You need to dress this way because that's how you're going to be holy. And it was a totally failed attempt. You just looked stupid. And you came across as weird to your unbelieving friends. But he does say that there is a process of living out that holiness before people that's going to make you look different. And there's a process. What brings that process to completion? The fear of God. And there's been many misinterpretations of that. Is Therefore, if that's what it takes, then if I can get you properly scared of God then I can bring holiness to completion. And it hasn't worked. And it won't work. So we got to understand what the fear of the Lord is. So the fear of the Lord, keep, keep with the analogy, is the orientation of our life around God. That's what it means to fear the Lord, is we have a reverence, a respect, a trust, and a worship of God, and therefore keep Him. Because we're tempted to pull Him from the center and put ourselves there. We keep him in the very center of our life and trust that he knows how to orient our life properly. 
And so Proverbs is a one book that, that really explores the fear of the Lord. You can trace it in nearly every book of the Bible. But the Proverbs is where it really kind of gets you a basic understanding. So I'm going to hit a, just a couple places in Proverbs to, to help you see this. Okay? The first one is Proverbs 1.7. This concludes the introduction of the book of Proverbs that talks about gaining discretion and subtlety and wisdom and all that. And then verse 7 kind of gives you a little bit of an interpretive lens for how you're to read the rest of the book. And he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All right, knowledge is used a a few different ways, but in this particular context, knowledge isn't just not, it isn't just the ability to know something. Because there's a lot of people who know a lot of things that don't care a bit about God. So it isn't to say that someone is completely unintelligent if they don't feel God, fear God. There's lots of intelligent people who are in total rebellion to God. I mean, it actually takes a certain level of intelligence to completely write God out of this universe. You have to, you have to intentionally blind yourself to a few things. So is it that you can't know anything without fearing God? Not necessarily. This specific verse is referencing back to the very beginning. In Genesis 2, um, human beings were made in the image of God and given a responsibility, a vocation to be fruitful and multiply, to go subdue the earth, fill it and have dominion. We're supposed to be partners with God to bring his beauty and goodness to all of creation. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to walk out that image, then you're going to have to make decisions as to what's good or not good, as to what's good or bad. And that decision is represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge there is the discerner of good and bad. The decision maker as to what is good and bad. The definer of good and bad. And instead of trusting God... Instead of trusting God's definition of good and bad, instead of working with God and allow him to instruct us as to what's good and bad, we decided to take that knowledge for ourselves. And that's pretty much every human sin since then, is that we decide what is good for me. Instead of trusting God's definition of good and bad, we decide what's good and bad. And so the fear of the Lord, what it does is it tells us we don't really know what is good or not good. We don't really know what is best. We don't know what is best for ourselves. We don't know what is good for God's world. And so we can't trust our own definition of good and bad. We must trust God. And the only way to do that is to make him the center of our lives and allow his word to define all good and bad. We don't know what is good Unless we fear the Lord, unless we've oriented our life around him. Because if we orient it around ourselves, we then decide what to know. And that knowledge, I'll get there. So the fear of the Lord is a way to say, I don't know what's good. I don't know what's bad. I have my opinions. I have my perspective. But truthfully, I'm selfish and I define good as to what's good for me. And I define bad as what's bad for me. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad for you. As long as it's good for me, that's what I think is good. And Genesis 3 to 11 is the exploration of how good man does at defining good and evil for himself. As a matter of fact, it gets so bad in Genesis 6 that every thought of every man was only evil continually. So when mankind defines good and evil for himself, he only ends up with evil. And we have to come to this place where we recognize we can't do it. We don't know it. And so we do not despise God's wisdom. We do not despise his instruction. We fear him and therefore allow him to decide what is best for us. And then we follow his instruction. Verse chapter 2 is the second speech from a father to his child. Chapter 2 verse 1 through 6 kind of gives this like, all-out pursuit of God's wisdom, God's knowledge. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. 
New Living Translation. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. You see kind of like all these verbs are all action. They're they're, they're this active pursuit of wisdom from God. It's not just a passive let him do everything. It's an active pursuit of understanding the way God sees everything. And then the next verse. Then when you give your whole life to this... Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain knowledge of God for the Lord grants wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding the Lord grants wisdom. So when I give my whole life to this, then I begin to understand what the fear of the Lord truly looks like on a day to day basis, not just a definition that some preacher gives you on a screen. It's truly a whole life we give, and he gives us that understanding of what wisdom is, what knowledge is. For the Lord grants wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Now, wisdom, as a whole entity of Scripture, it's a Hebrew word, and I don't do this very well because you have to clear your throat a little bit. It's chokmah, chokmah. Wisdom is not just the ability to know things. It actually has much more reference to a skill, uh, a skill for wise living. Uh, It's the ability to take raw materials and create... As a matter of fact, the first time wisdom is used in Scripture is referencing the guy who would design the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle, that he was given wisdom to make works of art. And so there is a certain skill we need to live well, and we don't get to make it up for ourselves if we're going to do it with God's chokmah. We have to fear the Lord. And when we fear the Lord, then we allow him to give us the right wisdom to live well. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One, that's understanding. This is our entire life. This is not a supplement to our life. This is not an addition to our life. This is not uh, for extra credit (laughs) as a follower of Jesus. No, this is our whole life. We give our whole life to pursuing God's wisdom and that gives us wisdom for how to live well. Because if you're going to turn the tide and run against the current of the world, you lack the skill to do that. We need God to give us the skill and the only way to do that is to completely orient our life around him. Not try to orient our spiritual life around us. but orient our whole life around him. The Message Bible translates that, that Proverbs 9.10 is skilled living gets its start in God. Get, skilled living gets its start in the fear of God. Insight into life from knowing a holy God. So what makes us different? Is it because we have different practices? Is it because we attend church semi-regularly? Is it because I carry around a Bible? No, is that I have a completely different orientation to life. While the entire world around me is pursuing selfish means and selfish motives, I turn against that and just completely orient my life around God. That is the, I am convinced that is the only way to live well, is to completely pursue God in everything. It isn't to, you know, quit a job and then work like as a monk in a monastery and that's the fear of the Lord. No, it's to take everything about your life, your relationships, your parenting, your job, the way you do sales, the way you construct management, all of that and completely orient around God. And in that heartfelt, continual, lifelong pursuit, you gain the chokmah, the wisdom necessary to do that well, to live well. And if you don't give your whole self to it, you might have medium success. You might have a few successes, but not according to scriptural standards do you have a skilled life. Do you have a life well lived? And that's my deep concern as a parent, as a pastor, is that there's lots of people who've completely given themselves over to orienting life around self, and then they slap a religious veneer over it and call that Christianity. And it's no different than the self-destructive, selfishness, self-orientation of the world. It just, sound, it just has Bible verses plastered on it. 
And if we are a church that's actually going to influence the world for Jesus, then we don't get to look just like the world. And it isn't to say that we just have a few different political opinions or a few more religious terminology. It's a completely different kind of life. A life that allows God to completely inform everything I think, every opinion I have about the economy, every opinion I have about politics, every opinion I have about technology, about business. I don't get to define what those are. If I've oriented my life around God, that is the only way to live faithfully. That's faith. That's the fear of the Lord. And when I live this way, when I live with that orientation and I commit my whole life to it, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 7, that that orders my life toward holiness. It's not from trying harder and doing better. It's not just from reading my Bible more and having my morning devotion time. It's that my whole life is ordered around him. Every opinion I have, before I give that opinion, I go, I don't know if this is God's opinion or not. It's my opinion, and I think I'm right. But I'm a terrible definer of good. What does God's word truly say? And then whether I agree with it or not, I live by it. I choose to believe his word above my opinion. That's what it's like to orient our life around him. And it will make you look different. It sounds strange to orient our life around words that were penned two to 3,000 years ago. That's not modern enough. It's not contemporary. How can ancient writers say anything about contemporary culture? That's going to make you look different. And then you get to Jesus who walks out the fear of the Lord. And he says this. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7. This is how he concludes his Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know if you've read the Sermon on the Mount. But it's going to challenge you. It was revolutionary in its day. You know how revolutionary? The world had never known a concept of loving your enemies. Until the Sermon on the Mount. It was unheard of. And it seems... Still just quite unheard of. We, we sort of spiritualize it because we don't want to deal with it. So, so he gives this whole Sermon on the Mount. This is the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. What do we want? We want chokmah. We want wisdom. We want God's wisdom. How do we get God's wisdom? We listen and follow his teaching. Whatever Jesus says goes, whether I like it or not, whether I agree with it or not. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey They're foolish. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. We don't get to define this for ourselves. We don't get to decide what is good for me. We don't get to decide what is good for God's world. We don't get to decide what is good for our country, what is good for our neighborhood, what is good for the economy. We don't get to decide that. Our responsibility as followers of Jesus is not to have our own definition and that be counter to the world. We're to listen. Like what Proverbs 2 says, we seek for that wisdom. We seek for that understanding. We search for it like hidden treasure. If I told you that there was treasure buried underneath this church... Y'all would be getting jackhammers immediately. <laughs> like, okay, this might be the house of God, but I want that treasure. And, and the whole Proverbs says it's available to you. But it's found in the form of wisdom. Wisdom you might not like when you first read it. But it's just like treasure. And we're to treat it as such. And so Jesus says, you listen. You listen to me. And you obey. 
You don't just listen to it and go, hmm, Jesus, those are really good words. Those are really sweet. That's for super spiritual people. I'm so glad the pastors live that way. (laughs) No. Because in life, in this world, what Jesus says later in John is that in this world, you will have tribulation. Jesus laid out here that the rain's going to come and it's going to come in torrents. That the winds will beat against your house. That the floodwaters will rise. Whether you, whether you follow Jesus or whether you are a heathen. Life, ha- that's just a part of being, a, being in a broken world. But the difference is not going to be that you avoid the floodwaters or the high winds. The difference is that your life will still stand strong because it's not built on your definition of good. It's built on God's word. And I have to hear it, listen to it, and follow it. I have to follow it. I have to obey. I have to bring my life. And not, not with perfection. I'm going to mess that up. I'm going to misunderstand. But that's why the fear of the Lord keeps that orientation so that when I mess up, when I don't understand, when I get corrected, when I get instructed, I don't act like a foolish person and reject the whole thing. That's foolish. Fools reject wisdom and instruction. No, I receive that instruction and I with the Holy Spirit discern it then how to live it. Because as 1 John 2, 17 says, the world is passing away. When the floodwaters come and the winds beat against the house and the rain comes, the house falls with a crash, a house built on selfishness, a house, a life built on pride, on self-centeredness, on lust or greed, that that eventually is going to self-destruct. But the house that stands strong is the house that is completely oriented around God, around His Word. The first, the first way we can see someone who is in opposition is how they treat the Word of God. Now, we can have disagreements about the Word. We can have different interpretations, and part of being the church is we navigate those together. You see it one way, I see it a different way, but we both honor and respect the Word. So let's dig in. Let's find out what the truth is. You're not going to understand this perfectly. It's a big old book. But when someone rejects this, that's everything I need to know. Everything I need to know about a person is whether they reject this. Now, I can love them, but I love them enough to eventually say, like, your house is built on sand. It might sound really intelligent. It might sound like a really great philosophy, but it's built on sand, and it's going to collapse. The Message Bible of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. I like what this says. He says, look at that man, bloated by self-importance. Full of himself, but soul empty. But the person in right standing before God through loyal and steady believing is fully alive, really alive. Fully alive. You want to be fully alive? It's going to come at a little bit of a cost because if, you're, if the whole world around you in a secular age that we live in is, is a strong current Toward selfishness, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require some loyalty, some steadfastness. But the person, through loyal and steady believing, is fully alive. That's how we're going to live well. And it's going to look different. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 7, one, in conclusion, the Amplified Bible says this, Therefore, since we have these great and wonderful promises, beloved Let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Completing holiness, living a consecrated life, a life set apart for God's purpose in the fear of God. Do do we want to live a life set apart for God's purposes? Is it worth, instead of us pursuing all of our dreams, be able to trust God with all of our dreams? all of our desires, all of our wants, and trust Him to properly guide us as we live oriented around Him. When we can live that way, oriented around Him, now we become a ready vessel for God's purposes. We become able to handle God's purposes. We become a witness to a world who's headed towards self-destruction. Maybe... 
Maybe your life isn't totally there of destruction. Maybe it is. And I just encourage you, and I encourage all of you in our campuses, this is mainly about surrender. Are we our own Lord? Have we taken control of our life? And there might have been people who've made a confession about Jesus a long time ago, but they still live with self at the center. Jesus says we need to repent. We need to repent. And each of us are tempted every day to orient life around self. And if we've done that, God still loves us and still has a purpose for us. But we need to repent. And so I pray today that you recognize how much you need the Lord at the center. And my hope is that I, I can point you enough to Jesus that the Holy Spirit can convince you Jesus is worth betting our whole life on, Amen. trusting our whole life to. Even when we don't understand it, we don't agree with it, we can trust the Lord. He gave his life for us. Now I can give my life for him. I can trust that kind of Lord. And I can trust that Lord to tell me what to do. And that's going to require some humility. And it begins with repentance. And so I want to be the kind of church that cultivates this fear of the Lord. Not scares people. Not tries to scare hell out of people. But to just show you what life in Jesus truly is and what it means to live out that life. And we do that with the fear of the Lord, and I pray we choose that today. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. <laughs> Father, I thank you for your grace, because we are unable to make this decision independent of your work, your grace. But we choose that grace. We repent of all the ways we've put ourselves at the center of our life. And thank you that you forgive us, you cleanse us, and that in this life we live, holiness is being completed. Not because we're trying harder, not because we're obeying the rules better, but because we walk in the fear of the Lord. And in walking and living in the fear of the Lord, you're transforming us by the renewing of our mind. I thank you for working in us and leading our church into a season where we cultivate the fear of the Lord out of love for you and love for people. Empower us, strengthen us to be witnesses of you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we thank you for empowering us to live out a skilled life. That our lives may be a testimony of the power and love of Jesus Christ. And I pray we surrender to him today. And I pray all of this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. This free teaching is only possible because of the generous donations of our DSM Impact Partners. Visit PastorDwayne.com to learn how you can join and help make an impact in our world. We hope you enjoyed this message. Thanks for watching. Want to dive deeper into the Word, but your busy schedule robs you of that opportunity? Now you can listen to the Gospel Truth wherever you go with the Gospel Truth radio app. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, we are broadcasting the Gospel, not only our individual television programs, but we've got conferences on there and it's great. No matter how your time is divided up each day, now you can plug into the Gospel Truth 24-7 at your convenience. It's a great way to stay connected in a world that demands so much of your time. Tap the app and start listening to Gospel Truth Radio. Go to the App Store and type in Gospel Truth Radio and download it to your smartphone. Hello, my name's Greg Fritz and I have the Good News Program here on GospelTruth.tv. I'm so thankful to Andrew Womack for offering the airtime on this channel absolutely free to those of us who are on it. But it does cost money. They've hired the best people to manage and to promote this channel. And if you enjoy it like I do, write Andrew a note and tell him thanks. And send an offering to help support GospelTruth.tv today. Attention small business owners and anyone looking to start a new business. We have a conference you won't want to miss. 
It's Billy and Becky Epperhart's Business Mastery Workshop. This year, it's an interactive live stream conference you can watch from home or your office. And your employees can watch it with you as well. All for a fraction of what it would cost to attend in person. In today's business climate, innovation is the key to not just surviving, but thriving. COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on thousands of small businesses. In this type of climate, you have to revision your business, your product, and how to serve your customers in a whole new light. That's right, you have to innovate, and Billy Epperhart and his team of experts will show you how to do it fast and do it successfully. One of our key teaching points this year is how to market your business faster and better when the market conditions are changing month to month. If we can help you tweak your marketing approach just a little bit, you may see your profits increase dramatically. Another major teaching from this year's Business Mastery Workshop is how to make a strategic assessment of where your business is today and discover what practical steps you can take now to become more profitable in a COVID-19 world. Billy will show you how to execute new ideas in the middle of the COVID pandemic. The live stream conference is Friday, August 28th through Sunday, August 30th, and it's filling up fast. Register today. Go to wealthbuilders.org and click on the Business Mastery Workshop banner. I, I want to just begin by telling you about a, a woman that uh, had a pretty tragic childhood because her mother died when she was nine. Her father died when she was 11. She was a very beautiful girl. She married very, very young. She wanted a child, found out she couldn't have a child, adopted a boy. He grew up. He was in Vietnam in the Air Force. He was one of the spotters. Every friend he had flying with him was shot down, put him into a tremendous, uh, difficult state. But this woman had been through a lot, and she was taking care uh, as a home nurse, like a hospice nurse of an, an elderly man, and she was living in the home. The alcoholic son of that man came in and forced his way on that woman and raped the 40-year-old home nurse. And she conceived her first child when the doctors had said she couldn't have a child. So at age 40, divorced, unstable income, raped, she's pregnant. So she went to have an abortion. She told the circumstances. The doctor looked at her and you have to wonder, is there any possibility that the doctor just thought for a moment, potential, possibility, promise? I don't know what went through his mind, but he refused to do it. The woman went home and sat down on the porch where she was caring for the elderly man and prayed. And God said, have the baby. The baby will bring joy to the world. She gave birth to the baby, put an ad in the paper, and asked for someone to come get the baby. Someone came and got the baby. They thought they could adopt the baby, but the mother never signed the papers. And so when he was five, she came and drug him out from under the bed where he ran to hide and took him to live with her in total poverty. No home, 15 times, 15 houses, did not face a street. They faced an alley, a dump, or a dirty river. He never took anybody home from school. He was the shyest kid on the planet. The alcoholic men that raped her came back into their life. He brought hell into their home. He tried to kill the mother, thought he had because she passed out, came in and said to the boy, I'm going to kill you, and cursed him. The boy, the father didn't know the boy had bought a rifle. He ran and got the rifle and pointed it closer than Andrew and said, if you move as much as a hand, and this is exactly what the boy said, I'm going to blow a hole in you big enough for someone to crawl through. The man sat there cursing and never moved his hand. If he had moved as much as his hand, he would have been shot. The boy called the operator. They sent the police. The man went to prison for seven years. Later, that boy got married, and that man in prison had to sign the papers for him to get married because he was only 19. He got married. He was the shyest kid on the planet. God called him to preach. Nobody could believe it. He told the people in the church 
that God called him to preach, and they were all sure God called somebody else, and he overheard the call. <laughs> he asked some of the men, do you think God can use me? And they answered, absolutely no. Three days later, he preached his first sermon on a flatbed truck at a construction company, and the whole place was turned inside out. In one year, he led 3,000 kids to Christ in Houston, and Billy Graham found him. Underwrote his entire organization and set it up and said, you're going to need this. That boy, that kid, that product of rape is now standing at the Liberty Coalition right here with Andrew Womack in Woodland Park speaking to you because a doctor said no to aborting a baby in the womb of his mother. I can promise you, I only go where God sends me. Within the second year I'm preaching, I was getting a thousand invitations a year. The meetings became citywide. I did 600 citywide crusades. It was amazing what God did. And then God told me I would be more effective sitting in a studio with my wife, helping the family get to know the Father. So that's what I've been doing. We have been able to save millions of lives all over the world. If you watch Life Today television, we've actually been on television 50 years. Billy Graham asked me to go on television on a regular basis because he was not led to, and he just knew God wanted me to. I didn't even want to pray about it. I love doing the Crusades. But I prayed about it, and I went on television 50 years ago. It's been unbelievable what God has done with Life Today. It's beautiful to see our son now sit by Sheila Waltz, one of the most anointed people on the planet. And I'm telling you, she is a blessing as she shares. She is just a gift from God. She was the head of women of faith for many years. She, of course, was Pat Robertson's co-host years ago, and she was Billy Graham's soloist all over the world, many, many places. So God has done a wonderful thing in our ministry, for which I'm grateful. So the question is, why are you here? Because this is a man who's dead serious about what God's serious about. I want to believe that all of you who've come are really serious about it. I know that Andrew was hoping there'd be hundreds and hundreds of pastors here just from Colorado. Yeah. But the church has bought one of the biggest lies the devil ever put on people, and that is for the church to stay out of politics. That is a lie straight out of the pit of hell. The church doesn't stay out of anything that matters to anybody because if it matters to anybody, it matters to God. And politics matter because they determine the direction of the nation. And I can promise you the deceiver and the destroyer will never stay out of politics because he wants to control everything, divide us, conquer us, and use us as slaves. Now that's exactly what he's up to. He's been succeeding because the church checked out. Do you understand the significance of that? Because if you don't, you must. Because it is time for God's people to wake up and stand up and look like the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and reveal Jesus to a world that's groping in darkness. That's why we're here. You've heard it over and over. Did any of you happen to bring your Bible? Would you open it to 2 Chronicles 7, 14? Most of you have got it memorized. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And I will what? Heal their land. Does that mean it's possible for our nation to be healed? Yes. Did God say he would do it? Yes. What determines it? Politicians? No. Preachers? No. They have a part in it. A major part. But he said, my people, called by my name, will humble themselves. Who's he talking to? He's not talking to religious people. He's not talking to people who go to church. He's talking to people who make up the church, who are a part of the family of God, the body of Christ. That's who he's talking to. 
He's talking to those who've been born from above. So is he talking to you? Every single person in this nation, every person that knows Christ, he's talking to you. Those of you who have been born from above, you didn't just become a part of a religious circle, camp, or tribe. You were born into Christ. Born into the Spirit of the living God. And Jesus said He sent that Spirit to live in us. The same as Him. The paraclete, just like Him. So He's saying, if my people, call by my name, will humble themselves, will admit we need help, and we believe God freely offers help. We know that God can use men, He can use leaders, and we need to choose the best possible leaders. But we also know He can use and move people that we wouldn't see as being the best choice. Consider this, He's always used imperfect people to accomplish His perfect will. Always has, always will. That means all of us qualified to be used to accomplish His perfect will. If you're looking for a perfect person, there's only been one. And he never ran for office because he was already King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he wants to lead us as we select those who do run for office. We've done a rotten job because we checked out. My people call by my name, humble themselves and pray. Do you understand how important prayer is? Do you believe that in the last few years, we have seen amazing things happen in our country? Here is a congressman here. Would you say, congressman, and thank God that you are a Christian, you love God, you love his word, you love his people, you love people who don't know God. You want God's best for everybody because God wants best for everybody and He can deliver it. So you're in place to try to see that happen for the people God loves and gave His Son to redeem. God wants the church to put His arms around the world He gave His Son to redeem and show them His love. So you are serving in office. You know the corruption in Washington. It's worse than a swamp. It's worse than a cesspool. It's worse than a snake pit. Am I right about that? I said to you in an earlier meeting, the nearest to hell you'll get on earth may likely be Washington, D.C. Would you agree with that? Because there's so much power concentrated there, and the enemy is concentrating all of his deceptive power on that community. The principalities and powers of darkness and deception and division and destruction are focused on that power base. You know it? It's true. Would you agree, knowing what you know, knowing what goes on in Washington, knowing all the things that have happened that never should have happened, would you agree that what we've watched happen in the last three and a half years has to be a miracle of Almighty God? Would you agree that for our economy to take the swing it took, for the minority communities to be going up like they are, no longer being taught to be dependent upon Pharaoh, or Caesar, or Uncle Sam, or any government source, but they could get a job, they could be responsible and be accountable. Isn't that the message the Bible teaches all of us as parents to teach our children and our grandchildren? Everybody's supposed to do that. And he made all of us potential laborers in fertile fields of opportunity. Now we have downplayed that. We have been spending the taxpayer's money which is actually God's money turned over to the people he left as overseers of his money and then we turn it over to Caesar and we no longer watch over it. We go to church and sing Kumbaya. We go to church and have church without being the church. We lose the effect of salt and light. We let the light be covered and the salt lose its effect and everything literally goes down. That's what's been happening to us. All of a sudden, and I believe this with all my heart, because some righteous people were praying. 
And they were really seeking God. And they were asking God for a miracle. And they were not trying to tell God who he could use. They were trying to tell God, you do what you said you would do. You heal our land. Because you said if we'll pray, you'll hear us. And we're humbling ourselves and crying out, we need you. Now then, he said, turn from your wicked ways. I'm going to touch on that, but let's talk about the miracles again. What about the several hundred judges that have been appointed to the lower courts? Not only the two on the Supreme Court, but all the hundreds of others that have adversely affected the state of Colorado. They have actually taken away the power of the people. They determine in the courts what is right and wrong, even if it's against the Constitution, if it goes with their liberal leftist point of view. And I believe it's not just liberal, I believe it's anti-God. You remember that Peter said in the second Peter, first chapter, verse three, he said he's given you because of his divine nature, everything pertaining to life and godliness. What does the enemy attack? Everything pertaining to what first? Life. And what? Godliness. We've been using God's money that we pay in taxes that God gave us oversight of. Then we don't watch to see what's being done with it. And we have educated our school children in the public schools about everything against life and godliness. Is that true? And even in our high academic systems. Does that break your heart? Just ask God right where you're sitting to forgive us for ever allowing that to happen. Look back up at me. God left us here as overseers. We are stewards. Whose planet is this? Whose garden is this? Did he give us oversight of his garden? Did he say heaven and earth is to declare his glory? Did he say the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof? Then who does the earth belong to? Who did he make overseers of the earth that belongs to him? Have we done a good job overseeing what he gave us oversight of? We have done a rotten job. I don't mean to be scolding. I brought this chair out because I'm trying to sit down and talk to the family. I don't want to be, I don't want to be overbearing. <laughs> it's hard to calm down when his word is shut up in your bones like a fire. It's hard not to weep with Jeremiah. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night over the slain of the daughter of my people. Then he said in lamentation, is it nothing to you, all you that walk by and see the little ones held captive of the adversary? Does it not bother you to see what's happened to our children, to our school children, to our college students, to our young people? Does it not cause you... To weep, I weep a lot. There's plenty to weep over. But we began seeing miracles. We saw justice reform. We saw an emphasis put back on liberty of religion worldwide and the freedom of religion worldwide. And our national leader said, don't tell people they can't pray in public or in schools. People from Washington who had boldness and who were leaders were saying don't stop people from doing that. You never would have dreamed you would hear it and it began to have an effect. What do you think that did to the enemy? That had taken this sacred ground. That had made life unimportant. That he cast aside everything pertaining to life and godliness. When the enemy began to see that he was losing ground in America, he went ballistic. He went ballistic. And yes, he turned loose a pandemic. And yes, it was targeted at the greatest place freedom has prevailed in history. 
I launched a website a few years ago at the urging of Ravi Zacharias and nearly every major leader in the country who loved God with all their heart. It's called the stream. Stream, like a river. Stream.org. You ought to go there every day. Make it your home page. There will be an app out in a few weeks where you can have the app. But you ought to go there and go turn your, your, your laptop or your, your iPad horizontal where you can see popular. At the top of the list is atheist praises Christianity. One of the leading atheists in the world went back and proved historically. Read the article. Even the atheist can't push back against it. He said he can prove he did historically. Every great thing that has ever happened in history was birthed by Christians. Built by Christians. Every great thing that ever happened. Irrefutable. Read it. Read it. Even the other atheists say we can't argue. The atheists that wrote it said, I'm not ready to take Jesus yet in that resurrection. But every great thing that has ever happened, happened because of Christians. Everything. When the older President Bush died, I'm too old to preach like this. <laughs> she had you got a recliner backstage. I used to worry about people going to sleep when I'm preaching. Now I'm just concerned about me going to sleep while I'm preaching. The stream was birthed. The greatest conversation I had about the stream was with Ravi Zacharias when I was driving from the mountains up north down to, uh, through Woodland Park, down to a conference in uh, Colorado Springs. And Ravi and I talked, I think, for an hour that day, but we've been talking for hours. And Ravi said, James, God wants to stream venues and voices of wisdom from all the different parts of the body of Christ. And God said to me when He set me free years ago, the day of the somebody in the church is over, it's going to become the day of the body, the church itself, not the somebodies. And the real shepherds and pastors are going to build up the body so people can behold the glory of the Lord and the glory of the Lamb on His body, the church. And Ravi said, James, these streams of wisdom, not any one of them, however great or, or brilliant or wise they are, should become the stream. They are just streams feeding into the stream. Pastors, evangelists, teachers, prophets, all these gifted people. Flowing wisdom. And we see the wisdom of God coming from all these different sources into a stream that's flowing from the heart of God. And he said that has to start and it's, it's been birthed. It's, I'm told it's got the most brilliant people on the planet writing every day. You know, Governor Huckabee is one of our, our greatest writers. Don't you think Governor Huckabee is a God-led statesman in America today? Don't you believe that? I just praise God for it. It was my blessing to buy him his first suits. Literally, the boy never had a suit. I went and bought him several suits because he was working for me and, and being an announcer in our crusades and our television ministry. And then I encouraged him when in the pastor and then when he became governor. And now then as he's doing what he's doing, it's just wonderful. His little daughter, she about outshined daddy and everybody else. And old Sarah, she's just full of Jesus. And by the way, the press secretary right now is one of Ravi Zacharias' students that he inspired. And Ravi inspired the stream. Listen, I'm asking, when you get home, go stream.org. On that popular where you see that, what an atheist says about Christians, praising Christians, right there, there's also Huckabee saying, the worst thing that's happened in my lifetime politically. Matter of fact, in this century, basically, he says, read it. It's incredible. It just totally went viral. But all these writers are so amazing. And they're all different streams. And none of them are the stream. They're just tributaries. 
So that's kind of like what you did when, when you started this uh, uh, Liberty Coalition. It's called Truth and Liberty. And by the way, you can't have any freedom without the truth that makes us free. And you can't have liberty without assuming the responsibilities of protecting and preserving it. And you've got to walk in the fullness of the truth to protect it. That's, that's the meaning of liberty. Well, we live it out. And that's what our founders understood. And we've been losing it. But because of prayer, God miraculously began to give it back. And he seemed to be using people and even some individuals that we never would have ever imagined. Let me repeat what I said earlier. God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect will. Have you got that? He always has, always will. Only one perfect one. By the way, isn't it sad that we're taking down all these historic markers because somebody was associated with something wrong? I mean, Robert E. Lee was really a man of prayer and he really was opposed to slavery. But he didn't want to turn against his family and his state and the people he'd known and he knew they were struggling and he was a great general. And I mean, gosh, he was an amazing person and the letters to his wife are like reading letters from one of the people in the Bible. They're so beautiful. But now we're going to take his him down and the horse down. Are we going to take down everybody that ever did anything wrong? That means we got to go take the statue of David down over in Rome and all the Michelangelo sculptures of all these famous people. David messed up. Do you know anybody other than Jesus that got, didn't mess up? Why, why do we understand that's just part of our history? And part of our history is failure. And part of our history is we miss the mark. But God is bigger than our missing the mark. And he can take us beyond our failure to what he offers. Does this make sense to any of you? We're about to tear the whole country up by allowing the deceiver to just come at us continuously. <sighs> oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I could weep day and night, and I can and I do often. I'm weeping on a mountain ten years ago in Colorado. I came up to get out of, the, out of the Texas heat. And by the way, Texas is a big state, and we got some pretty places, but there ain't no state any prettier than Colorado. Can we just go ahead and accept it? Can a Texan just go ahead and take it? We ain't got nothing like this in Texas, okay? But I come up here on a mountain. Now, I'm a Baptist background. I, I don't like to use any title of a, of a sectarian divide, okay? But I come out of Bible Baptist. I was so conservative. Jerry Falwell I made, said I made all the conservative Bible Baptists look like a bunch of liberals. He told me I made Rush Limbaugh look like a liberal. He said, you are the most conservative person on the planet. And then all of a sudden, God stretches me so much. And you say, well, what did God do to stretch you? Well, I was fussing at Billy Graham. Because Billy and I have been close since he helped me at 19. And he assigned me to win Franklin to Christ while Franklin was in school in Texas. And I worked real hard on Franklin. I asked him, because Franklin and I are real close now. I said, Franklin, what were you doing? And I made those fishing trips and those hunting trips with you. And I knew you wanted to go hunting, you wanted to go fishing. And I had them all set up and then you wouldn't show up. You said, I was drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. That's what I was doing. <laughs> well, I didn't win him. But one day, Billy and I were playing golf. And Billy's not really emotional. I cry a lot, Billy doesn't. But he's got a really tender heart. Now he's in heaven. He's listening to me now. I sure love you, Billy. And all of a sudden, Billy said, did you hear about my boy? I said, what happened? He said, my boy Franklin, he really got converted. He really got saved. And he teared up. We were sitting on a golf court going to the ninth green. He said, could we go inside and have a sandwich? And when he told me about Franklin getting saved. Gosh, it was beautiful. And then I knew about him taking Samaritan's Purse because I knew Bob Pierce and World Vision. I knew the sad way that that kind of took a turn as far as Bob was concerned. And he started Samaritan's Purse. And when Franklin got that, because Bob died and he got it, well, we gave him one of the first large gifts and brought Franklin on and started trying to help him. And I told him, I said, Franklin, God's going to use you to do something your dad never got to do. You're going to get to show the whole world the compassion of Jesus. And you're not only going to keep the gospel going, but I'm telling you, it's going to be wonderful. Franklin and I are so close. So very, very Beautiful what God is doing. God totally, totally changed him. So 
all the things that, that I watched God do over these years when he was stretching me and when Falwell was talking about how conservative I was and I'm trying to straighten out Billy Graham and, and I'm, you know, I've been told that, you know, all Pentecostals are swinging from chandeliers and bouncing off the walls and, and I mean, just, but, but all, but I had a real problem. Andrew, I had a problem when Jerry Falwell was fussing at me because I said, I think there is a spiritual language. He said, no, there's not. I said, yeah, Jerry, let me tell you what happened to me when I was 19. I'd been preaching a year. And I got some kind of terrible infection in my chest. In both breasts, there was something about the size of a silver dollar, but thicker. And, and I said, Jerry, it hurt me so bad I couldn't hardly put on a t-shirt. And I, I couldn't wear a dress shirt. And if I put my coat on over it, it made me want to cry. And when I went to the doctor, they told me it's very serious. And the doctor said, you're going to have to go to a plastic surgeon because this is going to be pretty meticulous. And I, I told this guy that was playing a musical instrument in this First Baptist Church. And I just told him, and, you know, he was a Pentecostal. And I said, you know what he did, uh, uh, Jerry? He said, would you mind if I just pray for you before, before we go out and you preach? Because the place was already packed. The pastor apologized to him on Sunday morning. He said, by tonight there won't be anybody here. Tomorrow night the place will be virtually empty. They just don't come. But Sunday night it was packed. Monday night they were standing outside, filled the lobby, and they were standing on the sidewalks outside trying to get in the church. We virtually led the whole town to Christ. I did lead the whole football team to Christ, and they went undefeated in one state that year. That's pretty cool, too. It made all the teams in Texas want to get saved after that. But I said, I'm, I'm in, this, in this study, and this Pentecostal said, would you care if I just pray for you? And I said, sure. And he kind of reached his hand and said, don't, don't touch me. It's really, 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 really tender. And by the way, my wife asked that I not shake hands. A lot of people, you know, we're both 76. So we're in the bullseye of this vulnerable age, you know. You know, I barely made it here, you know. But my wife said, don't shake hands with her, but we don't know where everybody's been. And to honor my wife, I won't. Because if I did what I wanted to do, I'd give every one of you a hug. You don't realize it yet. But I'm not only trying to get God's arms around you, I'm trying to get mine around you. And if you stay with me, I'm going to succeed. I promise you. Because you're not going to go out the same as you came in. I'm going to make you that promise too. And so I said, I said to, to Jerry Farwell, I said, this man just kind of reached over. And I said, Jerry, he started praying in another language. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about it, but it seemed angelic to me. I said, I'll tell you one thing I know, Jerry Farwell. That guy wasn't faking. That wasn't some kind of religious gobbledygook. There was something real about that man. And when I got home that night, they were gone. I said, there was nothing there, Jerry. Man, it wasn't better. I said, it was real. You can't imagine all the times that I went at it with Jerry about, I'm beginning to learn because Billy Graham, when I scolded him real hard one time, he asked me, do you know all these people you're telling me to stay away from? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, I do. And he said, the closer I get to him, the more I see Jesus. And he said, can I make a suggestion to you, James? I suggest you spend more time with people you've been taught to avoid. And I took Billy Graham's suggestion. And one of the first people I spent time with was Jack Hayford. And when I walked into church all the way, it was when I was, Billy Graham and I were Southern Baptists and Baptist leading evangelists. The Southern Baptists alone, I was having the biggest meetings they ever had in history. It was just unbelievable. And I go out there to Jack Hayford's church, church on the way, and he can't even stand in the study with me. He's just crying. I said, what's wrong, Jack? He said, James, you don't understand what's going to happen here today. You don't understand. I know we're about to preach to 10,000 people, 4,000 in that building, then the overflows and the annexes. He said, you don't know what's going to happen. God's going to start here in this church today. Nobody can believe you're standing in a four-square church where Amy Simple McPherson started that, and you're standing here with me, and you're in this church. 
You don't know. God's about to tear the walls down, James. And bless God, you did. And I took Jack Hayford to my Bible conferences and to introduce him to all my Baptist pastor friends. And every one of them said, thank you for introducing us to that man. He didn't talk about Pentecostals. He showed us the power of Pentecost. He showed us Jesus. Are you listening to me? Throw all those dividing lines down in the name of Jesus. Throw down your tribe, your camp, your ism. And who is it God answers? My people call by my name. Not their name. Not that name. Not some name. My name. People of the way. Christians. Born again. Blood bought. Baptized into Christ. New creations. That's who changes the world. And in the power of prayer, we can move mountains. That's what God's been doing. And using people we never dreamed he would use. Did King David mess up? Did Peter mess up? Are you folks still with me? You remember how brave Peter was? If everybody else leaves you, you can count on me. If there's one person you can count on, it's me. I'm brave, Lord. If you want to see courage, here's courage. You can count on this fisherman, Lord. If I cut y'all out over there, excuse me. I don't want y'all to feel like you're not part of the church over there. By the way, when I went back to preach baccalaureate at Liberty, I helped Jerry by the mountain. Raised Jerry, the first big money ever raised. You probably won't have me up here sometime, maybe do something like that for you. I mean, it was unbelievable what happened. I mean, Jerry couldn't believe it. So we bought the mountain. They built Liberty. He wanted it to be the biggest school. It was Liberty Baptist University. I said, Jerry, get Baptist off the sign. Tear it down and get it out. I said, God's not interested in building Baptist churches. He wants to build the church. Are you listening? God's only got one church. He's only got one kingdom. Got one kingdom, Andrew. Businessmen need to learn that. All pastors need to learn that. All preachers, all ministers. He's building one kingdom. That kingdom of God. And he wants to build it here. So he got liberty off the sign. When I got stretched, it upset him. I said, well, Jerry, I heard one of my friends, Pastor James Ryle, preaching that most preachers and most Christians are standing on their boat with their sails hanging limp, and they're standing there on the boat going, (laughs) and wonder why the boat doesn't move. And the Lord said, we need new wineskins, said, stretch the sails to catch the wind of the Spirit. And I said, Jerry, I set my sail, and the wind of the Spirit caught me. And it's carrying me past every barrier and every fear on this planet. And I know no walls to divide me from the family of God. And I don't know anything to make me not love the people Jesus died to redeem. It ain't us and them. It's all of us. And God loves every one of us. And everybody that doesn't like us, He loves them. And He wants us to forgive them and love them and see them come to that love. So... I go up there to preach at Liberty, and that's the biggest Christian university in the world. Now I'm back at art, and the building's packed. And Jerry Jr. says, James, look at all those people out there. Look at those students singing. Look at their family. More than half of them got their hands up. Look at them, James. They don't look like a bunch of Baptists anymore. They look like Christians sometimes. I said, bless you, Jerry. And Jerry followed well. Hey, Jerry. God bless you, buddy. I love you, and you know it. Jerry Jr. and John, I love everybody. You can't find anybody not to love. Somebody said, man, you try to say something good about everybody. I said, I try to. Well, what are you going to say about the devil? I said, well, he's not lazy. (laughs) 
Wouldn't it be wonderful, Mr. Representative, if Christians had quit being lazy and quit being at ease in Zion and slothful? By the way, if you don't know what part of Second Chronicles 7.14 I'm preaching, in case you can't keep up, this is what's called turn from your wicked ways. That's what we've been talking about. Wicked ways. Did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount with the salt of the earth? Did you know that salt is a great preservative? And especially so in the time when he said it. But it also adds flavor to all of life. What did he say would happen to salt if it loses its effect? Shouted at me. What did he say would happen to it? Trampled under the feet of men. What's trampled under feet? Everything sacred, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Why did it happen? Why are we trampling under feet? Everything pertaining to life, all life, meaningful life, all races, all people. God doesn't see races. God doesn't see color. I said one time, you know, God's colorblind. He shouted at me, no, I'm not. I love color. I love bouquets. How could you not like people of another race? How would you not like black people? I love them. I spent my life with Martin Luther King in the South, bringing all the blacks to the center section of every stadium in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, everywhere. In many of those stadiums, the police surrounded the platform and said, you will not leave this town alive. They cleared the platforms more than once because they felt I would be killed while I was speaking. Why? Because I said, you don't mistreat anybody. Billy Graham was saying the same thing. How do you not like somebody? We've saved the lives of at least 16 million little black children that many didn't even notice. And God loves them so much. They're like my children. I love all of them. I dedicated the Potter's House for T.D. Jakes. I've tried to help Tony Evans do everything in the urban alternative. Ben Carson calls me dad. He never had a dad. I never had a dad. Ben can call me dad. What's wrong with us? We've got to hear the hurting hearts. How do you not like an Asian? How do you not like somebody from India? Because their skin's a different color. My God, American ladies spend millions and so do men trying to have a tan like the people from India. <laughs> we think they're so beautiful, we get cancer trying to be like them. Isn't this silly? Hispanics? What would you, don't you wish everybody would work like these Hispanic people do? These Latinos? Man, what if we didn't have them? We wouldn't have any roofs, we wouldn't have any gardens, we wouldn't have any landscaping. We wouldn't have a lot of people to just show up for work. You want to know why? Because a lot of them just really love their wife and their kids. And a lot of them love their families that's across the border and don't have a thing. And I don't want them breaking our laws to get over. They came for the right reasons, but they came the wrong way. They, the people who came for the right reasons but came the wrong way, you need to stand up and say, I came the wrong way. Would you let me go back? And would you let me come back? Because I've already poured my life over here. And I've, I've even paid taxes over here. I, I know I'm not, I know I'm not legal. I know I'm not documented, but, but I'm honest. I love my family back in Mexico. And I love your family, and I want to work hard for you. Can't you just see? This ought to melt your heart. This is what I've told all our leaders. Some of the most precious people in the world are people that are hurting the most. But it's just like Sammy Rodriguez says, over 41,000 Hispanic churches. He said, you know what the Hispanics are supposed to do? They're supposed to put his panic in everybody in America. His panic of what God wants so the enemy is afraid. And he panics because his God is our God. And the enemy flees. I believe that. These people are so full of God. Sammy is so full of Jesus. We all wish we could preach like Sammy. Man, I just love these people. 
Sammy calls me dad. God, you can call me dad from now on. I don't care. I expected Jack Hayford to call me dad. He's in his 80s. He can call me dad. <laughs> Turn from my wicked ways. What did he say about light? He said, don't hide the light. He said, put it where? On a lampstand. Don't let it be covered. If we'll come together and put the light on the lampstand, he said, you can become like a shining city set on a hill. And you can't hide a city set on a hill. The church is hidden under cover. We're the greatest secret agents on the planet. Nobody ever detects us. In the New Testament, they called them the people of the way. They called them Christians because they reminded them of Christ. By the way, one of the reasons I sat down is I broke Jerry Farwell's pulpit. I I broke three pulpits in just over a year. They, They taught a lot of my gestures in the seminaries. This was one of the best. I, I sat down because this is a nice pulpit. <laughs> it's new. Wisdom. Wickedness when you let the light be covered. What would happen, Mr. Representative, if all the Christians, the 60 to 80 million who say they're Christians, very questionable as to whether they really are because by their fruit you know them and they don't bear fruit and you know what they're doing they're changing his word into a lie Romans 1 18 when they knew him they didn't glorify him as God and neither magnify him became vain in their imaginations, professing themselves to be wise, they proved to be fools. They not only didn't keep the word, they denied the word, and they changed it into something other than what it is. And therefore they were given up, given up, given up to what? To controlling powers and forces and appetites that made them a slave. But don't stop there because you tend to stop where you see the sexual disorientation where men burn with sexual desires for men and women with women, which he says that's part of the problem, is you're no longer even natural. You become unnatural. And much of the church sees that, and we should and know it's not wrong. Now then we're even regendering people. It's not even enough to say... Well, it's obvious it's a boy. It's a girl. The sonogram. I'm going to have a girl. I'm going to have a boy. We have 11 grandchildren. They were all so excited to show us we have a boy, a girl. By January, we're going to have nine great-grandchildren. That's 20 grandkids for old Papa here. Let Papa sit back down. Because they changed his truth into a lie, they were given up. But you know what I fear? We get stopped right there. We get stuck on the fact that we've got this horrible, and rightly so, this sexual impropriety. I mean, but wait a minute. Heterosexual sins are just as, as wrong. We've got so many people that are, that are hooked on the lust of the eye. And by the way, so please listen to me. If the enemy's got you, you realize how many Christians are, are controlled by food, by appetite, by gluttony, and they're digging their grave with their teeth, and it's, it's controlling them. And they're killed. We just had Dr. Colbert speak on the program yesterday. The response was out of sight. He tried to show us how to take care of the temple of God, our bodies. And we're betting are really trying to. Last year, Betty could put on her wedding dress 
We've been married 57 years, folks. I mean, she, she just said this is the way it ought to be. I lost 25 pounds. When the pandemic set in, I mean, did y'all see that picture of that giraffe? They wanted to know if the lockdown was over and the giraffe weighed about, about 10 times bigger. Well, I had a little problem there, too. You can't go anywhere. You just eat, you know. You want to chip out, you know, whatever. But wait a minute. If we can't even control our appetites, do you realize how many wonderful, God-loving Christians fight battles all their life? Do you realize how many of these Bible characters? Do you realize the battles they fought? How many people do you think are, are trapped by, by lust and they, someone would say, I would pull up my eye or cut my arm off or whatever. How, how about if you loved them out of that? How about if you said, I'm going to stand. Do you realize that when people lose weight, it's usually because somebody loved them through it and walked through it with them, didn't condemn them? See, people are trapped. They're trapped. What I want you to see in Romans 1, though, because we, we just overlooked this. Oh, no, just listen closely. Because I want you to see this because it's exactly what we're seeing every time we open our eyes, every time you look at the news. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. So God gave them over to degrading passions, women with women, men with men, and then on down the men abandoning, and then it just keeps going. But look at this. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, leave God out, even take God out of the pledge, take God, you trust off the coin, get rid of God. They didn't want to acknowledge God any longer. So God gave them over to what? Don't miss this. This is much bigger than depraved appetites. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossipers, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, Boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice these things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who do them. America has voted hearty approval on everything we just read. What if these 60 to 80 million Christians would vote for life and godliness? They wouldn't necessarily have all the most godly people. But they could have those people affected by godly people and godly prayers to see the significance of doing godly things like that atheist who said every great thing that ever happened, Christians did it. That's an atheist that said it. Read it on the stream. Share the stream. If everybody in America would read it, it's just, it's exactly what you're talking about, Andrew. It's just giving common sense to address the cultural issues of the day. Do you understand there's an old man sitting up here who's got a heck of a rocking chair with a heck of a view and 11 incredible grandkids and already seven great and two more on the way. Do you understand that I know how to sit down and enjoy a nice view? And see, I got a little dachshund puppy named Heidi. She got a haircut this morning. She's the cutest thing you ever saw. She loves me. Do you know what I say when I hold her and she loves me so much? I say, God, I want to love you like she loves me. And God, would you please help me love people as much as I love this puppy? Because it's easier to love pets and dogs than it is most people. But you know what he does? He helps me love people all over the world. It's amazing. All right.
What do we do about this problem of being given over to a depraved mind? It means you can't even think straight. You can't even determine night from day, good from evil, right from wrong. Here's what we do. This is the standard. This is the beacon of hope. We don't use it as a club. We hold it up as a light, as a beacon of hope. It gives us directions out of the ditch. And all of us find ourselves oftentimes in a ditch. Either we fell in because of circumstances, somebody pushed us in, or we found ourselves in the pit that we dug with our own misdoing. Let me tell you what I would do. Here's what Jesus would do. Now I'm going to tell you what I would do for you. If you find your way in a pit because you fell in, thrown in, or you did bad things and you got in a pit, let me tell you what would happen. Jesus says he will kneel down by the pit and he will incline his ear to you. He'll say, just call on me. I'll lift you up and I'll set you on a solid rock. You know what I would do? I would kneel down there by Jesus and say, are you listening to him? Then you want me to tell you what I'd do? Yeah, I don't believe you will ever, ever walk away from God. You will, I, I can't tell you how much I love you. I respect you so much, sir. Thank you for helping us when you were in Vietnam. But I just, I just love your heart. I love these students. I love the people around you. I love the people that are here and all you have respect. But if you did fail and you found your way in a pit, can I tell you what I'd do? I'd not only kneel my Jesus, but Andrew, I would jump in the pit. If it was you, if it was you, Congressman, I would jump in it. I promise I would. And when I got in it, I'd try to push your chin up. I say, look up. There's hope. There's help. He'll lift you up out of this pit, however you got in it. Maybe you got thrown in it and you were really mistreated. But he'll lift you. I say that to all the people who feel racially overlooked. I say this to every African American who has rightly so a broken heart. But by the way, if you have perfect laws, lawless hearts will break perfect laws. And the more perfect the laws, the greater the hatred for them. Only one time perfect law, Jesus gave it, perhaps the most hated person that ever walked on the planet when he was crucified by our sins and died for us. The only way you get the world right and get the wrong out of the world is get the wrong out of our lives. That's what Jesus does. So we take the standard, not as a club, but as a radiant beacon of hope. This will tell you how to live, how to forgive. It will tell you how to love. It will tell you how to love your spouse. It will tell you how to love one another. It will tell you how to love the other members of the body. And this is the healing I'm going to close with. The healing of the body of Christ. Don't miss this. When I talk about the family, a lot of people don't have a good image of the family. Never had a good family. I didn't. Until I got married. A lot of people never had a good father. So you talk about the father, they say, I don't even know what that looks like. But let's talk about the body. Don't you miss this. Every member of the body is perfectly designed, uniquely diverse for purpose, for the body to function healthily, for these hands to work, for these arms to work. This part of the arm must connect to this part, each supplying one another as it has need, so this part functions. If every part, and by the way, the most difficult parts to see are the vital organs. Can't see them. But if all parts are submitted to the one head, Christ, that's how we get God's arms around a broken world and pull them up to his heart. By the way, if you think anybody's insignificant, you talked about the man that before he died who wasn't a believer, who saw a vision for what's happened here on the property he once owned. He saw the vision before you did. And now he's seen it fulfilled. You fulfilled that man's vision. 
who didn't even live very long after he met the Lord. But he got a vision. All that's been done miraculously. All the support that comes for all we do all over the world. People, most people never see. I want you to watch this. My body moves. And look what I'm standing on. I'm standing on something hidden in this shoe inside this sock. And I move on that foundation. And the supporters of our ministry and those who pray, they move everything we do. Don't tell them they're unimportant. If you think any member is unimportant, just stump your little toe before you go to bed tonight and then tell it it's not important. It will be shouting, I matter. Every pastor, go back and shout to your church, all of you matter. Now let me say this to you. Here's the biggest mistake I've seen the church make. Self-righteousness is the biggest enemy Jesus has. And the more you know God, the more you know the Bible, the closer you're getting, you're one step from self-righteousness. And you become judgmental, condescending, condemning, all in the name of correction. But you don't correct. They've done bad, and before you get through with them, you'll have shame on them. Until they're saying, I'm bad, I'm bad, and you've wrecked their future. You correct people like the father of the prodigal. He blessed him. The boy went out and ruined everybody's reputation, wasted everything he'd been blessed with. What did the father do? The father didn't go to the pig pen to bring him back. Parent, sometimes you have to let people go. You have to just say, okay, I'm leaving them in your hands. Hem them up, bring them to themselves and their senses. Well, here's what the father did do. He went on the porch looking for him. He went to the nearest bend in the road. I think he went to the next bend in the road. And every day he's looking out. And he said, I want you to come home. I want you to come home. I want to put a robe on you. I want you to cover your filth. Your neck is just want to put sandals. I want to put the ring of sonship, your family. See, that's what we're offering every Christian that's failed. I know you're defeated. Let me help you. Let me love you. Not beat you up. Not tell you how bad you are. Tell you how great he is. Let me just lift you up. Let me point you up. Let me lift you up. You know what the church has been doing, Andrew? When we find somebody we disagree with, we diagnose them as sick. We see ourselves smug, and we're right. And we oftentimes make an idol out of our particular point of view. Do you know what Ravi Zacharias said the last time he could talk to me with a strong voice? He called me. He said, you want me to tell you what I want the church to hear if it's my last words? And James, I need you to hear this. He said, if we don't stop looking at people who just differ, or they have a different point of view, if we keep dividing over different points of view, we're going to lose the future. We're going to lose freedom. We're not going to see his kingdom will done on earth. We've got to stop that, James. Pray we stop doing that. Because when we diagnose them as wrong, we're amputating them. We not only isolate, we amputate. We cut them off. So they'll go farm another club and build another fortress to fight back, trying to live. And we build one after the other. And God says, tear the walls down and become my family, become my body, connected to one another and submitted to the one head, and you'll be healthy. And what did he say to Peter when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? He said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't teach you that, my father did. And upon this ability... To hear the Father's voice and know the Father's will, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. That's the body of Christ coming together healthy. That is precisely what God wants. What did Simon Peter do? This brave disciple denied him three times. 
when Jesus needed him most to just pray. He not only slept rather than prayed, he wasn't just at ease, he denied him. And then Andrew, a short time later, filled with the Holy Spirit's power, he preached the keynotes message at Pentecost. We wouldn't even allow that guy to show up at the prayer meeting, much less preach a keynote message. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus didn't put condemnation on him. He had conviction all over him. So when Jesus asked him, if you love me, his final answer was, basically, he's asking, do you even like me? His answer was, you know. I need to quit shooting off my mouth. You know. I mean, one time I confessed what God said. The rest of the time it pinned me a lot. You know. Boy, did he know. He said, feed my sheep. Pastors, feed the sheep. Build up the body of Christ. And we can see the whole world changed. Do you believe God's will can be done on earth? He says in the model prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. What makes that possible? His kingdom has come. Where is his kingdom? It's at hand. Where is his kingdom? It's in us. His kingdom is not of this world, but it's in us. That means if we will allow kingdom to manifest through us and his will to be done on earth we will get to witness it in our day we can take back the fertile fields of god beginning with our lives and let the fruit of the spirit flow through us and let everybody see the beauty of the lord in his body the church do you want to see that happen would you say i give myself to be that yielded member of the body if you want that would you put your hand up and say i want to yield my life as a member of the body of Christ. Do you mean that? I'd like to lead you in a prayer of commitment if you mean it. And then I'm going to sit here and I'll answer questions for any of you until you're through. But I want to, I want to say a prayer for you and I'm going to tell you something, folks. God says if you receive a sent one, that's what profit is, a one cent, one cent. I was sent here. I don't look for places to go. I was sent. And I may have just been sent for you. But the Lord says, if you receive the one that's sent, the blessings on them will be on you. I have got a blessed life. The product of a rape. No father, no home, no house on the street. And what a family. And what a blessed life. And God wants to bless you. And through your life, He wants to bless you so you bless others for His glory and kingdom purpose. You want that? I want to pray that on you. Just stand where you are if you want that. I'm not, we're not going to take time to come forward. I know many of you would. And I normally ask people to come and stand right in front of me. I don't want you to come forward, just for time's sake. All right, all right look, look straight into my eyes for a minute. I want to believe every one of you are sincere seekers. The thing I want, the thing that I really know is this. God loves you more than you can comprehend. And what He desires to do through your life, if it's a yielded vessel, is beyond anything you could ever imagine. It's greater than ever, anything you could ever dream of. I mean, this shy kid, I never ate lunch in a school cafeteria all the way through school. I carried it in a paper sack and went by myself. I was that shy. I never gave a report in a school classroom in front of the class. I wouldn't get up. I got zero. And God called me to preach. And from the moment he called me, it's been like this. I know I'm old now, okay? I had to sit down a tiny little while. I understand that. But the fire's still in my bones. You see that? All right. I'm telling you, if you'll yield this vessel, your vessel, to the Lord and let him flow his life his will, His love, His compassion, His courage. He'll do it. You want that? That's what He wants. Okay, just bow your head. Father, I pray for every one of these people standing here. I pray that You'll take this lump of clay. You take it in Your sacred shaping hands. And I want You to shape them into a vessel of honor. I want You to shape the beauty of Jesus in them. From the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. I want you to flood them with your spirit. 
flood them with love, with joy, with peace, with patience, with kindness, with gentleness, with self-control. Let them walk out of here overflowing with your spirit. Would you say after me out loud, Father in heaven, you really are my father. And you love me so much. I want to love you with all my heart. So forgive me, cleanse me, and fill me to overflowing with your Holy Spirit and everything James prayed. Let it happen in me. Just flow your life through me. I yield myself to you to live for your glory and your kingdom purpose. I believe your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to live to see it happen. I know you long to see it happen. Let it be. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you just say thank you, God, and thank you.
don't want to dive deeper into the word, but your busy schedule robs you of that opportunity. Now you can listen to the gospel truth wherever you go with the Gospel Truth Radio app. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are broadcasting the gospel, not only our individual television programs, but we've got conferences on there and it's great. No matter how your time is divided up each day, now you can plug into the gospel truth 24 seven at your convenience. It's a great way to stay connected in a world that demands so much of your time. Tap the app and start listening to Gospel Truth Radio. Go to the App Store and type in Gospel Truth Radio and download it to your smartphone. I was born into this church in this religion. My father was a pastor. We weren't allowed to wear pants. We had to wear dresses. We could not cut our hair, wear makeup, jewelry. My mother made us live it. I never went to ball games, never went to a bowling alley, never did anything because they were called worldly things and that people would sway us and lead us to hell if we got mixed up with them. As a young girl, if, if we were out playing and the neighbors come out, we had to go in the house. We were not allowed to mix with anybody or um, be with anyone else. We listened because we were told if we didn't, God would strike us with a sickness. He would make us um, something happen in our life. It, like We could even possibly die. But one day I got sick. I was very ill. Somebody told me my appendix burst. I just know something exploded inside me. I was so sick. My hair fell out of my head. My fever was so high I could peel the skin right off my face. We were not, definitely not allowed to go to the hospital. If you did, you truly left God and were going to hell. They would set me on the couch and put books around me and my husband would go off to work and there I sat, couldn't, couldn't walk. My two young children had been taken away from me for someone else to care for. And I was desperate. I wanted my healing. I couldn't understand why God did this to me when I was such a good Christian. I would sit on my couch every day saying, God, if you're really there, who are you and what do you want from me? Because I had come to a point that there mustn't even be a God. And in my ignorance, I didn't even know what I was saying. But God heard my plea. And one day I pulled my Bible in my lap and I went, wow never saw this before. I started reading and it was so strange and incredible and I, I got scared and I said, oh, the devil couldn't take my life. I stayed out of the hospital. He tried to get me to go in there, but no, I stayed out. So now he's trying to deceive me. So I put the Bible beside my couch. And it was about three days later, I heard a voice speak to me and he said, why aren't you reading my word? I said, who are you, Lord? He said, read my word. And I said, no, the devil's trying to deceive me because he wants my soul. And he said, no, the devil does not know my word to deceive you. He only knows my word to accuse you. Now read my word. Now read my word. Well, I pulled that Bible back up on my lap and I was so afraid to open it. I, I, I thought it was going to explode. But I opened it up and I started reading. I don't know where I read. I just know that I couldn't stop. And I just read and read and read. And something happened inside, just like just like months earlier, something had exploded in me. Now something exploded up in here. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't tell you what happened. I just knew it was strange and different. And so one day I was out in the yard sale and I found this TV that sat there and said, free. And the man told me it was broken, that it didn't work, but he had just put it out in case somebody wanted it for parts. So I took it home, and sure enough, it worked when I plugged my VCR into it. When I would go to show my son movies, I would stick them in first, because every time I turned the TV on, it would make this loud sound. So I would stick the movie in first, then turn on the TV. One day, I don't know why, but I turned the TV on first. A lot of people that stand up and they preach hellfire and damnation and they say, boy, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. And I'm telling you the gospel 
No, that's not the gospel. And here comes this man's voice over the air. There was no picture. There's nothing, but I could hear this man speaking just like I'm speaking to you. There's probably people watching this television program that you know that God's real. That's the reason you're watching a Christian program. And yet you just despair of ever having God really move and manifest in your life because you feel that you've got to do everything just right. He was talking about God and this Jesus who came and did this this work on the cross who took away our sins and did all this. It was incredible. I just couldn't get enough of it, and I, I, but I, I just had to hear it. And so the next day, I took my son's tapes, uh, his movies, and I put tape over the holes so that I could stick it in and record. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And then that afternoon when I put my son to bed, I sat down, stuck that tape in and listened to it. And it was so strange. I'm like, I never heard anything like this, but I was so compelled. I just had to listen to it again and again. You know what's really strange? Nothing else came over that TV. I just got him. We have a phone center so to make this as available to you as we possibly can. If you'll tell them that you'd like the tape on the true gospel, We'll get that in the mail to you right away. So please call or write today. Through that is where I started then getting CDs from Andrew. And, and I couldn't afford them. But one nice thing about Andrew is he gave them away free. This is Andrew Womack. And this is the first tape in a series, a four-tape series that I'm doing. I started listening to Andrew's tapes of God Wants You Well, uh, the Believer's Authority. And I started to realize that I could have this deliverance. I, a woman, could have this. God loved me. He wasn't up there waiting to strike me dead if I didn't read or if I didn't do something right. It, it was incredible. But because of all that, my husband knew something was going on and I would start talking about this Jesus that he didn't understand and know and so he got very abusive uh, verbally and and he had threatened me and told me not to speak the name of Jesus and I wasn't allowed to have the radio on and I wasn't allowed to have mail in the house see see when when you talk Jesus to them because they don't understand it made them angry. You could talk about God. Everything about God was okay. But don't say that Jesus thing. Don't say Jesus was God. Don't, don't talk about Jesus. I would still keep going back to that church. I, I started to have my eyes open, know they were teaching wrong. I would just start speaking right out loud in church. That's wrong. They're not saying the right thing. And he got very embarrassed and, and told me I couldn't go to church anymore. Now I was out of the church. My husband still was going to that church. Um, he still put the children in their school. And each day I had to trust God that he would keep us together because it was really, really pulling us apart. I was one way and my husband was taking my children and gone another way. He told me later that he would do things to try to make me leave him so that he could take me to court and get my children so I could never see him. He was just that angry that I was using the name of Jesus. So um, I got pregnant with my fourth child. I was in labor for a week and I was trying to have him at home. Finally, I said to my husband, something's wrong. He said, how do you know? I said, because I had three others, something's wrong. So my sister said to him, are you going to let her lay there in that bed and die like everybody else in that church? He finally took me to the hospital. When I got there, they started to do an examination, discovered my baby had already stopped breathing, that he had died. They said, you have to do an emergency C-section. They, they um, just ran me off immediately. One person from my old church called me while I was in the hospital and said, why didn't you let God do with you what he wanted to? Why didn't you make your life right and let God take you like he wanted to? Because a lot of the people in there die in childbirth.
they had literally shocked him back to life. They didn't even know if his heart would hold out. But it did, and God put him in perfect health. And so it was through that that my husband had to come out of the church because really the children weren't allowed to go to school there any longer. Now my husband didn't believe, but now he had nowhere to go. And it was through that that he um, started coming to know the Lord then. Because now he wasn't getting that uh, word. He wasn't hearing them daily. And now God could start talking to him. It's been a long journey, but it's been an incredible one. And now God has restored my husband to the faith. My husband's believing now. All my children believe. He has put us in a Bible-believing church. And we are now worshiping together as a family. The legalism has such a strong hold on you that every day I have to keep in Christ. I think each day God takes another chain off of me, the chains of bondage that were, that were binding me. And he just, I, I, I literally can hear him falling on the floor as he clinks them off of me, as he cuts them away and sets me free. I can cut my hair and not worry that I'm going to go to hell. I can stick on a necklace and some earrings and not worry that I'm going to go to hell. If I make a mistake, I just know he's going to pick me up. He's going to love me. He's going to put his arms around me and love me, not inflict a sickness on me or cause one of my children to die. I couldn't walk away on my own. I was powerless to do anything. But now through Christ, I can do all things. I wanted to make a difference, not just a living. I didn't want to settle for anything less than God's plan for my life. Harris Online was my next step to living a life of purpose. Discover what God has for you with online courses from Karis Bible College and live the life you were born to live. Karis Online was perfect for my busy life. And the best part is, my relationship with God and family is forever changed. Thanks to Karis Online, I've grown as a person. I see I can change the world right where I'm at. And because of that, this is my mission field. Taking my Karis courses online really fits into my schedule. I'm seeing life differently. And the people around me, they're noticing. Karis Online has meant the world to us. We're hearing God's voice better than ever before. We love this new stage in our lives. How will Karis change your life? Why not find out today? Go to karisdistanceeducation.org to get started. karisdistanceeducation.org I'd like to encourage you to call in and I know that God is speaking to many many people and you may have had the Lord touch you today and if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you the scripture says if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask it shall be done for them of my father so we have these people I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God they're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. 
Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew and Friends. This program is coming to you from Karis Bible College at the Sanctuary in beautiful Woodland Park, Colorado. Get ready to be blessed and educated as we bring you today's teaching directly from the Word of God. We now join the service in progress. Why don't you help me welcome, this is Daniel Amsters and Carly Todes. Daniel's the director of healings. Hang on, hold. You're a keen bunch. Okay. <laughs> Let me just get one and then you can clap. Otherwise we'll be here all day. Daniel Amsters is the director of healing school here and also the director of uh, praise and worship and creative arts here at Caris Bible College. And Carly Terrades is uh, the director of the conferences. So she puts on all the conferences and stuff. And um, you may know them from healing school and things like that. They're going to go on tour after this to the UK and, and Ireland, praise God. So why don't you help me welcome to the stage. This is Daniel Amsters and my favorite, Carly Terrades. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is so great to see all of you here. We are so excited to be a part of what God is doing here in Woodland Park as well as around the world. We recognize that many of you have paid a lot of money to be here. Yeah. You've, you've booked flights. You've booked hotels. And you know what? The faith is in the coming. Amen. Amen. You've already put action to what you believe. And you said in your heart, if I can just get here to Woodland Park, if I can just get to where people believe God, where people believe that healing has not passed away, but healing is here. And I want to tell you, Carly wants to tell you, we all want to tell you, you have come to the right place. Amen. You know, I heard that people are already receiving the healing. I have heard the same thing. We found out that people who were driving onto the property were already beginning to receive their healing. Amen. People who were standing in line have already begun to receive their healing. In fact, we got a report from somebody named Alan. Yeah, is, is Alan right? in here? Do you want to come? Is Where's Alan? Alan? Is Alan here? Is this you, Alan? Come on up here. Are you Alan? Let's get a microphone come on, for Tell Alan. Come on, Alan. Tell us what happened. Get a microphone for Alan. Awesome. Healing is not there. Say it with me. <laughs> healing is here. Great. Why is healing here? Because Jesus is here. How are you, Amen? Alan? We're living awesome. in a new covenant with better promises. And here's what I want to say to you before Alan shares. Why not today? Why not today? Alan, what happened to you? Amen. Tell us about it. What happened? Well, first of all, I'm just kind of lucky I'm here. My wife's been coming for three or four years and... I always bomb out on her, and I about did the same thing last night, but because my back has been so bad on me, and I use that as an excuse. And you use a bad back as an excuse not to come to a healing conference. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's real smart. Well, I'm glad you you're go. here now. So I walked from the lower parking lot with my wife and almost fell twice because my back hurts so bad, shooting pains down my legs, nerve damage, and we got into the building, and I seen all these prayer partners up here and came and talked to my new best friend, Gordon, and uh, I walked away from there not only no pain, severe arthritis in my hands, and... Come on. And, uh, Show us your hands now. You couldn't do that before? No. <laughs> Praise no. Jesus, right? Amen? <laughs> So how's your back feeling? I feel, can I you, feel can you, great. Can you bend? You want me to do a backflip? Uh, that's up to you. <laughs> no, no, I feel. I, last year I got uh, what's that called? Bell's palsy. Mm-hmm. Just you know, I that feels better now. They Amen. told me that was never going to get healed. You look good. They told me it was never going to get healed. Amen. It's already started. Yeah. It's going through your body. That's the power of God right there. Power of God. Amen. A few years ago, heart disease, got stents. A few years ago, cancer. And look at you today. This is what a healed man looks like. Yeah. Amen. I feel 30 years younger than I did when I walked in that door. And I Amen. praise God for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Alan. Oh, my goodness. What a start to a conference. Now, run down them steps for me. Show, look at that. No problem. No problem. Isn't that awesome? 
Now listen, here's the deal. God is no respecter of persons. In fact, look, at, if you would put on the screen for us, Acts 3, 5. Because here's what Carly and I want to just start off with. Our, our time this morning is going to go so fast. We already know that. Yeah, yeah. You know what? We're going to just trust the Holy Ghost to be able to give and for you to receive exactly what you need today. And look at this. Acts 3, 5, the apostles were, were in the public square. And it says, so the man that they were ministering to gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Mm. Now, you know from the story, if you know this story, that... He was actually a beggar who was wanting to receive some money. Look at the next verse, Acts 3, 6. So Peter then said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, come on, but what I do have, I give to you. Now here's the deal. If you don't know what you have, you can't give it to somebody else. That's right. You got to know what you have in order to be able to give it to someone else. And here's the good news, guys. This healing ministry is not about Andrew and Jamie. It's not about Daniel and Carly. It's not about the speakers who you're going to be hearing this mm-hmm. week. It is for you. You are the one that is anointed. You are the one that has been called by God to be able to give what you have freely Receive. Amen. And what have you freely received? You, re- you have freely received a finished work. Amen. Amen. We're not waiting for God to heal us. He has already accomplished that healing grace mm-hmm. 2,000 years ago. So look at this. He says, such as I do have, I'm going to keep it to myself. <laughs> Is that what he said? No. <laughs> such as I do have, what am I going to do? I'm going to give it to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he says something really bold, rise up and walk. Come on. Some of you this week need to hear this because some of you are going to rise up and walk. Some of you have been bound. Some of you have been crippled. Mm. Some of you have been uh, distressed. And I'm telling you, why not now? Amen. Amen. You know, the Lord woke me up at 1.30 in the morning. I hadn't been able to get back to sleep again. But um, I just kept found myself keep, keep praying in tongues in my sleep. Yeah. And I'm praying in tongues in the sleep. And the Lord is showing me all of the different healings and miracles that we're going to see throughout the week. Oh. And I tell you, in the, in the end, there was too many of them. Yeah. Right? I mean, I just feel like this is the word the Lord gave me, a great expectation. Yes. We need to have great expectation. And as Daniel said, there is faith in the coming. Yeah. And he gave me this scripture. So if you've got your Bibles, and why wouldn't you come with a Bible, by the way? Right? Come on now. Yeah. We're going to use that Bible a lot this week because he sent his word and healed them. Amen? Yeah. He sent his word and healed them. So this is in Acts 2. And, um, and let's uh, start in verse 23. It says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. They're talking about Jesus here. In verse 24 it says, Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Yeah. You know, the reason that, that Jesus rose from the dead it was because the grave did not have the power to hold him in it right think about that for a minute right the grave does not have the power to keep you bound yeah. to keep you in the grave right? to keep you dead what could be more terminal than death the fact that you're still sitting here you're still alive and breathing amen you may have been sick for a long time you could have been sick for years you could have been born sick and never been well But if if the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives on the inside of us and the grave didn't have enough power to hold Jesus in the grave, it doesn't have enough power to keep us sick. No. Amen? So come with great expectation. Amen? You do not have to leave here the same way you came in. Amen. Just like Alan is proof. Amen. (laughs) We've got that same resurrection power living on the inside of us. That's the good news. That's the good news. We're not waiting for it to show up someday and, and hoping and praying and wishing. No, we've got that same power. And you know what? The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God. Amen. Amen. You've got that power on the inside of you today. So say with me, greater is he greater is he that's in me in me than he that's in the world. Than he that's in the world. Greater is he greater is he that's not outside of me. That's not outside of me. Greater is he greater is he that's in me. That's in me. Who is that? Christ in us is the hope of glory. Amen. 
We're not waiting for God to do something that he has already done in Christ. Amen. So this is why we're so excited, Carly. Mm-hmm. Every year when we gather for this event, there is such an anticipation. There's such an excitement. And we just want you to know that on behalf of Andrew and Jamie and all of our staff, I'm telling you what, this conference takes a small army to pull off. It as does. You can probably imagine. Hundreds of and people. And Carly and I just want to say thank you to all of our staff, all of our faculty, Everybody who's been involved in any kind of way. Amen. Amen. Because frankly, we are just really excited about you having an encounter with the spirit of God this week. Mm -hmm. You receiving what God has freely come to give us. Amen. It's our day. It's our day. It's our time. And, you know, we are anticipating lots of signs and wonders. So let's just preface this a little bit. Usually if, if the, how many of you are here for the first time? I didn't see your hands. You've never been to Healing is Here. Wow. Okay, wow. That. that is pretty awesome. That is so, awesome. So um, every year at Healing is Here, we have a collection through the week of crutches yeah. and walkers and hearing aids yeah, and glasses kind of and, you know, anything breathing else that you machines. won't need anymore mm-hmm. after you're healed, right? So breathing <laughs> machines, yeah. Obviously, um, don't give them to us if it doesn't belong to you. Right. Okay. We've had to have some people reclaim them yeah. at the end. Yeah. So, you know, because they had to hand them back in. Yeah. Right. But you're welcome to bring them up when you don't need them anymore and just leave them on the edges of the stage here on these little platforms. And, um, and if you do need to take them back, you can take them back at the end of the week. But we will leave them there and it will become a testimony to the, the power of God working in our bodies. Amen. Amen. That's One good. of our favorite things is seeing what happens among you as the body of Christ. hmm Because all of a sudden, as you begin to really internalize this message that you already have it, you're going to start laying hands on people as you're waiting in food lines. Yeah. You're going to be you're going to be going to the parking lot, and somebody's going to say, "Would you Would you pray with me?" And I'm telling you, get ready. Miracles, signs, and wonders, healings, restorations are going to be happening like popcorn in a pop make, popcorn maker. Yeah, like uh, that, like, like that. that. It's just going to break loose. It's going to break loose, <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. So, how many how many say today? I'm ready. Yeah, yeah, come on, let's do this. Let's do this. Praise and God. Should I tell them about this now? Yeah. Is that good? That. All right. Yeah. So these, we've got these um, praise report sheets, and we're going to have these on the corner of our stages as well, and our prayer ministers will have these. And these are big blank space in the middle, and that's for you guys to fill in, okay? So you do your writing in there. We want to hear when you receive something at this event, okay? So whatever, whatever it is, it could be a physical healing, could be an emotional healing, whatever it is, whatever kind of breakthrough you have, we want you to take one of these. We're going to have them available. If you can't find them for some reason, you can just ask any one of our prayer ministers or ushers, and they'll find one for you. And you just complete that, and then you can turn it in to a prayer minister or an usher, and they'll make sure that they come back to us. And then in the evenings, we're going to read out testimonies. Amen. We're going to, we're going to let everyone know what God has been doing in your life. Yeah. So this is for you to write your testimony down. And there's, there's a scripture on the top of this and it says, it's Revelation 12, 11, And it says, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Yeah. In other words, by what Jesus has done for us and by what we're prepared to say about what Jesus has done for us. Right. Right. By the word of your testimony. Because when we receive healing and we start to write it down and we start to share it with other people, somehow it makes it real. Yeah. Have you ever received from something from the Lord and then gone away and thought about it and overthought it afterwards? Yes. And somehow, I don't know whether it's the devil or your flesh, but kind of creeps in there and you start to doubt things, right? When you write it down, it's like you are making a testament. Yeah. You are making a memorial. And it's much harder for us to forget the details or water it down somehow or lose it. I hate that phrase, but you know what I mean, okay? Yeah. So this is really a really powerful exercise. So I would encourage you, be expecting, get yourself a blank one from the start of the conference and, you know, be ready. Why not, right? Amen. There you go. Guys, if you would put on the screen for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, I want to just highlight this verse for a moment. Mm. Because, you know, wherever you are in your healing journey, wherever you are in your process, I just want to encourage you this morning that um, the Lord is for you. Amen. Amen. The bottom line for all of this conference is you, you are going to discover this week in a fresh way how much God loves you. How loved you truly are. And look at this. It says, therefore, let no one boast in men for all things are yours. All mm-hmm. things are yours. Now, if you would go back to verse 20, 1 Corinthians three twenty. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Now, that's, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. I said 1 Corinthians, my bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 20. 
The Lord does know the thoughts of the wise. And how that's many a good you know, scripture too. That's a good scripture too. Because so many people think that they're so smart that, that healing has passed away. Amen? That they are the wise ones. They're the enlightened ones. They're the ones who are telling us today that it's no longer there. Right? But 2 Corinthians 3.20 or 1.20 says, man, I'm going to find Where it Where are eventually. we going? Do you need some help? I'm, I'm going to find it eventually. It's in the Bible. It's somewhere in the somewhere. Bible. You need a word of knowledge to find this. Somewhere between concordance and maps, it says. <laughs> Have some water. I hear it's oh, really thank good you. stuff. Thank you. I, I will. <laughs> and so it begins. 120. Man, oh man, that was a... All the promises of God in who? Him. In Him. In Christ. All the promises of God. Not just a few. Pick and choose. No. All the promises. But listen aren't just yes and amen. All the promises in Christ are yes and amen. amen to the glory of God through us. So you need to know that God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen. Every promise that God has made has not passed away. It's not for a previous generation. His word is alive and powerful mm -hmm. and it's working in you. The gospel is the power of God. The word of God is powerful. So many times we begin to uh, get a perspective to where maybe you've been walking with this illness or this, this disease, maybe you've been living in this, this kind of way for a while now, and your identity has been, I'm so-and-so, the sick person. But God is saying to you this week, no, that is not who you are. Maybe that's where you've come from, but your past is not going to define your future. Amen. amen? Every promise in Christ is yes and amen. And God says, everything, everything, that needed to be done has been done and it's been done on your behalf so that you, like first John says, for third John two rather says that he would, that we would prosper and be in health. How? Even, if Even so. as our soul prospers. Amen. The thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. But what does God do? He comes to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. Mm. Why? So that we can be miserable, live sick, try to manage our sickness and disease. No. He said, I want you to live quality lives to the glory of God. Amen. Every promise is yes and amen. Amen. For everyone. Yeah. There's, there's no losers in there. Right. And many people who think they are wise in their own eyes are telling us that these things have passed away. Well, you can't tell us that. We're seeing it on right. a regular basis. You can't tell Alan that. No. How do you, how do you deal with the Alans of life when <laughs> someone's saying it passed away? There's people who say salvation doesn't matter anymore. Too late. Amen. Listen, you can't talk somebody's talk. You can't walk their walk. And there's no chance you're going to dance their dance because whom the son has set free is free indeed. Amen. And when you know that you overcome by the blood of the lamb and what? The word of your and the word of your testimony, you're going to have a hard time not talking about this. Amen. Not living it, not telling somebody else, not giving Amen. somebody else what has been freely given to you. Amen. You're going to be wrecked this week. I'm, I'm sorry. You. It's too late. You're now, you're now, you're one of those fanatics. Yes, you are. Everyone's going to know, right? Yeah. You went to that healing conference in Woodland Park, right? right. Where they were, we tried to, to squeeze all these people into this little bitty building. Yes. Right? And then you're going to go out of here and they're going to be like, oh, you're the ones. You're the ones that were hanging out at that conference. You're the ones that have been with Jesus, right? Yeah. You're the ones where signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word. You're the ones, right? You're those people that set the captives free. You're those people that go and heal the brokenhearted. Come amen. On. You're the ones now. Yep. That's you. Amen. That's You've been labeled as a fanatic for Jesus. Amen. Yeah. The secret's out. <laughs> amen. Somebody told me, Carly, a long time ago, someone who is a fanatic is just somebody that loves Jesus more than you. <laughs> right. I like that. <laughs> so what does Jesus say about us? He says we're able ministers. Right. Do you see yourself that way? Or, or do you see us that way? Or, or Andrew that way? Or Pastor Greg that way? Or some of the people that you're going to hear from this week? You know, Jesus wants to give you a new perspective. He said to the disciples, 
Don't say there's yet four months and then comes the harvest. I want you to lift up your eyes. I want you to get a new perspective. I want you to be in, begin to get a new identity as to who you really are mm. and who God says you are. Come on, somebody. Who God says you are is an able minister. Amen. So tell somebody sitting next to you, you are an able minister no matter what you look like. Amen. Amen. There is a great, there's a great scripture here. This is, they're all so friendly. Look. I know. I I love it. Right. Wait till Friday. Oh my goodness. (laughs) They'll be deadly. (laughs) The streets of Manitou Springs haven't seen what's coming to them yet. Oh, I know that. Oh my goodness. Watch out you street ministry people. It's awesome. All them people that are going out on the street ministry training um, this afternoon and going out tomorrow, they better watch out, right? You know what we've discovered? You can you can stay sick if you really really want to. It's hard here. But it really is hard. Yeah. You got to be committed in this conference to stay sick. Right? You really got to be committed no. to it. And we want you well. God wants you well. Why would you not want you well? Right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, let's read this. Let's read this scripture here in 2 Corinthians 3 and this is 4 to 6. It says, "And we have such trust through Christ towards God that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God." Our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, Mm -hmm. not of the letter, um, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Here's the thing. Sometimes we can look at ourselves and think, I don't feel like a very able minister. I don't feel very sufficient. Right. They'll they'll look at Daniel and they think, oh, Daniel, now he's got it together. I don't think they think that. (laughs) No, I don't know I this morning. I don't know. Why First Corinthians, whatever that was. I mean, I, I think we're kind of You've good. blown. Okay. They look at me yeah, and they think they, I've got it all together. Right. You. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Our sufficiency as ministers is not of ourselves. Right. It's that Jesus lives on the inside of us. And I want to shatter the illusion for you this week that you can't pray for the sick or that you can't hear God's voice or that you can't prophesy or that you can't operate in spiritual gifts or that you can't raise the dead or that you can't preach the word. Amen. Because all of these things, he says, we are sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, because not because of our sufficiency, but because of the one who lives on the inside of us. Right. Or how about this one, Carly? How about if somebody is dealing with some kind of symptom in their body that they're believing God to be out of their body, does that disqualify them to pray for somebody else? Absolutely not. Somebody else. Absolutely not. Because, you know, when we understand that it's Jesus that's the, that's the healer and not us, it doesn't matter what's going on in our physical flesh. I went on a mission trip one time with, um, uh, we had a blind student, and I watched a blind student pray, praying for a blind guy, and they both get healed. Wow. Alex. Right? Amen. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. There, there's only one reason really why people do not step out in the area of ministry, and that's fear. Yeah. That could be fear in their flesh. You know, they're just terrified. Maybe they have no experience of, of praying for anyone. Maybe they just, you know, feel, feel like they're inadequate in some way. Yeah. Or maybe they've just been spending too much time listening to the, to the wrong messages. Yeah. Listening, listening to the little word in their ear that says, you can't do it. You're not sufficient. You know what? That would be true if our sufficiency was of ourselves. Right. But it's we're not of ourselves. Amen. It's Jesus that's the healer and his power flows through us and sets people free. And as it does that, there's plenty of power left over us. Right. Amen. Yeah. Matthew <laughs> says with men, things are impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible, possible. see? And that's who we have living on the inside of us. We often think we're waiting for him to do something, but the truth is he's really waiting for us. Right. He's waiting for us to activate what we already have been given in Christ. Mm -hmm. And he says, you're an able minister. Now I got to tell you something, even in full-time ministry, we do not always feel like able ministers. Right. We walk (laughs) through the very same thing, regardless of what your vocation or your career is. You know, whether you're a businessman, whether you're whatever it is you are, the Bible says you are an able minister. Mm -hmm. And it's not based on our feelings. It's not based on our performance. But again, it's his grace. This is why this is so amazing. Because when you begin to really connect the dots with how the sufficiency that is on the inside of us is from God. 
man, a boldness begins to rise up on the inside that says, okay, Lord God, thank you that you are the Lord God of heaven and earth. Thank you that there's nothing impossible with you. Thank you, Lord. And, and you begin to just, man, I mean, as Andrew says, you, you start getting stronger than horseradish. <laughs> I remember one day I was sitting next to an international student when Andrew said that in one of our gospel truth rallies. And that person went, what's that? Horseradish? Horseradish. <laughs> they had no idea. But whatever it was, it was strong. I know. Maybe we should spoon it out. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a little taste. Give it a little tasting. No, and what it does is it begins to change your perspective. Mm -hmm. It changes your mindset. And as your perspective begins to change, you realize that there's more. Mm. There's more. Say with me this morning, there's more. Oh, there's more. God wants to do more. God wants to do more. He says, I, I'm the God of exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to some kind of power somewhere out there. His power. Amen. Amen. Woo. I'm, I'm getting happy and I was already happy when I started. <laughs> the power of God that's on the inside of us is so much greater than any one of us can imagine. Amen. But God wants us to imagine. He wants us to think about it, to meditate on it, to begin to see ourselves as he sees us. And honestly, I remember the first time I ever laid hands on someone to receive healing. I was so nervous. I was just like, what if this doesn't work? What if I lay my hands on them and they fall over dead? I, I had great faith. <laughs> Do you know that everybody has a first time? Yep. You may not have done this a hundred times, but you know what? Why not today? Amen. Why not today? Amen. God's love will help you overcome that fear. Mm -hmm. As you begin to meditate in the word of God, that, that truth is going to set you free. And, and why not today? Just step out. And begin to lay your hands, begin to speak the word and watch what happens. Mark 16 says these signs will follow those who believe. If right. you're a believer, you are qualified Amen. to be laying hands on the sick. Amen. That's the good news. It doesn't matter if you've been born again two minutes. No. You have Jesus, the healer, living on the inside of you. You're right. Put your hand up. You've got Jesus, the healer, living on the inside of Come you. On. Right. That's why you look down and say, hello, Jesus. Right? He's, <laughs> some people are doing it. Look, he's right in there. Amen? He's, he's there on the inside of you in your spirit. You, he never leaves us or forsakes us. Ever. We, he, he's contained on the inside of us forever. It's too late. He's already in there. Right? So you're like, like walking Jesus is everywhere you go. The power of God goes with you. Yeah. Now, I want to ask, and I need, I need you to be honest, okay? This, this stays in these rooms, all right? Okay. No one else outside of what is really watching. Don't worry about them, okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. I want you to put your hand up if you've never prayed for someone to receive healing before. You've got to be brave, all right? Come on, I can see some. I see those hands. Put them up. I encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew and Friends. This program is coming to you from Karis Bible College at the Sanctuary in beautiful Woodland Park, Colorado. Get ready to be blessed and educated as we bring you to Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew and Friends. This program is coming to you from Karis Bible College at the Sanctuary in beautiful Woodland Park, Colorado. Get ready to be blessed and educated as we bring you today's teaching directly from the Word of God. We now join the service in progress. Get ready to be blessed and educated as we bring you today's teaching directly from the Word of God. We now join the service in progress. Why don't you help me welcome, this is Daniel Amsters and Carly Todes. Daniel's the Director of Healings. Hang on, hold. You're a keen bunch. Okay. <laughs> Let me just get one, and then you can clap. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. 
Daniel Amster is the director of healing school here and also the director of uh, praise and worship and creative arts here at Caris Bible College. And Carly Teredes is uh, the director of the conferences. So she puts on all the conferences and stuff. And um, you may know them from healing school and things like that. They're going to go on tour after this to the UK and, and Ireland, praise God. So why don't you help me welcome to the stage. This is Daniel Amstead and my favorite, Carly Teredes. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is so great to see all of you here. We are so excited to be a part of what God is doing here in Woodland Park as well as around the world. We recognize that many of you have paid a lot of money to be here. You've, You've booked flights. You've booked hotels. And you know what? The faith is in the coming. Amen. Amen. You've already put action to what you believe. And you said in your heart, if I can just get here to Woodland Park, if I can just get to where people believe God, where people believe that healing has not passed away, but healing is here. And I want to tell you, Carly wants to tell you, we all want to tell you, you have come to the right place. Amen. You know, I heard that people are already receiving the healing. I have heard the same thing. We found out that people who were driving onto the property were already beginning to receive their healing. Amen. People who were standing in line have already begun to receive their healing. In fact, we got a report from somebody named Alan. Yeah, is, is Alan right? in here? Do you want to come? Is Where's Alan? Alan? Is Alan here? Is this you, Alan? Come on up here. Are you Alan? Let's get a microphone for Alan. Come on, Alan. Tell Alan. us what happened. Get a microphone for Alan. Awesome. Healing is not there. Say it with me. (laughs) Healing is here. Great. Why is healing here? Because Jesus is here. How are you, Alan? We're living in a new covenant with better promises. And here's what I want to say to you before Alan shares. Why not today? Why not today? Alan, what happened to you? Amen. Tell us about it. What happened? First of all, I'm just kind of lucky I'm here. My wife's been coming for three or four years and... I always bomb out on her, and I about did the same thing last night, but because my back has been so bad on me, and I use that as an excuse. And you use a bad back as an excuse not to come to a healing conference. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's real smart. But, well, I'm glad you you're go. here now. So I walked from the lower parking lot with my wife and almost fell twice because my back hurts so bad, shooting pains down my legs, nerve damage, and we got into the building and I...